Well, good morning. I'm Mitch Jell, the current 7 News Newsroom. In the final phases now of the Aurora Theater shooting trial, court should resume here shortly. As we've been telling you, the jury doesn't return to the courtroom until 1 o'clock this afternoon. At that time, they'll get the jury instructions from the judge himself. Uh, then they'll have a recess, maybe 15 to 30 minutes, and then those closing arguments begin. Each side getting 40 minutes and then also 20 minutes to rebut the other side's a testimony. So until then, the lawyers are anticipated to be back in court without the jurors now at about 9 this morning, so another 10, 15 minutes or so. What they'll be going over with the judge without the jury there are those jury instructions. See if they have any objections to how those are presented. They might also be going over some of those PowerPoint presentations that each side would use during uh, those closing arguments. Uh, defense prosecution may object to the ways that some of those uh, slides or videos may be used in their presentation. We'll have to see. In the meantime, we'd like to review, go back over some of the testimony we heard yesterday. Very emotional day there in court and this phase three of the testimony in this uh, the sentencing phase and it would ask many of the survivors and also victims families how their lives have changed since the day of the shooting where did you go after you left the theater that night uh they took us to gateway high school they like brought around some rtds and they took us to gateway Did you know for certain when you were at Gateway High School what had happened to your father? We weren't certain, but like in the theater when I touched him, like I thought immediately that he was dead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Did you leave Gateway High School and then go to your dad's house? Yeah, we, like, I just remember we kept using people's phones to try to call our dad, and we just kept going to voicemail, and we tried to call our mom, even though it was, like, our dad's night to take us, and we couldn't get in touch with her, and so a policeman drove us to our dad's house, and they, like, our dad had the keys, so the policeman like had to do the lock on the door and had to get us in. And I remember it, like my aunt Caitlin. Sorry. She had heard about what had happened on the news. Like she didn't know. The details, she just heard that there had been like a shooting in Aurora close to where we lived. And she called to ask if it was true and like to check that everyone was okay. And I don't think, like Brooke was someone talking to her on the phone, but like I don't think she was scared when she called because she was just like wanting to check up. I think she thought it was all okay. And, and my sister had to tell her that her dad didn't walk out with, didn't run out with us. And, like, I could just hear her start to cry on the phone. <laughs> and then when our mom got there, it was like, she was just, like, crying so hard. Like, it was like she couldn't breathe. It was just like, she was hysterical almost. She was just like calling all these hospitals. Were you eventually officially notified that your father was murdered? Yeah, I think Gateway, like, I guess it was like all the 12, like, the families and groups of friends were in this big room and. My mom's at the time boyfriend, who's now husband, he asks, like, if our missing people, if they're not on the list of injured people, does it mean that they're gone? And the chief of police said, like, yes. And I just remember, like, there's this complete uproar of people crying. And, like, I think I remember someone even screaming. Did you have two separate funerals for your dad? Yeah, we had a memorial service in Colorado, and then we had a funeral in Austin, Texas. 
What was the toughest thing about the funeral in Austin for you? It's for me, the hardest thing was just... Like, putting my hand on his coffin. Hannah, can we approach, please? Yes. You may proceed. Thank you very much, Hunter. Ms. Cowden, can you please tell the jury about the impact of your dad's murder on your brothers and sisters? Like, I don't really know even where to begin. It's like, I feel like in a way it's like we're closer now, but it's like we're also farther away from each other now and like I just feel like my family's broken and you tell the jury about the impact of your dad's murder on you I mean I feel like I'm a mess up here what do you miss most about your dad I'm just everything I miss, like, him telling stories and, like, making everyone laugh and, like, his patience. Like, he was always patient with us, even when we weren't patient with each other. And, like, it's selfish to say, but, like, I just miss him being my dad. <laughs> and it was like, he was, like, he was just so present in our lives that, like, growing up, the idea of one of my parents dying, it, just, it wasn't ever something that I ever even considered because they were so present. Like, I just miss him being there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Cowden. I have no further questions. Ms. Brady, do you have any questions? I don't. Thank you. And the jury does not appear to have any questions. Ms. Cowden, thank you. May she be released from her subpoena? Please, thank you, Your Honor. Any objection? No, sir. All right. Thank you. Were you asked to actually go and identify your son at the coroner's office? Yes. We had to, um, we got a call that said that we needed to come down and identify him. Did you do that? I did. Tell us about that. Your Honor, I'd object 401, 403 due process. Overruled. I went in. The um, gentleman told me that Matt would be behind a glass window and that we would be in a little room. And so we went in and um, my brother's friend and Samantha's stepmom went with me. And I went in and he was there and it was my son. And um, I had asked if he suffered, and they said that he was shot in the neck. And it was probably within seconds. Did you say anything to him? Your Honor, 401, 403, due process. Overruled. I told him that I loved him, that I was proud of him because he saved Samantha's life, and that we would take care of Samantha. I only have a few more questions for you, ma'am. And I want to ask you about the service for your son. Where did that happen? That happened at Main Lane Church of God in Springfield, where he had grown up. Did anybody show up from your son's past that he had touched that you were surprised to see? He had high school teachers that came. He had been in a class of just about eight kids, and every one of them came. Um, childhood friends, friends from church, um, just all walks of life, uh, you know, every, um, like everybody that he had been in contact with, um, former co workers. Um, I think every aspect was, somebody was there. 
What has been the impact of this crime on you? I've been diagnosed with PTSD, with anxiety and depression. I went back to work for two weeks and could not handle it. And so I've been on... But let me ask you that. What were you doing for a living back then? I had been a claims analyst for 11 years for a trucking company. And um, it's a stressful job, and I just couldn't handle it. So I've been on um, Social Security Disability, which has cut my income in half. Um, I've been in counseling for almost three years now. And um, I'm on four medications to help me sleep from the nightmares. I just have one more question for you. Okay. What is the most vivid memory that you have of your son? The most thing that I think about, there's a lot of them, but probably the one that would describe him the best is he always wanted to be the center of an attention. He wanted to be the one that was proposed to. He wanted to be the one that had the big old diamond ring. And um, he told his grandma that he was going to dance down the aisle. At, at a wedding? At his wedding. And that was, I believe, the reason why he had his man tiara. And did he ever get a chance to do any of that? No, he did not. Thank you, ma'am. I don't have anything further, Your Honor. All right, any questions? No, sir. And the jury does not appear to have any questions. May uh, Ms. Jackson uh, be released from her subpoena? Yes. Any objection? No, sir. Um, right. Ma'am, aside from what we were just talking about, tell us um, how you're different as a result of your son's murder. This entire I don't know what even to call it. Um, but it's just pure agony. Um, I did not realize that, that grief turns into physical pain. Um, it hurts your entire being, but it, it also gives you physical pain. Um, I'm in pain every single day. Um, it's, it's god awful. It's just horrific. I miss everything about him. I'm, it's every parent's worst nightmare that's come to fruition. If you were going to, I'm sorry to ask you to do this, if you were going to come up with a short way to describe uh, in a word or two your son's personality, what words would you choose? Fierce, kind, caring. If you were in a room with five people or 20 people, you would remember Alex. He, um, and not because he came into the room that said, you know, look at me, look at me. He would be the person that would just come sit next to you and ask you how you are, who are you? How are you feeling? Tell me about your life. Um, he made you feel good good about yourself. It, it was a very um, unique thing that he can do. And whenever you left him, you, you wanted to be a better person. He just had a very unique way of doing that with people. Is there a single thing that you miss most about him? I mean, beyond the, beyond the daily texts and the calls, I mean, is there something about him that you know is missing? Alex, um, I miss it. Good morning, everyone. This is the case of the people of the state of Colorado versus James Egan Holmes, case number 12 CR 1522. The record should reflect that Mr. Holmes is present with Ms. Brady, Mr. King, Ms. Higgs, 
and Ms. Nelson, and the people are represented by Mr. Brockler, Mr. Orman, Ms. Pearson, Ms. Stitch McGuire, Mr. Edson, and Mr. Edwards. We are outside the presence of the jury. Before we talk about instructions, um, at the end of the day yesterday, juror number 87, who is in seat number six, inadvertently uh, walked out of the courtroom with her juror notebook. Uh, she barely uh, got out of the, um, uh, the building, turned around when she realized that she had her notebook with her, and gave it to one of the security guards downstairs and conveyed that um, she was a juror in this case and asked that the notebook be returned to us. Uh, that security guard then immediately gave it to a sheriff, a sergeant in the sheriff's office, who then immediately provided it to us, and we have it back. Um, neither the security guard nor the sheriff, uh, the sergeant, opened the notebook, and they treated it, in fact, like a hot potato. They couldn't get, get it to us fast enough, which was exactly the right attitude to have. So I wanted to share that with, with all of you because that information um, was shared with me at the end of the night, last night after you had all left. Uh, in terms of the instructions, the record should reflect that I emailed through my staff uh, a third draft of the uh, jury instructions. And it contains the changes that I said yesterday I was going to make with a few exceptions. And I will talk to you about why I changed my mind with respect to a few things. Uh, but before I do that, I uh, did a little research on the uh, mercy issue because I know we've had a lot of discussions on, on that and uh, the disagreement between the defense and, and the, the people uh, and the court has sided with the people. Uh, but the disagreement is as follows, that the defense wants an instruction along the lines of telling the jury that he can consider mercy in making its decisions and leaving it at that. Um, the people have argued that it has to be based on the evidence, and, and my understanding of the law is that indeed it has to be based on the evidence. Uh, they can exercise mercy, but it has to be based on the evidence. He can't be in a vacuum, and he can't be uh, without regard to the evidence. They can't ignore the evidence and just decide that they want to exercise mercy. Uh, so not only based on my understanding of the law, but also based on common sense, I have rejected the argument. Uh, I found a case yesterday, and this is not by any means the only case out there. there there's, there's authority out there that supports this position, but I thought that this was instructive. This is State versus McAnulty. It's capital M, small c, capital A, uh, N-U-L-T-Y. This is a, an Oregon, Oregon Supreme Court case from 2014 which is cited at 338 Pacific 3rd, 653. In this case, the defendant asked the judge to give the jury um, an instruction on mercy, and the defendant proposed two alternatives. The first alternative re read as follows. The law recognizes and authorizes that any individual juror may base the decision to impose a sentence less than death, less than death on mercy alone. The other one read as follows. A juror is also authorized to consider feelings of mercy that flow from the evidence. The law provides that mercy alone is sufficient to support a life imprisonment verdict for any juror. Um, and the court, the Oregon Supreme Court, 
spoke as follows. In It said, this court has reviewed and rejected essentially the same challenge to a proposed mercy instruction. The defendant's proposed instruction would have instructed the jury that he could base its decision whether to impose the death penalty on mercy alone and for any reason whatsoever. We explained, and he was referring to a case by the name of Washington, we explained that this court has generally rejected that form of instruction because it fails to inform jurors that their decision must be based on the evidence before them. We further observed in Washington that the federal constitution imposes a similar standard. Specifically, we noted in Washington that in California versus Brown, 479 U.S. 538, 107 Supreme Court 837, uh, a case from 1987, the United States Supreme Court addressed whether an instruction the jurors must not be swayed by mere sympathy in the penalty phase of a capital case violated the defendant's rights under the 8th and 14th Amendments. Holding that it did not, the court emphasized that the key was not the meaning of the word sympathy, but the fact that the instruction properly cautioned the jury to base its decision only on the evidence before it. In the court's view, the instruction properly limited the jury's sentencing considerations to record evidence and in so doing ensured the availability of meaningful judicial review. Applying those principles to the defendant's proposed mercy instructions, we concluded that the instruction would have incorrectly informed the jury that it could base its decision on mercy alone without considering other evidence in the record. The defendant's proposed instructions in this case are similarly flawed. Her first, affirm her first alternative instruction would have informed the jury that it could base its decision on mercy alone. Although the defendant's second alternative instruction would have informed the jury that he could consider feelings of mercy that flow from the evidence, it then stated that the ultimate decision may be based on mercy alone. Thus, the instructions did not reflect a correct statement of the law. Accordingly, we conclude that the defendant's proposed mercy instructions did not correctly state the law, and the trial court did not err in refusing to give either instruction. Uh, and um, California versus Brown also supports the proposition, just as um, the same proposition, just as the Oregon Supreme Court concluded. And I know that yesterday, Mr. Edwards cited uh, California versus Brown uh, as supporting the people's position. And um, just as the Supreme Court of Oregon did, I, I find that that's the case. So I'm standing by my rulings with respect to that issue. The other issue that I wanted to talk to you about has to do with the, the discussion that we had on the verdict forms. And we talked about 18-1.3-1201 yesterday, and I um, specifically talked about the first sentence in subsection 1A, which is the very first subsection of the statute, and which tells the trial court uh, to conduct a separate sentencing hearing if there is a conviction of guilt uh, on a class one felony in order to determine whether the defendant should be sentenced to death or life imprisonment. But there's another provision in the statute that I think supports my, uh, the way that I have structured the verdict forms. And it is, as follows, in subsection 2A, the statute reads as follows. After hearing all the evidence and arguments of the prosecuting attorney and the defendant, the jury shall deliberate and render a verdict based on the following considerations. Roman numeral one, whether at least one aggravating factor has been proved as enumerated in subsection five of this section. Roman numeral two, whether sufficient mitigating factors exist which outweigh any aggravating factor or factors found to exist. And then in Roman numeral three, it says, based on the considerations in subparagraphs one and two of this paragraph, A, whether the defendant should be sentenced to death or life imprisonment. 
Uh, so again, the statute specifically envisioning having the jury determine whether the sentence that is appropriate is a death sentence or whether it is a life imprisonment sentence. So I again stand by the um, verdict forms the way I have them. Now let me talk to you about why I changed my mind about a few of the changes that we spoke about yesterday. And, and some of these uh, are not that I changed my mind as much as I, um, I realized that there was some discussion and I thought about the discussion further and then I decided to go in a different direction. The first one is in the instruction that starts with, in phase three of the sentencing hearing, there is no burden of proof. And I'll let you folks get to it so that we're all on the same page. At the end of that instruction yesterday, the sentence read as follows. The degree of certainty defined by beyond a reasonable doubt does not apply to a final sentencing verdict of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. And Ms. Nelson didn't like that language, but in the end said, without waiving her objection, that if her choice was between having that language or not having it at all, she would opt to have it. And so I left it in there. But she had asked me to repeat a sentence that is used earlier in the instructions. Uh, and I wasn't willing to do that because I didn't think it was appropriate to just repeat something um, that has already been that had already been said in the instructions. And the sentence is as follows: A juror need not be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that life imprisonment without the possibility of parole is the appropriate sentence in order to make a decision that will result in a sentence of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. That's the last sentence of the third full paragraph of the instruction that starts with, you must now consider whether the defendant should be sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole or death on each count of murder in the first degree. Uh, after thinking about it further, I came up with one that I think is better than what I had before. I still don't think it's appropriate to just repeat the sentence that I just read, but um, what I uh, changed that last sentence to is as follows. An individual juror is not required to have the degree of certainty defined by beyond a reasonable doubt before he or she may decide based on his or her individual reason, moral judgment, that a life sentence without the possibility of parole is the appropriate sentence. And I'll give the parties an opportunity to be heard on that if they wish. But let me get through the rest of the um, changes or differences between our discussion last night and what appears in the third draft of the instructions now. The next one, I think, is in the instruction that starts out with, there's no requirement that you explain or justify to your fellow jurors why your individual reason, moral judgment leads you to a particular decision on a count. And you'll recall that we had a discussion last night with respect to that last sentence. And um, after thinking about it further, uh, I ended up changing it um, a little bit. And to me, it's not a substantive change. It's a change as to form, but I like it better. It reads as follows. Ultimately, ultimately, each of you must deliberate and decide for yourself the appropriate sentence based on your individual reason, moral judgment. That's different than what we had left it at, or, or how we had it last night, at the end of last night, which or how I had it, which was ultimately, each of you must decide for yourself, based on your individual reason, moral judgment, the appropriate sentence on each count after deliberating with your fellow jurors. I like it better the way I have it now. The next one has to do with the instruction that starts with, under Colorado law, the manner of inflicting a sentence of death is by the administration of a lethal injection. Um, 
I ended up changing it again from inflicting back to enforcing. I know that the statute says inflicting, but there's no requirement that I see in the statute that I have to use that particular word. This is not a statute that's telling me how I should advise or instruct the jurors. And to me, enforcing is a clearer and better word than inflicting. So I have changed that. The other change that we talked about is in there now. Um, and that is in the next sentence. That was at uh, Ms. Nelson's request. I have added the sentence, you must assume that a death sentence will be carried out if the jury determines that it is the appropriate sentence. So that change has been made. The final difference between the discussion we had yesterday and the current draft of the instructions is in the instruction that starts with, in reaching your sentencing verdicts, you may consider all of the evidence admitted during the proceedings. And I changed a, a few things here, and I'll explain to you why. First of all, instead of referring to the evidence admitted during phase two of the sentencing hearing, I changed it to Dr. Jeffrey Metzner's testimony during phase two of the sentencing hearing because there has been some distance now between phase two and where we are today. And uh, that was the only evidence that was admitted in phase two that I remember. And if I'm wrong, I'm sure the parties will tell me and I ask that you please tell me that was admitted for that limited purpose. And it seems to me that this makes it clearer and it avoids any confusion. I don't know whether the jurors will remember which evidence in phase two was admitted for this limited purpose. But if I say it was Dr. Jeffrey Metzner's testimony um, that was admitted for that limited purpose, I think they clearly will remember it and will, it will avoid any risk that they might be confused. So that's one thing I changed. The other thing I changed is that it used to say at the defense's request, at least at the end of last night, that at the end of that sentence and at the end of the following sentence, it used to say in support of a death sentence. So that sentence used to read, however, the evidence admitted during phase two of the sentencing hearing for the limited purpose of determining the existence or absence of any mitigating factor may not be considered as evidence in support of a death sentence. The next sentence used to read, additionally, the evidence admitted during the trial for the limited purpose of considering the issues raised by the defendant's plea of not guilty by reason of insanity, which you were allowed to consider in phase two of the sentencing hearing for a limited purpose, for the limited purpose of determining the existence or absence of any mitigating factor may not be considered as evidence of aggravation in support of a death sentence. Let me address first that last sentence that I just read. It was really long and I think hard to follow. And so I shortened it. I don't think it needs to be as long as it was. And I think as shortened, it is still accurate in terms of just, we don't need to worry about phase two right now. We need to worry about them knowing how uh, the limited purpose of the evidence for their purposes now, for the jurors' purposes now. So that was one change. Uh, and that's more of a change as to form that substance. In terms of the change with respect to the language of in support of a death sentence, uh, now it says may only be considered for that limited purpose. Uh, and the reason I changed it is because in support of a death sentence is a broader, more vague term, and I think could lead to confusion. So, for example, when we're talking about that first sentence that I read, and it's the second sentence in the paragraph, the evidence admitted during phase two of the sentencing hearing or Dr. Jeffrey Metzner's testimony during phase two of the sentencing hearing, uh, which was admitted for the limited purpose of determining the existence or absence of any mitigating factor, uh, may not be considered in support of a death sentence. Well, if he may... If it may be considered for purposes of determining the existence or absence of a mitigating factor and the jury in their deliberations, the jurors in their deliberations are discussing the mitigation and the aggravation indirectly, that sentence 
could lead them to a sentence of death. That doesn't mean that they are considering the evidence for the wrong purpose or for a purpose that the court has told them that they cannot consider it, but it's in making their reason moral judgment, they could, they could be weighing the evidence of aggravation and the evidence of mitigation, and they could conclude, well, this evidence uh, shows to us that this particular mitigating factor does not exist, and that, in exchange, leads us to conclude that a death sentence is appropriate. I'm giving you an, as an, an example. Um, and in the end, I decided that I should stick with the statute, uh, which is, the statutory site is 16-8-107, subsection 1.5, A and B, that's small a and b. And what, what that statute says is that uh, this evidence that Dr. Metzner provided in phase two of the sentencing hearing may only be admitted for the limited purpose of proving the existence or absence of any mitigating factor. And um, the legislature, when it passed 16-8-107, subsection 1.5, A and B, it did not have in mind that we would have a trifurcated proceeding. The legislature is thinking in terms of this being one single proceeding and one single deliberation at the end. And it's telling the court that it should instruct the jury that this is the only limited purpose for which the jury can consider the sentence if we have a sentencing hearing. So it seems to me I should stick with what the statute says and not change it and especially when the change is to a broader term that I think could lead to confusion and to an inaccurate interpretation of the, the instruction and, and an inaccurate understanding of the law. So um, that was the reason why I, I changed it. Um, and I think it's, it's uh, more cautious and more accurate to stick with the language of the statute. That doesn't mean that the jury doesn't get to consider that evidence. I'm not telling them that. I'm just saying, hey, this evidence was admitted for that limited purpose, and you got to continue to consider it for that limited purpose. That's all it is saying, and, um, and I think it is the most accurate way to proceed. So having said all that, do the people want to be heard on any of the um, differences between last night and today that I have gone over? Mr. Orman? We do not, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Does the defense want to be heard on any of the differences between last night and today? Yes, Your Honor, just a few. Give me just a second, please. Yeah. All right, Ms. Nelson, you may proceed. I have just a moment, Your Honor. Yes. With respect to the change to the language at the conclusion of the instruction on burden of proof and reasonable doubt. Yes. We would ask that the court insert an additional phrase in that last sentence so that it would read as follows. An individual juror is not required to have the degree of certainty defined by beyond a reasonable doubt before he or she may decide based on his or her individual reason moral judgment that death is not the appropriate sentence or that a life sentence without the possibility of parole is the appropriate sentence. That goes along with some of the discussions that we had last night about the fact that a juror may reject the death penalty without affirmatively choosing a life sentence. I think that makes it more confusing, and I think it's unnecessary because I'm telling them in the earlier sentences, in the, and I, I repeat that uh, multiple times throughout, that they can only choose a death sentence if they are unanimously convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that death is the appropriate sentence. What are the, do the people uh, have a position on this? I find the court's analysis impeccable and I agree with it. I, I think it's just clearer to, to have it this way. 
I think it's confusing to add the phrase that, that you're requesting, and I think it's unnecessary. All right, what else, Ms. Nelson? Next, uh, with respect to the lethal injection instruction, we would maintain our position that it should um, track the language of the statute and state inflicting instead of enforcing. And in addition, we ask the court add the uh, the words beyond a reasonable doubt to that last sentence. Give me just a second to get there. So you wanted to say you must assume that a death sentence will be carried out if the jury determines beyond a reasonable doubt that it is the appropriate sentence? Yes. I don't have a problem with that. Do the people have any problem with that? No, Your Honor. Okay, I will add that. Uh, in terms of the other word, I, I thought about it, and I, I just think the point is to tell them how it's going to be carried out. That's the point. And I, I, I don't know why we have to use inflict or any other word that to me is not as clear as enforcing or carrying out. I'm happy to use carry out if you want. Enforcing is fine with me. I, I think those are more appropriate words to describe what we're trying to convey to them, which is the method of execution. So... Do you have a preference between enforcing or carrying out? Will be ca or carried out? It will be carried out. Yeah. Between enforce and carry out, we prefer enforce, but maintain our original position about inflict. Okay. Understood. Thank you. What else, Ms. Nelson? Uh, with respect to the victim impact instruction, Your Honor. Oh, hold on. Let me get there. I, I don't think I changed this one from last night. I think I made it. I mean, I changed it based on how I said I would change it, which was pursuant to your request. That's right. And when I reviewed it last night, just a small change. Okay. Uh, I, I think it would read better if the word do um, was changed to make. So you are never permitted to make a comparative judgment between the defendants and the victims versus you are never permitted to do a comparative judgment. I agree with that. Any objection to that, Mr. Orman? It would read you are never permitted to make a comparative judgment instead of you are never permitted to do a comparative judgment. I agree with counsel. I, I do too. What else, Ms. Nelson? Uh, we do object to the court's changes to the um, instruction discussing the limited purpose of the um, evidence that's been admitted, that was admitted um, on the issues of the um, insanity plea, Your Honor. And I think it's important uh, under the Fifth Amendment in Colorado Constitution, Article 2, Section 18, to expressly state in the instructions that this evidence cannot be used as a reason, um, as evidence in support of a death sentence. We think that is, you know, part of the, the court's analysis about why the court changed it, frankly, is exactly why uh, we have maintained this entire throughout the entire course of these proceedings that the statute's unconstitutional uh, because uh, under Estelle versus Smith, under Satterwhite versus Texas, as well as Powell versus Texas, because um, evidence and information that is derived uh, as a result of Mr. Holmes's plea of not guilty by reason of insanity cannot be used in support of a death sentence. And we think those three cases uh, clearly establish um, that proposition. And so we maintain our position and our arguments yesterday that 
at the um, conclusion of both the sentence about the evidence that was admitted at phase two, as well as the evidence that was admitted at the trial for that limited purpose, that an additional sentence be added that states it may not be considered as evidence in support of a death sentence. Well, we're not dealing with a situation in which the people have on their own brought in this evidence. Uh, it is in a situation where, for example, we have a mitigating factor that the defense did not assert or did not attempt to present evidence on, and the people on their own uh, presented evidence of the absence of that mitigating factor. Um, and I'm not saying that that would be wrong, but I might see a concern there. This is a situation where uh, mental health is at the center of this case. And the jury is aware that this is a possible mitigating factor. And so let's use mental health as an example. And I, ha I have no idea what the jury will, will decide or how the jury will assess this evidence. But let's take Let's assume in a hypothetical scenario that mental health is the only mitigating factor involved. And let's assume that the jury goes back to deliberate and they're trying to determine whether um, the appropriate sentence is life or death. And they're assessing the strength of the mitigator as part of their deliberation. And they're making comparisons and they're weighing and they're trying to figure out what their reason, moral judgment uh, tells them to do. And let, let's say they're looking at the mental health evidence, and let's say that they take Dr. Metzner's testimony in phase two, and they decide, you know what, based on what Dr. Metzner said, uh, we, we don't think that mental health is it really much of a mitigator here, or a mitigator at all. This is a hypothetical. In that situation, let's say the jury that says, based on that, all we have here really is aggravation, and our reason, moral judgment tells us after looking at everything that this should be a death sentence. In that case, has the jury considered the evidence related to Dr. Metzner's testimony in support, and I'm doing air quotes, in support of a death penalty? Well, there is that, that's where the confusion lies. I don't know what that means, and I don't know what the jury will take that to mean. I think arguably, indirectly, they, they that may be in support of their final decision, but that's not unconstitutional or improper because this is an issue that was raised by the defense and the statute says the people are entitled or the jury is entitled to consider it only for the limited purpose of determining the existence or absence of a mitigating factor. And I think the best way to proceed is to be that specific, to be that exact, and to be that clear, because otherwise, I think there could be confusion. And that's what I'm trying to avoid. I think the statute uh, says that, oh, I don't think, I know the statute says it has to be considered only for that limited purpose. And that that's how the jury should be instructed. And I think that's how I should instruct the jury. That's how I instructed them when the evidence came in. And I think that's how I should instruct them now. And if this was a one proceeding only, and it had not been broken down into three separate proceedings, uh, that's exactly how the legislature apparently envisioned that the jury would be instructed. So I think that the most accurate and the most precise way of instructing the jury and the way that is most consistent with the statute that uh, honors the statute the best is the way that it appears in this draft. Do the people have anything on this? I agree with your honor. All right, anything else, Ms. Nelson, with respect to this instruction? No. Ms. Nelson, do you have anything else with respect to any other issues that we need to talk about at this time? I do have three more things, Your Honor. In the last instruction, and this is the instruction that describes the verdict form? Yes. And how to complete the verdict form. In the paragraph that describes how to complete section three, uh, the word cannot still appears. Uh, so it says the four person should sign on the designated line in section three of this verdict form to indicate that the jury cannot reach a final, a unanimous final sentencing verdict on that count. Um, and as we discussed yesterday, I have a concern about the word cannot. Um, so do you want me to say does not or did not? Or perhaps, and well, <laughs> so this, I also have a proposed change to the language of the third section of the verdict form. So maybe we should talk about that and then if the court agrees with 
that change, we can change it to be okay. consistent with that. And I know that this, I, I appreciate the court changed this at my request, and this was language I proposed on the fly after the court had rejected my initial proposal, and I gave it some more thought last night. And I would like to propose instead, um, we the jury are not in unanimous agreement on the sentencing verdict for this count, or on the final sentencing verdict for this count. I like to not have a unanimous final sentencing verdict on this count better. The reason I, I'm proposing this new language is because I still have a concern that do not have a unanimous final sentencing verdict on this count, again, um, implies in some way, maybe less so than cannot, but still implies that, you know, they, they were they have to try to work towards unanimity, and then if they fail to do so, then this is sort of a, a last resort that they just, they've kind of abandoned the effort to reach unanimous verdict, and, and we think that would be improper under Tennyson and Young, the Eighth Amendment in Colorado Constitution, Article 2, Section 20. I, I'm gonna, I like the language I have better. I don't think it implies anything improper. Uh, obviously, I've, I'm instructing them that they have a duty to deliberate. The point of deliberations is to try to reach a verdict. That's the point of it. That doesn't mean that they have to agree. They're being told that they don't have to agree, but they have to deliberate. And deliberations are with the idea of trying to figure out what the appropriate sentence is, whether it's life or death. That's the whole point of deliberations. Now, any of them can say, I'm gonna stick with my decision but they have to deliberate. They don't have to change their mind. And I'm telling them all that. So I don't have a concern about this language. Do the people want me to change this language as requested? I agree with the court, Your Honor. All right, Ms. Nelson, what else? So given the court's ruling on that and, and main, without waiving our objections and without um, and maintaining the position that I just articulated in terms of the language, then we would ask the court to change the, the cannot language to um, uh, the four person should sign on the designated line in section three of this verdict form to indicate that the jury does not have a unanimous final sentencing verdict on that count. That's fine, and that's consistent with my change on the verdict forms. I want to be clear that I don't think the change is necessary. I said that yesterday. I continue to believe that. I don't think there's anything wrong with cannot reach, and I think arguably is, is the better language, but I, I am going to change it at Ms. Nelson's request the way that I just agreed to change it yesterday. So. Is there anything else we need to talk about with respect to the instructions? Not with respect to the instructions, Your Honor. All right. Anything we need to talk about with respect to the instructions on behalf of the people? No, Your Honor. Are there any other instructions that anyone wants to tender? Any other requests that anyone wants to make with respect to the instructions? Any other record? Anybody wishes to make uh, any other arguments um, related to the instructions or any other uh, points or issues from your tendered instructions that you would like me to uh, consider and entertain at this time on behalf of the people? No, Thank you. On your behalf, Ms. Nelson. Nothing additional, Your Honor. We maintain all of the arguments that we have set forth up till this point, including the arguments contained in our tendered instructions. You're not waiving anything, but if there's anything specific that you want me to, to address that you think I've forgotten or that should be in the instructions and it's not or anything that we haven't talked about or anything that you think I should change, uh, now is the time to tell me. That doesn't mean you're waiving anything. I understand that you've tendered instructions, but there are a lot of instructions. So if there's anything that you think should be in there and it's not or anything that uh, we, you think we need to change uh, that we haven't talked about yet, do you have anything like that that you want to make a record about or talk about? No, okay. All right, thank you. Um, should we talk about the PowerPoint presentations? Yes, Mr. Brocker saying yes. Ms. Brady, are you the one doing it? Yes, okay, all right. But there's yes. one issue kind of related to the jury instructions yes. that I would like to raise just okay. so we can talk about this. During phase um, one deliberations, there were certain items of evidence that were not taken back for, for obvious reasons. Um, that was, did not happen in phase two for obvious reasons. The way these instructions are drafted and the way I understood the argument yesterday from the defense, that would not make sense to do that in phase three, 
I'm not asking that that be done, but I think the court should inquire as to whether the defense is saying there's any items that should not go back to the jury, just to see if they had that position. Ms. Nelson? No, Your Honor, I think they should, they all go back at this point. Okay, they all go back, except for the live ammunition, obviously. Correct. Okay, all right. We will not provide equipment to play video videos or, or, or CDs, but if there's a request for that, I will let you know, just as we did before, okay? Thank you. All right, Mr. Brockler. Your Honor, um, I told Ms. Brady uh, yesterday my intention. I put it on the record with the court this morning uh, prior to this hearing, just prior to this hearing. I provided Ms. Brady with a uh, eight-page PDF that contains six slides per page, as we've done in the past. I believe that all of those slides are, do not only contain exhibits that were previously admitted, but that have also been used in prior PowerPoint presentations. None of them, I believe, involve any of the NGRI limited related evidence. And I guess I would just allow Ms. Brady to make any record about what she may object to. There are two things that don't appear in the presentation that I want to advise counsel in the court that I still intend to consider using. One is there are those poster boards that we tried to pull off in the, in the se second phase that we show off camera that have the pictures of the deceased in the theater. There's also the audio clip of the 911 call that contains some of the rapid gunfire that took place in the theater. Those are two things that don't appear in the presentation that I gave Ms. Brady. All right, and just a cautionary instruction, Mr. Brockler, similar to the one I've given you before, be careful to make sure that when you're talking about evidence that was admitted for a limited purpose that they know that that's the only purpose that you're arguing that evidence for or with or that, that you're being consistent with that instruction please Ab absolutely your honor and I, I believe at least with regards to the things that i've got in the presentation and i've described here i don't believe any of that was admitted for a limited purpose but i do um, take the court's admonition seriously all right thank you miss brady do you have any objections to the slides in Mr. Brockler's PowerPoint presentation? My only concern is uh, there are a couple photographs of the incendiary devices in the apartment and my understanding from Mil Ms. Nelson is that yesterday at least a conversation was started about whether the prosecution can argue that those devices in the apartment can be argued as non-statutory aggravation. So I think we need to have a ruling from the court as to whether those devices qualify as non-statutory aggravation in addition to the death of Veronica Mosier, whether that can be argued as non-statutory aggravation um, in light of the fact that the jury did not find that to be a statutory aggravated factor. So we would, we would object um, to those, those two things being argued as non-statutory aggravation. Um, other than that, um, I do not have any additional objections to the slides he's presented. Can I argue that, Your Honor? Sure. I'm going to start off with a hypothetical. Hypothetically, and I'm going to talk about the explosives issue first and then the Veronica Mosher Sullivan issue. Hypothetically, let's say the um, U.S. Attorney had decided to take the apartment devices as a federal charge. Obviously, there are federal laws about that. So that it was not something that we could prove. And let's say, hypothetically, that the you found for some purpose during the guilt phase that it was not permissible under Rule 404 for some reason. And that we got to this phase of the trial and the jury had never heard. We got to phase three and a jury had never heard about what the defendant had done in the apartment. I believe that we could say that is non-statutory aggravating factor evidence that the jury should be able to consider in reaching its reason moral judgment as to the appropriate sentence. I think if you look at the statute, this is exactly the type of evidence that should be considered. The jury has heard this evidence. The jury knows about this evidence. It goes to the defendant's moral culpability. The fact that the defendant decided to pour gasoline on his floor, pour motor oil on his floor, set up the tripwire device with the glycerin and the potassium permanganate to um, put, play music 
in his uh, apartment so that a person might come up and open the door to divert the police from the theater so that the first response would be delayed or diminished. All of this is evidence that the jury consider, and all of it is evidence they consider without limitation, because it either comes from the apartment itself or from the statements that the defendant made to detectives Apple and Gumbiner. That is evidence that the jury can consider in determining in their reason moral judgment what sentence the defendant should get for the murders he committed because it is directly related to the murders that he committed. He said so in his statement to Detective Apple and Detective Gumbiner. It goes to his moral culpability. It goes to his crime. So there's no reason that the jury cannot consider that evidence. And I would note, the defendant has not requested some type of limiting instruction from the court saying, the apartment, you should keep that out of your minds, because that would be a nonsense. That would be ridiculous. And, and I appreciate the defense hasn't done that. So uh, there's, there should be no limitation on the ability of Mr. Brockler to argue that. Regarding the issue of Veronica Mosher Sullivan, the jury did not find the presence of that statutory aggravating factor of intentionally killing a child under 12, which when you read it really means that you set out to do that. You set out to kill a child under 12. Okay, they found that the facts did not establish that. Fine. That, they did not find that she was not a child under 12. It's not like they said, well, we don't believe she was six years old. That's not what they found. And the fact that the defendant killed a six-year-old girl is something that the jury should be able to consider in determining the appropriate sentence. Whether he set out to kill a six-year-old girl or not, which is what the aggravating factor that phase one related to, it is evidence that they should be able to consider in determining the appropriate sentence. Otherwise, what we, we couldn't mention that. Are we supposed to just have no picture of Veronica Mosher Sullivan up in, in the third phase? Is it just supposed to, we're supposed to operate under a legal fiction that she was an adult? Again, that would be ridiculous. That would be ridiculous. Is, is Mr. Brockler supposed to be uh, prohibited from saying, well, consider Veronica Mosher Sullivan. Consider that she is never going to get to grow up. Consider all of the things that she is going to miss out on in life because her life was snuffed out at such a young age. Obviously, those are factors that the jury can consider and that Mr. Brockler can argue as far as a reason to impose a death sentence. And uh, I think if you look at the statute, that's exactly the type of information that the jury should be able to rely upon. Because otherwise, Your Honor, we would need an instruction or something to the jury. You shall not consider the fact that Veronica Mosher Sullivan um, was a six-year-old girl. You should assume that she was an adult or something like that for purposes of, of making your decision. That would be nonsensical. No one is asking for that. So the idea that these are somehow forbidden topics for Mr. Brockler's argument is likewise nonsensical. So unless the court has any questions for me, I, I think that I've expressed my p position. Okay, thank you. To make an argument? Yes. Uh, I'll take the, um, the issue of the incendiary devices in the apartment first. Uh, our position is as follows. The hypothetical scenario that Mr. Orman just described is not the scenario that we have in this case. Those are not the charging decisions that the prosecution decided to make in this case. Prosecution made a decision to charge the incendiary devices as a separate count in the complaint and information, uh, and the jury has convicted Mr. Holmes of that count, which is a non-homicide count. Mr. Holmes will be separately sentenced on that count at a later date. And so it is improper to argue that he should get the death penalty in part because of those incendiary devices in his apartment because the Colorado statute that governs um, capital proceedings clearly only applies to uh, first degree murder. So it would violate the statute to allow them to use this count for sentencing purposes 
when he will also be separately sentenced on this count at a later date. In addition, the prosecution chose to allege uh, the statutory aggravating factor of grave risk of death to another. And they also made a decision about how they wanted to present and argue that uh, statutory aggravator to the jury during phase one of the sentencing proceeding. The jury found that that grave risk of death aggravator already existed. Uh, I, I can't think of another reason why they would make an argument about the bombs at this point other than to suggest that the, the situation in the apartment also presented a grave risk of death to um, a group of people. So that statutory aggravator, grave risk of death, was already found by the jury. And to allow them to basically argue it again in a slightly different context, we submit would constitute an um, an impermissible doubling up of aggravators, basically re-arguing an aggravator that a statutory aggravator that was already established, and just getting to argue it again. And we would cite the court to the um, case of United States versus McCullough, M C, capital C U L L A H, which is a case that has come up um, at least one other time in our discussions about instructions. It's a Tenth Circuit case. And the site is 76 F 3rd, 1087. With respect to the, um, the death of Ms. Mosher Sullivan, the jury acquitted Mr. Holmes of this statutory aggravator under Ring versus Arizona, under Apprendi versus New Jersey, under Wolt, W-O-L-D-T versus People. Uh, that was an equivalent the equivalent of an element of the offense, and the jury found, uh, rejected it, and found that it did not exist. So our position is that there is a double jeopardy bar uh, from them arguing that something about the fact that she's a child and that a child died in the theater uh, is a reason to impose the death penalty. And what that would amount to is post-acquittal fact-finding. It would violate the Fifth Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment, Colorado Constitution, Article 2, Section 16, 18, 20, 23, and 25. Um, and I would cite the court to four cases. Uh, Smith versus Massachusetts, 543 U.S. 462 from 2005. Arizona versus Rumsey, R-U-M-S-E-Y, 467 U.S. 203. 1984, Yeager versus United States, Y-E-A-G-E-R, and that's 557 U.S. 110 from 2009, and Satizan versus Pennsylvania, S-A-T-T-A-Z-H-A-N, I may be spelling that, transposing some letters there, versus Pennsylvania, and the site is 537 U.S. 101, and that's from 2003. Uh, obviously, Ms. Mosher Sullivan was a child, um, and, and she was killed in this tragic event, and that fact is, that's not in dispute, but our position is that that's different from allowing them to affirmatively argue that as a non-statutory aggravating circumstance when the jury has already found, the legislature has made a determination about whether and how the death of a child can be considered uh, by a jury in a capital sentencing proceeding. The jury made those considerations, did not find it beyond a reasonable doubt, and so they cannot re-argue that or anything about the fact that she is a child as a basis for imposing the death penalty. And our position is that not only would that violate double jeopardy, but it would also violate due process and the heightened reliability required by the Eighth Amendment, as well as Article II, Section 20 of the Colorado Constitution, um, to allow the prosecution to rely on a fact that the jury failed to find beyond a reasonable doubt uh, as a statutory aggravator for any other purpose, and that that would undermine the reliability of these capital sentencing proceedings. I think, I think you're forgetting that um, under the Colorado death penalty statute, 
the way the Colorado Supreme Court has interpreted the statute, um, there is a um, an eligibility phase and a selection phase. The eligibility phase is steps one, two, and three, and has been described by the court. That would be phases one and two in our proceeding. Um, but the Colorado Supreme Court in People v. Dunlap, um, 975 Pacific 2nd, 723, Colorado Supreme Court case from 1999, made it clear that there's a heightened standard of reliability that applies to the eligibility phase, but not to the selection phase. And, and the court said, once you get to the selection phase, if you get to the selection phase, all evidence that's relevant is admissible and can be considered. Um, the concern is to have the jury make a determination in the eligibility phase based on something that's not a statutory aggravating factor. Uh, and that was one of the concerns that was present in Dunlap and the court addressed. Um, here, we don't have to worry about it because as a result of trifurcating the proceedings, we don't have to worry about the jury uh, making an eligibility determination based on something improper. And the reason for that is that we made them, we forced the jurors to make a determination about aggravating factors in phase one and gave them instructions about what they could consider. We only moved to phase two if they found beyond a reasonable doubt at least one aggravating factor. They found four. Uh, and then in phase two, they determined that whatever mitigation exists does not outweigh aggravation. And so the jury, in effect, has now concluded that the defendant is eligible for the death penalty under Colorado law. And the only question now is selection. What penalty does the jury believe is the appropriate penalty based on each individual juror's individual reason, moral judgment? And in this phase, all evidence that is relevant is admissible. And the people are not limited to the statutory aggravating factors. In fact, Dunlap establishes that. The Colorado Supreme Court said, once you get to phase three or to step four in the selection phase, the jury can consider non-statutory aggravating circumstances. Now, I had included an instruction about the definition of that, and I took it out with both parties' agreement. So, and I don't think it's necessary, but the people are entitled to present that evidence. Um, in terms of Veronica Mosher Sullivan, number one, it's relevant, and, and, and the jury can consider it as victim impact evidence. Otherwise, I'm not sure why I allowed it yesterday. Uh, and there was testimony about that. Of course they can consider it. Uh, it would be improper for the people to tell the jury, hey, you can consider this as an aggravating factor, and I don't anticipate that the people will do that, but they can consider her death as, as part of the victim impact evidence and the loss uh, or the harm caused by the crimes, the loss to her mom and the loss to her family. Uh, that's part of the victim impact evidence that the jury heard yesterday, so of course they can consider it. Now, in terms of the jury having found that this was not a proven uh, statutory aggravating factor, what they found uh, or what they failed to find was a statutory aggravating factor is that the defendant intentionally killed a child under the age of 12. So if Mr. Brockler were to get up in closing argument and say, and you can look at the evidence and consider that he intentionally killed a child under 12, then that would be improper. The jury has made that determination. Uh, but to say that one of the people who ended up being a victim of the defendant's acts was a child under 12, the jury can consider that. That's, that's part of the evidence that the jury can consider from the trial. Similarly, the evidence about incendiary devices is part of the evidence the jury can consider in the selection phase. That is non-statutory aggravating circumstances evidence. Again, you have to be careful not to mix it up with statutory aggravating factors, which the jury has determined what those are. But um, because of the way we have proceeded in this sentencing hearing, we don't have to worry that the jury is somehow going to consider 
something it should not in determining that the defendant is eligible for the death penalty. That determination has been made. He is eligible pursuant to the jury's uh, verdicts in phase one and phase two. And the only question that remains in the selection phase is what sentence the jury believes is the appropriate sentence. So, um, so I, I disagree with the defense and um, I agree with the people on, on this particular point. So for those reasons, the objection to the, to the uh, slides is overruled. Anything else, Ms. Nelson? Your Honor, I just want to make clear that that we have a we just we have a disagreement with the court that heightened standard of reliability does not apply at the selection phase of capital sentencing proceeding. It's our position that the United States Supreme Court has clearly held that it applies to the entirety of a capital sentencing proceeding. Look at Dunlap. It says exactly that. It's it's the case that I cited, People versus Dunlap. It says exactly that. So. And because of the way we've handled this sentencing hearing, we've actually um, eliminated a lot of the risk that generally exists in these sentencing hearings, in, in, and especially in the eligibility phase. Uh, we have taken the jury through this step by step. I, I looked at the instructions that were used in Dunlap, and I'm not being critical of anyone, but... Uh, they were confusing. They would have been even more confusing in our case because of the not guilty by reason of insanity plea and because of the limited purpose for which certain evidence could be used. Uh, in my view, it would have been impossible to, to do this or at least improper to do this in one shot and to have the jury make the determination at the end. Essentially, we would be giving the jury right now instructions on everything. And we would be saying, okay, first you have to decide the question of aggravating factors, but you can only consider this evidence for that. And then if you decide X, then the sentencing hearing is over, but if you decide Y, then you go to phase two. And there, you can consider this evidence, but for this limited purpose. And then you have to make this decision. And, and there, uh, if you decide X, then the sentencing hearing is over, but if you decide Y, then you go on. And then you get to phase three. And, and there, you get to exercise your reason, moral judgment, and you get to decide what sentence is appropriate. But now, there's a difference in what kind of evidence you can consider. It would have been so confusing and so unfair, in my view, to the jury and to the defendant and to the people that it would have been improper. And I think we did it really the only way that we could do it under all the circumstances, especially given how long... Um, each phase has taken and how hard it would be for the jury to have to remember back to each phase and, and what was presented or not presented with respect to each phase. So, all right, is there anything else at this time on behalf of the people that I can address, Mr. Bruckler? Sir, just to uh, say I appreciate where we are with the PowerPoint. We still have several hours, I think, before we get going. I don't intend to add anything to it, but to the extent that I uh, delete slides or, or move the order around, I intend to give a copy of that final presentation to Ms. Brady in advance of the instructions, but I don't anticipate anything additional that would need to be brought to the court's attention. Okay. Ms. Nelson, anything else from you? I do have one additional thing, Your Honor, that uh, related to, um, to Ms. Mosher Sullivan, uh, and it's a motion in limine with respect to the prosecution's closing argument. Uh, we would move in limine to preclude the prosecution from using the phrase our six-year-old. I think that's a phrase that Mr. Brockler has used in uh, perhaps each of his closing arguments thus far, at least one of them that I remember. Our concern is that this implies or encourages an emotional attachment to her by the jury and, 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 and encourages an emotional response and it sort of suggests that she is the community's child in some respect or conveys a, a personal opinion about her and her character. Obviously, it's an incredibly sad, awful, and tragic, tragic circumstance of this case, and no one would argue otherwise. But I think that using this, this term, our position is that using this term, our six-year-old, um, is improper for the reasons that I've stated, and we ask that he not be permitted to use that, that phrase uh, in this closing argument. Mr. Brockler, are you, in, or Ms. Orman, are you folks intending to refer to our six-year-old? No, Your Honor, and we, we, we've all just had a brief uh, conversation here. None of us remember that happening. I, I guess the record will, will 
be the ultimate arbiter of that. But Mr. Brackler has no intention of using that. Okay. Well, that takes care of it then. Um, and I don't remember whether that's being used. I'm not saying, Ms. Nelson, that you're wrong. You may well be right. I just I don't remember that being, being used. And certainly no objection was made, uh, or I think I might remember it. But um, in any event, there's no disagreement, and I think it's, uh, it's appropriate to proceed as the parties have agreed. All right, let's um, break then. If, uh, if anything comes up that I need to address before 1 o'clock, if you would let my staff know through email, please, I would appreciate that so that we don't uh, come here at 1 only to find out that there are additional issues that we need to talk about, okay? Is there one more thing? Can I raise one more thing? You bet. I'm just sort of asking uh, when the court would like to have me address this. I'm not necessarily asking to address it now. It's something I just want to put on the table. Uh, at some point, I would like to at least have a discussion on the record as to uh, the court's intention regarding access to the court file regarding specific types of exhibits. And specifically, I think the Criminal Justice Records Act probably gives the court discretion regarding the criminal justice records here. And there have been um, some, rec so, some exhibits that I think the court should consider whether or not to grant the public access without some kind of special need. Specifically, the, and, and I know that the victims in this case would not want the court to give out the, what we have classified as the um, graphic photographs and the crime scene video, which would show the, the deceased bodies. Additionally, I would think the defendant might have a position regarding release of things like the uh, notes from Dr. Fenton or the uh, interview with, with uh, Dr. Reed, even though that was played on the video here, it's a different quality. And I'm not sure whether the limited waiver of confidentiality would somehow provide some protection. I don't know. I just think this is an issue that the court might want to consider and we might want to at least have a discussion on the record about. So I thought I would just bring that up as a topic of conversation. Thank you. I, I've thought about that. There are obviously pretrial orders, too, that we have suppressed. There are pleadings that we have suppressed. Uh, there are bench conferences that we've had. Um, there are exhibits that have not been made public. Um, how about if we do it this way? How about if uh, there is a request um, for access to any such pleadings or documents or exhibits? I give both of you a chance to be heard on that request before I, I rule on it. How does that sound? I think that's an excellent plan, Your Honor. All right. Is that okay with you, Ms. Nelson? I think that's an appropriate way of dealing with it, Your Honor. Okay. That's how we'll proceed. One other thing I almost forgot. In uh, the first instruction uh, where I am giving the jurors the advisements, uh, I added the following sentence. You should do your utmost to avoid all news reports. That's consistent with the instruction that Ms. Brady suggested which I adopted yesterday, okay? All right. All right, well, folks. Your Honor, maybe? Yes. I'm sorry, just one more thing, because I can see we, us needing to raise this at another time, and it, there may be a, lots of things going on. It may be difficult. Um, I just wanted to understand the court's position. Uh, we're going to get a verdict here one way or the other. I mean, a verdict, or, a sentence from the jury. And, or, uh, from me, or from me. Or, or from you, right. right. But, I, well, the jury's going to return a, 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 a verdict form. To the court, right, and then the jury's job is done. Um, my position is, once that has happened, the court's order regarding limitations on pretrial publicity should no longer be in effect because the purpose of it was so that the jury can make a decision without the impact of pretrial publicity. Obviously, if there's a sentencing hearing in the future, whatever pretrial publicity is out there is not going to affect your honor. So, um, I think that if you look at Rule 3.6. And, and 3.8, what they contemplate is pre-verdict type of publicity and not post-verdict type of publicity. If you look at 3.6, it talks about the accused. The defendant is no longer the accused. He's the convicted. So the, the rationale behind the court's orders for limiting pretrial publicity to me would seem to end upon the jury returning whatever verdict form it, it turns in. That is my understanding of what the court's orders say. And I just wanted to see if the court is, has a difference of opinion on that so that we can operate accordingly and, and take appropriate actions. When you say pre-trial publicity, I'm not following. I, what are you referring to exactly? The, the court, and I think it was Judge Sylvester, had entered, and I don't remember their numbers, a couple of orders limiting pre-trial publicity. You mean a gag order? The gag order, Your Honor. Preventing yes. you from making public statements about the case. Correct, Your Honor. And you're saying once the jury returns the verdicts, 
uh, or the verdict forms, you want to make sure that that no longer applies so that you can proceed accordingly or that it does apply so that you can also pr proceed accordingly. Correct. All right. Does the defense have a position on this? All right, thank you. I, I, be, I believe that that order would apply up until the jury returns the verdict forms. And I have, after I have announced whatever um, the verdict, the contents of the verdict forms are, um, from there on out, then um, it would not have any application. Thank you, Your Honor. And one last thing, if, if I may. This is, wait, this is the third time you said last well, thing. You know, Your Honor, I'm this sitting is, here. This is, your, this is for real your last thing. Go ahead. It, it, things occur to me as I'm sitting here. And uh, while I've been on this trial, I sort of had to put this job aside. But one of my jobs is uh, the records custodian for the DA's office in Arapahoe County. And I anticipate we are going to get a, a number of public records requests relating to this case. And I know how to exercise that discretion. The, the issue that I have is I know for a fact we are going to get public records requests for things like um, the defendant's uh, mental health evaluations, the records that we have on these things, the discs, original you know, copies of the original discs to Dr. Reed. I think that the defendant may have continuing confidentiality in those. And um, I don't want to be the one to have to make that decision sort of as an administrative official, which is what I normally do as, as a records custodian. Um, when I could see someone saying, well, how are you making that decision for someone you prosecuted? So in the event, and I imagine the defense would object to me releasing such records. Uh, in the event that I get such a request, my request is that the court authorize a procedure where I can say I've received such a request and the defendant would have the opportunity for a hearing in front of your honor before I would give out the records that we have that I think might be subject to that confidentiality so that the defendant would have an opportunity to have a neutral arbiter decide on that. Ms. Brady, is that, what, what do you think about that? Your Honor, we continue to assert all confidential and privilege, uh, privileges that Mr. Holmes has under his state and uh, federal constitutional rights, and we do object to any, any release of any information that is covered by those privilege and confidentiality. What's your position on the request to have a proceeding where you can be heard to make objections to any specific requests? I don't have an objection to that. All right, let's do it that way then. I, I haven't done any research on this and I haven't looked at the rules or statutes that apply. So uh, just because I'm agreeing to have um, some kind of proceeding, it doesn't mean that I'm agreeing that there will be a hearing or that I'm agreeing that I get to make a decision or that there, there should be something formal in front of the court. I'd have to look at the rules in the statute to see if they provide for that kind of procedure. But assuming that they do, then that's how we would proceed from there. We would have some kind of hearing, some kind of formal proceeding, and the defense could be heard to object. And then I could I, I would make determinations if, if, that's, uh, if it's up to me or... Uh, I'd have to see the, what the rules say and what the statutes say. You're probably much more familiar with them than I am, Mr. Orman, because of the position in which you've been in your office. Your Honor, here's what I can tell you about that. Uh, there's, two record, there's two statutes regarding public records in Colorado. There's uh, CORA, the Colorado Open Records Act, right. which does not apply to these records. Then there's the Colorado Criminal Justice Records Act, which does. CORA actually has a procedure where if the records custodian is unsure about whether they can release records, to go in front of the judge and to say, Judge, we're not sure. You make the call for us. Right. CCJRA does not have such a procedure built in. Right. The way the CCJRA is structured is I, as the records custodian, uh, consider a number of factors, and they're outlined in a case called Freedom Colorado, Inc. versus El, El Paso County Sheriff. And I consider those factors and make a decision in my discretion as to whether or not to release the records. If a media outlet or whoever is requesting the records disagrees with that, we can have a discussion. But if we don't come to an agreement, they then can file a lawsuit, and I am the defendant, where uh, they are seeking essentially equitable relief from the court to require me to disclose those records. And it's a show cause hearing for me to show cause why not. 
I can do that, and I can say that the, I think that these records are covered by confidentiality. The problem with that is I don't think the defendant has a part in that proceeding. And I think that when we're talking about something like psychiatric records, that the person who would hold the privilege normally for those records should have a voice in it. I think that you, if you also look at the Criminal Justice Records Act, there's a provision in there that says, I should not give out records if doing so would violate a court order. This, these proceedings are going to be ongoing. Regardless of whatever verdict the, um, the, the jury reaches in this case, uh, at least for a while, this court is going to have continuing jurisdiction over the parties and over the case. And I think that the court has an inherent authority in exercising that jurisdiction to limit me from disclosing confidential information. And I think that the defendant should have the opportunity to uh, challenge the, the potential release of such information to the public, because anybody can get it. And once they get it, it can go anywhere on the internet and so forth. Uh, I am saying this really in an attempt to protect the defendant's rights to confidentiality in the information and to give him the opportunity to do that. So that is, that is where I see the law is, and, and that's why I have asked for this. And based on that, that's why I was asking the question, because that was sort of what I thought, but I wasn't sure. I think we should follow the rules. So you got to make whatever decision you got to make based on your discretion. If somebody wants to initiate a proceeding because they disagree with you, then they can initiate a proceeding. If a proceeding is initiated and um, the, defendant, the defendant or his attorneys want to uh, intervene, I'm assuming there, there might be a procedure or there may be a procedure for the defendant to intervene, uh, and then we could proceed from there. In the alternative, if either side wants me to enter an order uh, to the along the lines of what Mr. Orman was just saying, uh, given uh, the anticipated uh, pendency of uh, appeals uh, or uh, more proceedings, whatever it may be, then either side can do that or both sides can do that if they get together and file um, a joint motion for me to enter such an order, in which case you could rely on that order in, in denying requests uh, that may be made. Uh, it, assuming that I think that order is appropriate and I enter it. So those are the two ways that I think uh, are appropriate for us to proceed. That makes a lot of sense, Your Honor, and I hadn't thought about that last um, possibility. Here's my suggestion. Um, it, if the defendant wants, the, wants me not to provide this information, that they make an oral motion today and the court can order a preliminary order and um, maybe have give them time to file something, and I'm not saying something lengthy, so the court can do a more permanent type of thing in the near future. Um, I don't feel comfortable trying to assert the defendant's rights to confidentiality. I don't know that I have standing to do that, so I don't want to be the one making that assertion. But I certainly think the defendant should be able to, so I think the court could enter that order, and I, I certainly don't have an objection to that. Well, Ms. Brady just did, I thought, a moment ago, orally. So. But I, I still think the best way to proceed is if you want me to enter an order to file something in writing with specific authority and the reasons why you think an order is appropriate. And then I will take a look at whatever is filed, and then I will decide whether an order is appropriate or not. And it's probably best if you confer with each other and figure out uh, the type of order that you uh, both want me to enter if you think that you both think it's appropriate. If you can't agree, then file whatever you think you need to file, and we'll go from there, okay? Let's have everybody back at uh, quarter to one, just in case. Is that okay? Is that all right? All right, quarter to one. Thank you. The court will be in recess. All rise.
Well, apologies for taking an extra second there to jump onto the set. I was on the other side of the room at the moment, but the time now is 1024. We are in a holding pattern. We're waiting now until approximately 1 p.m. when the jury will arrive. We'll certainly be ready for them to start earlier in case another objection does come up and we'll keep an eye on the signal throughout the day. But I, I do want to warn you that we are going to spend the rest of this time, this gap, replaying testimony from yesterday. Before we get there, I'll have a, a, a moment. We'll, we'll share a moment here and, and discuss some of the uh, situation where we are and what just happened today. Uh, namely, they finished reviewing this third draft of the instructions that the jury is going to be read at 1 o'clock. That uh, means that the fourth draft should be the final draft unless there's another objection, in which case they'll gather a few minutes early to do that, or rather to resolve that. Um, those instructions have not uh, been posted online. They usually get posted once they're finished, so we, we don't have a copy to look at with you, but we can talk about um, uh, some of what this jury is going to be faced with for the very first time. Specifically, they're being faced with the death penalty decision for the very first time. I in every other instance where they gathered, they've had three other deliberations. In every instance, they knew this was a capital murder case, a death penalty case, but never before this decision have they actually been asked to decide to deliberate on the death penalty itself. So. All of our bets are off the table. All of our questions about will they feel mercy earlier, it's a very different decision they're being faced with now. So we do not um, have any basis, judging by the previous decisions, on what might come into their factors now, what questions they might ask, or what decisions they might make. But what we can tell you uh, is that they will be instructed on the procedures of the death penalty, and we have more information about this on the 7 News app or the denverchannel.com, but it comes from Title 18, Colorado's statute, explaining, well, this entire proceeding that we've been going through since January, but also specifically rules regarding the death penalty under Colorado's laws. That includes the fact that it's a lethal injection. There are no other options for the uh, execution of someone who's sentenced to die. It will happen at a closed facility. It's in the Canyon City Correctional Complex, I believe. Um, interestingly, the judge, in this case, Judge Carlos Samore, uh, under the law, is required to sign a death warrant for a, a week between, I think it's 96 and 120 days, um, and I'm not sure if those numbers are right, but roughly in that area, after the sentence is passed and after all of the appeal, appeals are done. So. We, we called yesterday, one of my colleagues called and checked. There are three people who have been sentenced to death in Colorado. None of them currently have outstanding death warrants, either because they've been stayed for execution or because the uh, appeals process is not done. Those uh, three men have been on, um, y you might call it death row, even though there's no such designated place. There is no um, green mile, so to speak, in Colorado. Those three men have been waiting for between five and a half years and almost 20 years. So that's um, the length of time since their sentences were handed down. And uh, the process uh, has not yet been carried out. The last time Colorado executed someone, I believe, was in 1997, and that's the first person um, under the lethal injection, under the current uh, law and statute. Uh, well, let's see. The, the other thing that we heard today was these discussions about the evidence and the release of more evidence. You might remember, if you uh, can think back to the actual time of, around the guilty verdict itself, when uh, the defendant was convicted of 165 counts. Around that time, maybe even right before the verdict was delivered, uh, there was a f motion filed um, by, I believe, Steve Zansberg, who represents our, our media consortium, the same group of media outlets um, through our Colorado Broadcasters Association who secured this camera, put the equipment on the roof in order to transmit it back to our studios. That attorney submitted a request for more of the evidence that hasn't been released previously. Previous rulings that the only evidence uh, that we would get copies of was evidence that was written and that the juries were handed copies of. Anything that was on the screen was considered sufficient and the court didn't want to dedicate resources to sharing that out. Uh, but Steve did file a request for those, 
Uh, the judge, you'll remember, joked about putting it on hold for six to eight weeks because he wanted to finish the proceedings first. But now that the conclusion is on the horizon and certainly everyone is prepared for this verdict as early as tomorrow, uh, the judge was asked by Mr. Orman to start revisiting those decisions. Um, and the judge has basically said if there's any future uh, filings, we'll have more hearings about this. Certain things like the uh, graphic crime scene photos or videos, the autopsy information, uh, certain information like that I do not expect we would get. I, I think that the court has made it clear that the policy is to protect that um, and certainly I, I think uh, uh, we at 7 News would, uh, would be fine agreeing with that situation. Uh, but other bits of evidence, uh, additional photos or videos, family videos, um, uh, I know that one of the things that Steve did request for us was access to um, get photographs of the model. You remember the model they made of the theater and the, there were the marks for where people were sitting and where there was uh, bullet damage and things like that. And we had requested access to that earlier in the process and that was all put on hold. So some of those questions could come up again, but certainly we haven't, um, as, a, as a media consortium, had a meeting to discuss that. Uh, that's something that will be done, of course, in the future. Uh, since we mentioned it earlier, the last thing that I'll bring up before we start replaying some testimony for you is our plans for tomorrow. So just like every other verdict, um, we're going to get a warning. This time it'll be a three-hour warning. As soon as we hear from the court that that warning is in, the jury says they've reached a decision. Uh, as soon as that happens, we're going to do the same process we did before. We'll have our YouTube stream, our, our Scribble Live chat, everything on standby, all, ready to go. We'll get that on uh, tonight. As soon as the verdict decision uh, is announced, we'll turn those all on. We'll start transmitting right away with coverage, with recaps, uh, with interviews with our legal experts and et cetera. Uh, as soon as we get crews out in the field, we'll try to talk to them here on this stream as well. So do please download the 7 News app or sign up for our email alerts through the denverchannel.com. That way we can let you know because there is no set time. The jury could take 10 minutes or they could take 20 hours. We don't know how long they're going to take. Certainly uh, the pattern has been relatively short deliberations and we're preparing for that. But without knowing, we're going to have to send you alerts and send you warnings when you can come join us. And we want to make sure uh, that you're uh, on our email alerts for breaking news or on our push alerts through our 7 News app so we can get in touch with you and tell you that this process is happening because I know so many of you have expressed time and time again interest in getting those messages, interest in knowing uh, when there's a development and certainly this will be one of the final developments in this case. Of course, uh, 24 counts of murder including um, extreme indifference and uh, after deliberation, all of those will need decisions from the jury. So there's 24 sets of forms that they're going to have to decide upon. And if they want the death penalty on one or all of them, they'll have to sign their names. Every juror will have to sign their names on those forms. After it's all done, of course, whenever it's done, our cameras will stay out there at the courthouse uh, and, and at popular request, I know someone has asked me about this before on the chat rooms, we'll try uh, to bring as many interviews, as many comments as we can get, whether it's from families or survivors or jurors, we'll try to bring that to you live on the stream, but certainly also on 7 News on your televisions for those of you who are here in Colorado. Uh, with that, I think I've exhausted my list of things to talk about for the moment. So uh, Andrew and I are going to replay some video segments from the Phase 3 testimony for you now. Uh, we're starting with Lisa Childress. Around 12.40, 12.45, we're trying to arrange uh, a, a quick interview with Dan Recht, our legal expert, uh, before the actual closing arguments themselves begin and the instructions are read uh, and the jury arrives around 1 o'clock. So do look for us to come back live at least once, if not twice, uh, uh, but around 12.45 is when we'll start our uh, warm-up to this closing arguments for Phase 3. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, right now, we'll start our replays of Phase 3 testimony with Lisa Childress. Please tell us your full name for the record and spell your first, middle, and last names. Lisa, L-I-S-A, Janine, or if my mother would pronounce it, Janine. That's J-E-A-N-N-I-N-E, -N -N -E, Childress, C-H-I-L-D-R-E-S-S. Right. Ms. Tish McGuire, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. 
Ms. Childress, can I ask you to pull that microphone ridiculously close to you, even closer than it is so the jury oh, can hear fan. you? <laughs> Say thank you. Can you please thank tell you. the jury what you do for a living? I work at Edwards Air Force Base, uh, the Child Development Center. I'm a teacher. Where do you live? Palmdale, California. Are you married? Yes. Who are you married to? Shannon Troy Childress. Do you have any children? Yes. Who are your children? Jesse Evan Childress, Colin Eric Childress, and Tyler Adam Childress. Three boys. Is that the order of their birth? Yes. Who is Jesse Childress to you? He was my oldest one. He was adventuresome, kind, um, stealthy, <laughs> uh, but we we talked a lot, but there's a lot of stuff that he was like, no, mom, you're not going to find this out about me, so I'm going to keep it quiet. Could I please have photograph 4726 that's already been admitted? Is this Jesse? Yeah, it is. Was Jesse a fan of uh, a team that has colors like that? Yes. This is actually a picture of one of the many, many, many groups, uh, sports groups, uh, other groups that he was involved with. Not sure when he slept, but this was a, uh, I believe it was flag football. Thank you. When was Jesse born? January 5th, 1983. How old was Jesse when he was murdered? 29. Where did he grow up? Uh, started, he was born in Ventura, California. And then um, we had to move to Ojai, California, which is my hometown, where both his grandparents lived, uh, because my husband had a soccer incident, had a head injury, and he was knocked out for four and a half days. He was in a coma. So that was when Jesse was two and a half. And so that was one of the many events in our life, <laughs> stressful events. Um, but. We knew the head of uh, the head nurse of the ICU at that hospital was um, a family friend, so my two and a half year old was able to go into ICU, which is generally not allowed. And my husband had lots of brothers, <laughs> so. And then we moved to uh, Palmdale when we bought our first house, which is our the same house we live in currently, because we don't like to move. <laughs> what was Jesse like in high school? He was shy, allegedly. He was quiet, more like. Um, he was involved in um, love soccer. He tried to go out for the football team, but he made it through, I don't know, it was like two or three weeks of hell week, but when it came to putting on the equipment, he put on the uh, helmet and he couldn't stand it. And he came home and told me, Mom, how am I going to tell Dad? I can't tell Dad because my husband was, you know, super, super athletic and in, in football and baseball and soccer and you name it, he was in it. So he didn't want to tell his dad. And I said, Your Honor, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'd object under 401, 403 in due process. Um, sustained. What other sorts of things did Jesse like to do when he was in high school? Um, he was in Your Honor, the. I have the same objection. Sustained. What did, what high school did Jesse go to? Little Rock High School in California. What did Jesse do after high school? Well, he was on the graduating uh, program, but he 
painted himself into the corner and, of all things, was flunking uh, English. So the night before, and he was asked, "Give me, the, you know, by m me, where's the tickets? Where the sick to the tickets? Because you have to have tickets to go to the graduation, and you only get us so many. So we had his grandparents coming, um, my mother-in-law. So, and he had intercepted the mail." told me all the calls from the counselor to my work were, oh, no big deal. So he, for eight hours, ran away from home with a backpack and a, uh, I think it was a sleeping bag and like $100. That's not going to get you very far. So after eight hours, he came home at midnight walking through the door, crying, saying, Mom, I'm sorry, I was stupid, and that was a dumb idea. And I had already called my parents and his grandma and his uh, girlfriend, ex-girlfriend at the time. Um, and I'm going to make the same objection and add non-responsive. I think she's answered the question. Ask your next question, please, Mr. Schmerboyan. <laughs> What did Jesse decide to do after he left high school? He came to me and said, because he, he had a very good friend from, I think he was five when he met Trevor, who had signed on the dotted line for the Army. And so Jesse came to me and said, Mom, can I join the army. Mind you, you'd already seen the recruiter and gone the whole, you know, investigated the whole thing. And he had long blonde hair. And uh, I said, um, son, you're 18. You can do, you're an adult now, so you can make that choice. And he asked, he said, yes, but I wanted to get your permission. And I said, okay. Because he said, I need more structure. And I said, Okay, <laughs> sounds good. And he scored very high on the ASVAB. And Can you tell the jury what that is? <laughs> it's the test that they um, give you for military to see um, your basically intelligence level, so what areas of expertise you can go into. And he scored, he actually scored, I think it was 80, and he went back because he was mad because the computer wasn't working properly for the math portion and he scored five points higher so then he was able to choose um, a more refined grouping of career paths and he chose satellite communications where did he go during his career in the military where did, what different places well his after Fort Jackson is the um, basic training, then... The objection is sustained. But, Ms. Teach McGuire, you may proceed as we discussed. Where did Jesse eventually end up being based uh, during his last position in the military? Last position? Okay. Uh, he was a reservist and stationed at uh, Buckley. Was he still in the Army at that time, or was he in a different branch of the military at that time? Yeah, he was Air Force. He was Air Force Reservist, because he got out of the Army, then hop, was out for a little bit, and then got into Air Force Reservist. And what was his profession at the time? Oh, he's going to roll his eyes in heaven at me. Um, cyber Systems Operator. He was the computer IT guy. Could you tell the jury about Jesse's personality? He was relaxed, but hyper. If there was a Broncos game on, or a Kings game on, or a Clippers game on, he was, sports were big in our family no matter what's going on. Would you say that Jesse had a generous spirit? Yes. He was 
uh, the oldest, and he, through his military service, he said, I am, can help you and dad, and he was basically Santa Claus for his two younger brothers because he was a single guy and earning money, and he also knew how to be downsized frugal, but pay for uh, Bronco season tickets and eat ramen so he could pay for Bronco season tickets and pay for house payment and his puppy. Um, so he's very generous with his brothers, myself, his dad, his uh, grandfather, his grandma. How did Jesse treat others? Um, but he was very generous, kind, loving, non-judgmental, um, and just very like a counselor too. He was always counseling somebody, um, helping him out, whatever the issue was. Did Jesse like to travel? He loved to travel. He, in the Army, he was, his first duty station was Colorado uh, Springs, Peterson. Even though he's in the Army, it's Air Force Base, but it was because of satellite communication, some kind of deal. And that was fantastic for him because he's a huge Broncos fan. Um, then he... I did three years there and then got an opportunity to go to uh, Landstuhl, Germany, the base, in, army base in Germany. Um, he happened to get very lucky, as he said. He flew in to Frankfurt, Germany to millions of World Cup fans. So he got to experience the World Cup craziness, fun, wonderful time, um, which just fit right into his calendar of events. And he was there for, what was he, till 2009. Did Jesse have three main goals he wanted to accomplish in his last year? Yes. Can you tell the jury about those goals? After he hopped out of the army and decided he wanted to attempt something else, you can, because he had a top level security clearance, he could, um, he tried the contractors thing, which you're supposed to make extra money um, because you have a top level security clearance. It's in satellite communications area. So he went to, as we called it, the sandbox, uh, the Persian Gulf to work there and he made a lot of money in three months and was trying to make it work, but he was like, this, no, this is not, not for me. So he got out of that, and his goals were to go to school, go back to school, get a house, and a dog. Did he accomplish all those goals? He did. What kind of brother was Jesse to Colin and Tyler? generous. Um, they were three brothers. They were very competitive. They were always trying to outdo each other, be better. Um, sports uh, were always going on, whether it was, you know, folding laundry and making a basket with a pair of socks, um, basketball. Just our house was basically the neighborhood park because you could come to our house and we had all kinds of sports equipment. So everybody was invited. And once you came to the children's house, you were family. What kind of son was Jesse to you and Shannon? He...
He was just this bright light. And if you were having a, you know, just a horrible day at work or you were feeling down, he'd just interject his fabulous humor and and it it's my husband's Irish, Dutch, and I'm English, Japanese, Welsh. And it's that sort of British humor that's kind of dry and sarcastic. And he would just interject just a funny little zip. And you're like, oh, I'm back. <laughs> I'm good. So I miss that. And I miss his laugh and smile. Can you tell the jury about the last day that you got to spend together with Jesse and Tyler and Colin? I was here for two weeks to hang out. Um, our last day, where all three of my sons were together, we went to um, Manitou Springs. Uh, it's called Manitou Springs Incline, and it's this ridiculous thing that I said, oh, no, you guys, go ahead. I'm a peep, you know, I'm going to be down here waiting for you till you're done because I'm less athletic than all of my husband and all three boys. So I like to relax. And they went, uh, Jesse and Colin went halfway up and came back down because they were like, no, nah, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> We've already done this uh, because they had to do that, I believe, for their, in the, Air Force and Army, where you have to run the thing. Um, but we had to wait for Tyler because Tyler wanted to go run the whole thing and go the whole way around. So we had to sit there and wait till he was done. And then we went to uh, a Brazilian steakhouse because that was something that was something that Jesse did. He wanted to taste you know, all different foods. Um, so we had to try a new restaurant all the time. And that's a tradition that we still do to this day. And do you remember when that was? It was June of 2012? Yes, June of 2012. I believe it was June 2nd. <laughs> Your Honor, if I may approach the witness with what's been marked as People's Exhibits 4719... Ms. Childers, if you could take a look at those photographs and see if you recognize them. Yes. Are they all photographs of Jesse in various different parts of his life? Yes. Your Honor, at this time I would move for the admission of all of those photographs. Your Honor, we have nothing additional. All right, without any additional objection and based on my previous rulings, all of those exhibits are admitted uh, and may be published. That's uh, P-TR-4719 through 4727. Uh, with the exception of 4726. If I could please have 4719. Do you tell the jury about what this is? Uh, this is Christmas. His, it was after basic training uh, when he was in AIT, which is, it was a year-long course because of satellite communications. He made it to the the end, which is the top level, and that was Christmas, where he got to come home. Who's in the photograph with Jesse? That's myself, Jesse in the middle, and my husband. That's Shannon. Childress. Shannon Childress, yes. If I could please have 4723. Tell the jury about this photo. This is uh, one of my son's many funny expressions. And he's 
when I look at this, I have, I was trying to figure out where it was, but I'm guessing it was in Rome, one of his favorite cities. And he's, his facial expression says, hmm, mom, can you guess what city this is? <laughs> May I please have 4725? Where is Jesse in this photograph? He is kneeling down, and he's the one on the bottom. Uh, I believe this is, one again, one of the many groups, uh, flag football group. Um, and... I think this is indoor flag football. I'm not sure. There was an indoor and an outdoor flag football group. Can I please have 4727? Where is Jesse in this photograph? He is sprinting. It looks like he's trying to catch the ball. He'd like to be play defense and offense. And he's got his little shiny shoes and a cap. He always had a cap that actually looks like a clipper's cap because it's on backwards. I could please have 47.25. Oh, sorry. If I could have 47.27. <coughs> and 47.24. Right? Can you tell the jury what this photograph is? This is my three sons at the Manitou Incline and on their last day together. Can you tell the jury who's who? Uh, Jesse, of course, is wearing the hat. He's on the left with, I think that's his, like one of his favorite shirts because it's pictured in a lot of, of photographs. I think it's uh, his Punisher shirt. Collins in the middle with his incognito, I'm not here, sunglasses and a Batman shirt, as it happens to be. Uh, and then that's Tyler, my youngest one, on the right. And that's the one that made it all the way around and ran the whole way. And we had to wait for him. I could have 4720. Did Jesse have a different, couple different hiking groups he was friends with? Oh, yes. I actually, I know one of the people in this group. Um, this picture I found on his, uh, uh, Yahoo account. And, uh, once they cracked the code to get into his laptop, because there was this, you know, stealthy password, of course. And he is wearing a Broncos jersey, of course. 4721. Do you know who the dog is in that photograph? Of this, this is uh, one of his hiking groups, and that is Max, his dog that he got. I could have 4722. This picture I chose because that is my son with a mischievous smile on his face and a twinkle in his eyes, and he's on the edge of a cliff. That kind of describes your son? Kind of describes my son. He's, hey, I'm funny, and guess what? I may or may not be on the edge of a cliff, Mom. Thank you. I want to talk to you about how you learned about your son's murder. Mm. Can you please talk to the jury about July 20th of 2012? Okay. Um, I got a phone call from Colin, uh, and he was, he's, reservist and he's stationed down at uh, Peterson and the Air Force had called him first and said um, you know we're concerned Jesse's not at work um, he may have been in the theater shooting and 
I said, what theater shooting? Because normally I, I, we watch, have our coffee and watch news every morning. And that morning I was not watching it. And I was, um, had to go to the 99 cent store and get some uh, bowls and napkins. We were having a ice cream social at work for the staff. So I'm over there and get this call, and I said, what are you talking about? And Colin said, I have to go up to Buckley Air Force Base and check in with the Air Force folks. And I said, okay, keep me posted. And I handle stress by just saying, okay, I'm still going to go. You know, it's, 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 it's not nothing to worry about. Uh, and then I, Colin called me back and said it was the Batman movie premiere movie. And then I had a little bit less positiveness because I said, of course he was there because he had to be at the premieres uh, because he loved superhero movies. So I'm sure he was there. So my mother's intuition said, okay. Of course he is there, but keep me posted. Everything's okay. You know, we don't know anything yet, so don't panic. So I went to work, told my bosses, okay, this might be happening. We're not supposed to have cell phones on our person. We have to shut them off. And I told them, I said, I'm going to keep my cell phone in my pocket. So if I get a call, I'm calling you guys to come and relieve me so I can take this call. And that happened not too long after that. And I asked Colin, I said, okay, you guys are out searching the hospitals with the Air Force folks, and um, do you know anything yet? He said, no, there's, you know, I don't know, it was 70, 70 injured and there's lists here, there, and everywhere, and so we don't yet know. So it was, again, waiting game. I was like, all right. I said, do I need to go home? Should I go home, or should I stay at work? And he said, no, Mom, you need to go home. And it's about half an hour drive. So that was a very long drive. So I get home, and then it's waiting, waiting, waiting. Then he calls. He said he's not on any of the lists. He was not in the hospital. I was still, okay, it's all right. He probably crawled out of the back door, and he's in a ditch somewhere. You know, he's still alive. He's still alive. Then later, it was dark, I get the call. Um, and Colin says, Mom, he was one of the ten in the theater. And my youngest son, Tyler, was on a camping trip that he had just left for like the day before. So I had to figure out, okay, I gotta call Tyler. Um, and by then my mother-in-law was already there. Uh, my father and uh, my new mom, as I called her, Nita, they were at a family reunion in Ohio. So I had to call, get a hold of them. So I was just like, okay, I got to do this. I got to, you know, contact everybody and be efficient, which is kind of how I handle stress. How many? I knew my son was gone, and then on, I get a knock on the door, and here comes Colonel Hoff and the... Um, chaplain from Edwards Air Force Base because they had, they knew, I worked there and they knew, okay, they already knew what was going on.
Buckley had called them, and they came in, and I said, hey, guys, I already know, you know, welcome to the children's house. Come on in, sit down, here's some, would you like some juice, blah, 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 blah. You know, I went into mom mode, even though my son was gone. How many different funerals and memorial services did you have for Jesse? The first one was at Buckley Air Force Base. Then I call them celebrations of life. We had a, an invite to Dove Valley, so that was another celebration of life because Jesse's favorite player was 92 Elvis Dumerville, and he got word, I believe, through the Air Force that um, Jesse was a fan, season ticket holder the year before, and so we went and we got to meet him he presented us with a personalized framed jersey from him to our family in honor of Jesse. What was the next service? Um, oh, I forgot. In between, there's Buckley. Then you go through Aurora. And then we had the military funeral at um, Fort Logan. and then the Dove Valley thing. Then the Friday after that was the 310th, uh, the unit that he worked with. They had a smaller, more personal, not more personal, but a, a, a more downsized funeral um, with, the, with the group and the Air Force folks. Um, then we had another one after we got back to California with my Edwards Air Force Base family that through a celebration of life, um, luncheon, party, we were presented with uh, this quilt, uh, quilters made a uh, quilt with Broncos colors, Clippers colors, um, and then an Air Force insignia on the front, so it's two-sided to honor Jesse and honor our family. Can you tell the jury about the impact of Jesse's murder on your husband? Shannon's complete opposite of me. He, I invite everybody in and want to hug the world and Tell them it's okay, and you know what did ask for them stories. Tell me about your relationship with Jesse. How did you know Jesse, and what is your Jesse story? Um, he doesn't want to talk. He doesn't want to talk about it. He doesn't want to. Um, we talk about it personally, but he doesn't want to open that door and be out there. He goes on his dirt bike rides. Um, he wears. Many of Jesse's clothes that came to our house um, from his, uh, we kind of save everything, especially if it's still good. He still had his uh, shirt from uh, that was taken in a senior photo. My husband wears that. Um, he wears the three tenth T-shirts. He wears the Air Force pants, uh, jacket, so that's how he comforts himself and surrounds himself in Jesse. Talk about the impact on your sons, Tyler and Colin. They're both very quiet, but we remember and celebrate Jesse by going to a Kings game, yelling and screaming at the Broncos. That's my thing. Colin's a Steelers fan, so he doesn't do that. 
he yells for the Steelers, but remembers Jesse because Jesse got gave him tickets, his own one of his own season tickets, so that Colin could go to the Steelers Broncos game in uh, 2011. So, and Colin remembers, I believe, by he stayed. Uh, he was actually living with Jesse in the house, but down in Colorado Springs. So he stayed at the house. At I, we call it Jesse's house still. Um, and remembers him with music. Um, How has it impacted your father, John Hunk? We talk about Jesse all the time, especially when UCLA is playing and the Broncos are playing and you know, UCLA football is playing because they used to call, Jesse would call my dad and go over what happened in the game, whether it was a good thing or they crashed and burned and lost the game and what was, you know, the offense, the defense, different plays. Um, he would call from when he was stationed in Germany, he would call my dad, like, did you see the UCLA game? <laughs> and so that's how we remember. What do you miss most about Jesse? Um, just that. Sports, sports were big. Um, we'd be, if the game wasn't on, in uh, Colorado, and it was on in California, I'd be watching the game, and he'd try to get it, of course, on his computer via the internet, whatever, however that works. And so we'd be texting each other or call after a great play, and be like, did you see Demarius catch at the end of the game for the playoff game? Screaming and yelling, and he's in the middle of the stadium, so of course he's screaming loud. and. Um, in our house, swearing was allowed for particular instances. They were adjectives as an expression of emotion. <laughs> Good or bad, you were not allowed to swear at your parents or your teachers or, you know, anybody in that manner. But for particular occasions, it was appropriate. And my husband's a construction worker, so they heard it. And they also heard it on the soccer field. <laughs> so. And does your, is Jesse's grandfather and your son Colin here today with you to support you? Yes. Thank you very much. I have no further questions. Do you have any cross examination? No, sir. All right. Please tell us your full name and spell your first, middle, and last names. Uh, Sierra Camille Cowden, Sierra, C-I-E-R-R-A, Camille, C-A-M-I-L-L-E, Cowden, C-O-W-D-E-N. Ms. Teach McGuire, you may proceed. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Cowden. How old are you, Sierra? I'm 19. Are you in school? Yes. Where do you go to school? CU Boulder. Who is Gordon Cowden to you? My dad. If I could please have a photograph that's been previously introduced, 4716. Could you please tell a jury who that is? That's my dad, Gordon Cowden. Thank you very much. Where was your dad born? Waco, Texas. What are the names of your dad's parents? George Cowden and Molly Cowden, but she used to be Molly Waldrop. And did your dad have any brothers or sisters? Yes, he has three, George Cowden, Graves Cowden, and his sister, Galen Kendall, who used to be Galen Cowden. Where does that part of the family live? Texas. And are your, is your grandfather and your uncle here today? Yeah. Where did your dad end up growing up after he was born? 
Uh, some in Waco, Dallas, Austin, just in Texas. Did your dad go to college? Yes. Do you know what college he went to? Uh, he went to Baylor University for a year, then he went and he graduated from Howard Payne University in 1984. Do you know what he studied? Uh, he got a general business degree with a minor in history. Was your dad kind of a World War II buff growing up? Did he make you and the kids, your brothers and sisters, talk about World War II all the time? Mostly we just listened to him. <laughs> And um, if you could pull the microphone a little bit closer to you, Sierra, sorry, thanks. If you just kind of, it's almost like you have to be touching it. Did your dad play any sports in college? Yeah, he played on a basketball team called the Rejects. <laughs> and he played like some badminton and racquetball. Your dad wasn't the tallest of basketball no, players. No, <laughs> he was pretty little, but he was really good at it for kind of a littler guy. What did your dad do after he graduated from college? Uh, he lived in Austin. He became a real estate appraiser. And did your dad end up getting married? Yes. Who did your dad marry? Uh, at the time, she was Melissa Rouse, but then she became Melissa Cowden. Is that your mom? Mm-hmm. Did your dad have any children? Yes. Obviously, other than you. <laughs> yes, he had. How many other children did he have? Three other kids besides me. My oldest sister, Christian Cowden, who's 24 now. My brother, Weston Cowden, who's 23. Sorry. My sister, Brooke Cowden, is 20. Where do all your siblings live now? Uh, Brooke and I still live in Colorado. Weston lived in Kings Point, New York for a while, but he's back home now and he's going to be going to the Army soon, so he'll have to go to Missouri for training. And my oldest sister, Christian, is in Guatemala serving in the Peace Corps. Are you and your brothers and sisters close? Yes. Where did you and your brothers and sisters grow up? Uh, all of us were born in Texas, and we lived there till I was like four or five. But for me, mostly I grew up in Colorado, in Denver, and Aurora. Did your parents eventually divorce? Yes. How much time did you spend with your mother, and how much time did you spend with your father? Like legally, it was split so that I was with my dad 40% of the time and my mom 60% of the time, but a lot of times it just worked out that it was kind of 50-50 between them. Did you have a family pet when you lived with your dad? Yes. <laughs> we had a yellow lab named Chula. Your Honor, if I may approach the witness with what's been marked as people's exhibits 4715 and 4714. You may. Ms. Cowden, do you recognize the people in those photographs? Yes. Do they fairly and accurately represent your family? Yes. All right, this time I'd move for to admit People's Exhibit 4714 and 4715. Any objection? Nothing further. All right, based on my uh, previous rulings, P-TR-4714 and 4715 uh, are admitted and may be published. Thanks. If I could please have 4715. Could you please tell the jury who everyone in those photographs are? Uh, to the left of my dad is me holding Ditto. And then to the right is my sister Brooke, then Christian, then Weston. Who's next to you? My dad. My dad's in the middle there. And who's Ditto to the family? <laughs> Ditto was the guide dog that me and Brooke raised, trained. And if I could please have 4714. All right, and who's in this photograph with your dad? That's my dad with Chula, our dog. Do you uh, and your family have a special game that you guys played with your dad and Chula? Yeah, we would <laughs> play hide and seek, and like Chula was always just like enamored by our dad. Like, she just loved him so much when we played hide and seek. We just let her run off and find him. She would just get to him right away, give him away. Is Shula still with the family? No, she died years ago. Is that the only time you ever saw your father cry? Yeah. Thank you very much. Did you have uh, special road trips that you took with your dad? Yeah, we went on a lot of... Sorry.
We drove down to Austin a lot. And who were you going to visit when you drove down to Austin? Like our grandparents and the rest for external family. And did you take any trips any other places in the country? Sorry. Oh, take a moment. There's some water up there if you need it. Yeah, like, we drove up to New York, um, and, like, the trips to Texas, we would go a lot, like, in the summer and around Christmas. Can you tell the jury a little bit about your dad's personality and character? Uh, very, like, funny. Charming, patient, kind, honest. Was there... Was there a time that you played a family game called Drowning that kind of demonstrates a little bit about your dad's <laughs> yeah. caringness? Uh, we lived at the Breakery Apartments in Denver. There was like this little community pool, and my siblings and I would play this stupid game where one of us would pretend to drown and someone had to be the lifeguard and had to like jump in and save them. And like my sister Christian and I were playing and the way Brooke recalls it is that we, like, weren't really including her in the game, so she just went ahead and, like, floated in the water and pretended that she had drowned, and my dad was barbecuing her dinner for us, and he looked up and thought that she had, like, actually drowned, so, like, he screamed her name and jumped the entire length of the pool, and without, like, taking off his, like, nice leather shoes and jeans, he just, like, jumped in to save her. And, like, she just looked up and was like, Dad? Like, cause she was just playing. And then, like, after that, Brooke was, like, very, like, embarrassed and upset with herself. And my dad, like, got out and jumped back in again to make her feel better and just swam around with us in his clothes. So we spent the rest of the evening with yeah. you swimming in his clothes. <laughs> yeah. Was there a time that you guys were driving and you came across some prairie dogs? Yeah. <laughs> I think... Your Honor. Ms. Tish McGuire, you may proceed. Thank you. Was there a time that you guys were driving with your dad in a car and you came across a prairie dog that helps demonstrate to the jury the caring nature of your father towards you and your sisters? Yes, my sister and I, my sister Brooke and I were in the car with our dad. I think we were driving like either to the park or to dinner and we pulled up at a red light. There were like one or two cars in front of us and our dad noticed like a little prairie dog on the sidewalk and he was kind of going into the street. My dad was like, oh my gosh, a prairie dog's gonna get hit by a car. And so he like put the car in park and jumped out and ran around and like herded it back towards, away from the cars, I mean. And like, I think he didn't want it to get hit by the car, but he also didn't want us to like get upset about seeing a prairie dog hit by a car. What kind of father was your dad to you and the kids? Like, loving, dedicated, patient. How did your dad wake you up every morning? <laughs> he'd go, di -di 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 and he'd like come in making that sound. And, like, I know I like used to kind of dread that sound, but I'd like to hear it now. Did you have dinner together every night as a family? Yeah. What was your dad's favorite thing to cook for you guys? <laughs> he always liked to make us omelets, and, like, after, we would just talk. So you guys spent a lot of time at the dinner table as a family talking together. Did you guys go to church together? Yeah. Most Sundays, like, we would go out to breakfast first, like, at Lamar's Donuts or Panera Bread, and then he would take us to church. Did he love taking you to In-N-Out Burger? <laughs> Yeah, when we went to California and got to go to Disneyland, my we were all very excited about going to In-N-Out Burger, and it was like 
a big deal. I think my sister, Brooke, and my dad, they both bought In-N-Out Burger shirts, and they came up with this little song about how we're like the In-N-Out Burger family. Did your dad um, have a way of trying to make you guys help around the house? <laughs> yeah, he had a happy helper song. He'd say, we call them happy helpers because they love to help, and we'd all like groan, but like now it makes me laugh. <laughs> Was your dad the kind of dad that sat on the sidelines when the kids were playing, or was he playing with you all the time? Well, he played with us all the time, like, and he took us to the park a lot, like, he took us outside a lot, and we would play, like, the lava game, and jackpot 500, and tag, and all sorts of games, and, like, my dad would play with us, and all these other kids at the park who we didn't even know would want to play, too. Was your dad supportive of your activities in school? Yeah. Like, my brother did swim all throughout high school, and my dad was, like, always there. When was the only time your dad ever, you ever saw your dad get frustrated? Um, like, if there was traffic and he was trying to get, like, to Weston swim meets or to, like, pick me up from school or to, like, be there for one of us, he would get upset, but, I mean, he wouldn't get upset at us. He'd just get upset at the traffic because he wanted to be there. Did you enjoy walks with your father? Yeah. Sometimes, like, I always really like going for walks, and sometimes he would let me go, and then, like, I th would think I was walking alone, and I'd look back, and he'd... Sorry. <laughs> like, he'd be following me. He's just checking up on you to make sure you were okay. Yeah. But he'd like catch up to me and walk with me then but did your dad always want to make sure that all of you were included in the same activities together I mean yeah he wanted like he wanted all of us to be like involved and stuff and but we were allowed to do the things that we were interested in we didn't all have to just have the same passions was there a time where you were going to get left out at Elitch's and your dad made sure that you were included <laughs> you want to approach please Ms. Teach McGuire, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. What did your dad like to do in his spare time? Uh, he liked to travel. He liked to like barbecue or grill food. He liked to read and hike and go for walks. Was he a fan of any Texas sports teams that we probably shouldn't talk about? Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> Your Honor, if I may approach the witness with what's been marked as People's Exhibit 1098. Yes. Ms. Cowden, do you recognize that disc? Yes. Do you see your name and initials on it? Yes. What is that? What does that disc contain? Uh, it's photos of my dad with family, like with his siblings, some with us, with his parents. And does it fairly and accurately represent some moments of your dad's life? Yes. You're right. This time I would move for the admittance of 1098. No further objection. All right. Based on my previous ruling, P-TR-1098 is admitted, and I'm specifically referring to Order C-204, and uh, the exhibit may be published. Thank you. If I could please have 1098.
Thank you. Ms. Cowden, I now want to talk to you about July 19th and 20th of 2012. How old were you on July 19th of 2012? 16. How old was your sister, Brooke? 17. Tell me about what you remember about the day of July 19th. I remember that Brooke and Dad, they went to the park, and when they came back, like, we had talked about going to see a movie that night, and my dad joked that he had gotten us tickets to Brave. It was this Disney movie that was out. Did you want to see the Disney movie? No, at the time. What movie did you want to see? The Batman movie. Did you go to the Batman movie that night with your dad? Yes. What is the last memory you have of your father in that theater? I mean, besides waking him up, like, trying to wake him up, like, before that, when the shooting started, like, he started to get up, he, he started to move forward, but then he hesitated and turned to make sure that we were coming to. And like, before that, during the commercials, I remember that he like insisted on me taking the extra armrest that was in between us, because he was to the left of me and like he had his arm up and without thinking about it, I kind of put my arm up and bumped him and I was like, oh, but then he like put my elbow up because he wanted me to have the armrest. And like also during the commercials, there was one, there was one Superman commercial. Sorry. There was a Superman commercial and it was like a theater of superhero fans, so... Everyone started cheering and we like looked at each other in the dark and kind of just laughed just at how like excited everyone was. Where did you go after you left the theater that night? Uh... They took us to Gateway High School. They, like, brought around some RTDs, and they took us to Gateway. Did you know for certain when you were at Gateway High School what had happened to your father? We weren't certain, but, like, in the theater, when I touched him, like, I thought immediately that he was dead. Sorry. <laughs> Did you leave Gateway High School and then go to your dad's house? Yeah, we, like, I just remember we kept using people's phones to try to call our dad, and we just kept going to voicemail, and we tried to call our mom, even though it was, like, our dad's night to take us, and we couldn't get in touch with her, and so a policeman drove us to our dad's house and they like our dad had the keys so the policeman like had to do the lock on the door and had to get us in. And I remember it like my Aunt Caitlin. Sorry. She had heard about what had happened on the news. Like, she didn't know the details. She just heard that there had been, like, a shooting in Aurora close to where we lived. And she called to ask if it was true and, like, to check that everyone was okay. And I don't think, like, Brooke was someone talking to her on the phone, but, like, I don't think she was scared when she called because she was just, like, wanting to check up. I think she thought it was all okay and, and my sister had to tell her that her dad didn't walk out with, didn't run out with us, and 
Like, I could just hear it start to cry on the phone. <laughs> and then when our mom got there, it was like, she was just, like, crying so hard. Like, it was like she couldn't breathe. It was just like, she was hysterical almost. And she was just, like, calling all these hospitals. <laughs> Were you eventually officially notified that your father was murdered? Yeah, I think gateway, like, I guess it was like all the 12, like, the families and groups of friends were in this big room, and my mom's at the time boyfriend, who's now husband, he asked, like, if our missing people, if they're not on the list of injured people, does it mean that they're gone, and... And chief of police said, like, yes. And I just remember, like, there was just this complete uproar of people crying. And, like, I think I remember someone even screaming. Did you have two separate funerals for your dad? Yeah, we had a memorial service in Colorado. And then we had a funeral in Austin, Texas. What was the toughest thing about the funeral in Austin for you? It's for me, the hardest thing was just like putting my hand on his coffin. Hannah, can we approach, please? Yes. All right, Ms. Teach McGuire, you may proceed. Thank you very much, Her. Ms. Cowden, can you please tell the jury about the impact of your dad's murder on your brothers and sisters? Like, I don't really know even where to begin. It's like, I feel like in a way it's like we're closer now, but it's like we're also farther away from each other now. And like, I just feel like my family's broken. Can you tell the jury about the impact of your dad's murder on you? I mean, I'm a, like I'm a mess up here. What do you miss most about your dad? I'm just everything. I miss like him telling stories and like making everyone laugh and like his patience. Like he was always patient with us even when we weren't patient with each other and like it's selfish to say but like I just miss him being my dad. <laughs> and it was like he was like he was just so present in our lives that like growing up the idea of one of my parents dying, it just it wasn't ever something that I ever even considered because they were so present. Like, I just miss him being there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Cowden. I have no further questions. Ms. Brady, do you have any questions? I don't. Thank you. And the jury does not appear to have any questions. Ms. Cowden, thank you. May she be released from her subpoena? Please, thank you, Your Honor. Any objection? No, sir. All right. Thank you. Could you please tell us your full name and spell your first, middle, and last names? Jerry, ja Jerry Susan Jackson, J-E-R-R-I-S-U-S-A-N-J-A-C-K-S-O-N. Mr. Orman, you may proceed. Thank you. If we could please have Exhibit 4704 up on the viewer. This has been previously admitted. Who is that? That is my son, Matthew. What's his last name? McQuinn. Thank you. We can take that down, ma'am. In that photograph, um, there's some sunglasses on his head. Uh, is there a, a story associated with the sunglasses on the head that shows us something about your son's personality? 
he would always wear his sunglasses on, his, on the top of his head and call it his man tiara. Is that some about his sense of humor? Yes. Tell me about, about your son. Tell me about who he was as a man. He was a very caring person. He loved life and he loved it to the fullest. Um, he liked to, um, if he saw somebody having a bad day, he would joke around with them in order to lift their spirit. So he was really an encourager. How old was your son when he was killed? He was 27 years old. Now, was he from Aurora, from Colorado, or did he move here? No, he was born and raised in Springfield, Ohio. Just so the jury can know where that is, where, where is Springfield, Ohio? It's halfway between um, Columbus and Dayton. When did your son move out here to Colorado? It was in November of 2011. So how old would he have been then? 26. Was he involved in a, a long-term relationship with someone? Yes, he had dated Samantha Yowler for three and a half years. And did the jury already hear from her in this trial? Yes, she was uh, one of the injured. Were, were they living together? Yes, they were. And was she from Colorado or was she also from Ohio? She was also from Ohio. Um, she was from St. Paris, which is just a little bit north of Springfield. Do you know why they chose to move out here from Ohio? Because Samantha's brother Nick was living out here and they decided that they wanted to change the scenery, wanted to see if they would like it out here uh, before they had any real responsibilities in Ohio. Your Honor, may I approach the witness with some photographs? You may. Ma'am, I'm going to hand you what I've marked for identification as People's Exhibits 4705, 4706, and 4707. Can you take a look at those? Yes. Do they, who do they, what do they, what do they show? Those are pictures of Math, Math, Matt and Samantha. Do they show what they look like together and, and sort of how they related to each other? Yes. Your Honor, move to admit 4705, 4706, and 4707. Any objection? Nothing further. Based on my previous rulings, including Order C-204, P-DR-4705 through 4707 inclusive, are admitted and may be published. If we could please have up 4705. Do you know what this is? That is a picture of Matt and Samantha in June of 2012. They had uh, come home to Ohio and they went to Kings Island and that was taken there. Now, what, what's Kings Island? Kings Island is a, an amusement park in Cincinnati, Ohio. 4706, please. What are we looking at here? That's Matt and Samantha, probably about 2010. And that's just a classic Samantha and Matt picture. And 4707? And how about that? That was taken in June of 2011, um, the week that they were home for a, uh, a wedding. And um, that was taken at that time. Thank you. We can have that down now. Thank you, ma'am. Do you know whether or not your son and Miss Yowler planned on remaining in Colorado? No, Matt was unable to find a full-time full job here, and so he was um, going to be moving home by the end of July 2012. And, and Samantha Yowler? Samantha was uh, going to stay in Colorado and come home in September. 
how long had they been involved with each other? Two and a half years. And were you able to observe their interactions with each other during that time? Yes, I was. They spent a lot of time at our house and a lot of time at her parents' houses. Um, they loved each other dearly. They would um, uh, joke around with each other and um, if people didn't know better, they'd think that they didn't like each other because they just teased around with each other. And um, But they had a very loving re relationship. Were you able to see anything about the way that your son treated Miss Yowler that reflected on his character? Yes, one of the things that he would do when they were still in Springfield, when she would have a, a dinner break, he would take her dinner and he would just um, do anything for her. Have you been able to see and observe what type of impact the crime has had on Samantha Yowler? Yes. Um, she has lost her future because they were planning on getting married and having babies. And she is just, she took a couple of probably three months before she could go out in public. You mentioned work, and you mentioned that your son was unable to find full-time employment out here in Colorado. W was he working at all? Yes, he was working part-time at uh, Target. Which one? I believe it was Alameda. The one uh, like north of the, the town center of Aurora? Um, I just know that it was real close to the mall. What was he doing at Target, do you know? He was unloading trucks from 4 to 8 in the morning, and then he would pick up extra hours by stocking sh some shelves. I would like to ask you now about family relationships, um, relationships that your son had with, with family members. And I want to start with his grandparents. Did he grow up with grandparents? Yes, he had, my parents were still alive, and then his dad's mother. Who was the most important grandparent in your son's life? My father. What was your father's name? Uh, Robert Schaefer. Can you tell us a little bit about the relationship that your son had with Robert Schaefer? They, from the time he was young, they liked to spend time out in um, the, out just outside. They would go to the uh, nearby reservoir and just watch for birds and walk on his property and look at bugs and all that kind of stuff. I want to ask you about a nickname that your father had for himself and ask you whether or not that shows us anything about the particular impact that this crime had on your father. My dad proclaimed himself as Mr. Wonderful. Now, was that meant as a joke? Yes, okay. it was a con um, conversation starter. Just explain and, how that worked as a conversation starter. Um, just kind of get people talking and um, joking around. And did he use this in a particular context? Um, he said that he was Mr. Wonderful, and then Matt picked up that he was Mr. Wonderful Jr. Did your, your dad and your son uh, use that, that term, Mr. Wonderful, in any particular venue or forum? Um, mostly when they were working together at a camp. And did your, did your dad have a name tag or anything? Yes, he had... Um, the secretary at church make up a name tag, and um, he said that since it was on church stationery, it was official. Where would he wear that name tag, and what did it say? It just said, Mr. Wonderful, um, and he would wear that as he greeted the doors at um, church. Did your dad 
change what he did about calling himself Mr. Wonderful and wearing that name tag at church uh, after your son was killed? After Matt was killed, my dad never wore that name tag again. And when someone would come up and ask, say something about Mr. Wonderful, he'd say, no, we buried Mr. Wonderful in July. How about brothers and sisters? Did your, did your son have any brothers and sisters? He had one biological brother and then four stepbrothers. And the biological brother, what was his name? Or his, name his name was Eric McQuinn. Can you tell me a little bit about the relationship between your son, Matt, and your son, Eric? They had a close relationship. They were two and a half years apart, um, but just one year in school. And um, they were close, had the same friends, um, did the same activities. Um, and then once they grew up, my um, Eric went to Cincinnati for school, so they didn't see as much um, after Eric moved out. How f Just so the jury can understand this, how far away is Springfield from Cincinnati, Ohio? It's about an hour and a half. Drive? Drive time. Mm -hmm. Has this crime had an impact on your son Eric McQuinn. Yes, he went through a time that he drank more than he should have. Um, but then once a certain amount of time went by, I'd say probably a year or so, he had a whole new look out, outlook and um, is now focused on um, keeping his brother's memory alive. Your Honor, may I approach the witness with what I've marked for identification as People's Exhibit 4701? Yes. Thank you. Ma'am, I'm going to ask you to please take a look at 4701 and tell me what that is. That's a picture of Matt and Eric and then his stepbrother, Chris J Jackson. And was that taken uh, within a year or so of, of the crime here? That was taken on Thanksgiving of 2011, and it's the last picture we have of all three of them together. Move to admit 4701, Your Honor. Any objection? Nothing further, Your Honor. Pursuant to my previous rulings, including Order C-204, P-DR-4701 is admitted and may be published. Can you please put it up, ma'am? It's 4701. Thank you. Tell us what we're looking at here and who these people are. On my left is uh, my son, Eric. Matt is in the middle, and Chris is on the right. So uh, one on the right is a stepbrother, and the one on the left is his brother. Correct. Thank you, ma'am. You can take that down now. We just saw a picture of a stepbrother. How many stepbrothers? I think you said four. Who were they four. all? Um, Stephen Jackson, Pat Jackson, Chris Jackson, and David Jackson. Now, we, we're talking about stepbrothers. So... Um, how long, uh, when did you get married to their father to, to create that relationship? 2008. Now, even though they were, you didn't grow up together, they weren't little kids together, was there a close relationship between your son and any of his stepbrothers? Um, he was close to um, the oldest, David, but especially close to Chris. I want to ask you about the two of them then. Can you describe the relationship between your son and his stepbrother, Chris, and, and tell us anything about that that demonstrates your son's character? Even though they weren't brought up together, Chris and, and Matt were just two peas in a pod, and they just loved to laugh, to um, cut up together. They'd go out and... One time they had a bonfire in February and had to scoop the snow away. 
and just um, they were just there for each other. When Chris's uh, daughter had to have surgery, Matt came over at midnight for that, and um, they just were they were just very close. Did they consider themselves anything other than brothers, not no. even stepbrothers? No. Has this crime had an impact on Chris? Yes, for the first probably year, year and a half, he didn't want to talk about it at all. Um, he ended up moving to Texas afterwards with his job. And then, about, well, actually, he didn't talk about it much until the trial started. And then he was finally able to open up and feel like he had to make sure that Matt uh, was remembered. You mentioned a stepbrother named David. Uh, yes. Tell me about the relationship between your son and his stepbrother, David. They had a, a good relationship. Um, they would as well do things. A lot of times, the three of them, uh, Chris, David, and, and Matt, would get together and, you know, go to a movie or, you know, just hang out. Has this crime had an impact on Matt's stepbrother, David? Yes. Tell me about that. He, um, he just has, um, he's moved away too. He's now in New Jersey. But he just, um, he misses him every day. And um, whenever we're together, you know, he talks about Matt and um, how he, he misses him and wishes he was here. And your husband, what's his name? David. I, I'm sorry, we, he goes by Dave. Okay. Is it a, is a well, junior thing? Is David Dave Jr.? Or? No. No, different middle names. Okay. Well, tell me about the relationship between your son and his stepfather. To them, it was not a step. It was, um, it was, you know, even though he still has his father, Dave was more of the father that was there for him um, and would do anything for him. They worked on cars together. They, um, if anything was going on um, that Matt needed help, um, besides my dad, and Dave would also be there. One night, Matt uh, hit a deer at 12.30, and I was getting up to go to him, and um, Dave said, well, I'm not letting you go alone because I'm going to be there for him too. Has this crime had an impact on your husband? Yes. Tell me about that. I think sometimes he gets more angry than he used to, and I believe that part of that is because he doesn't have Matt. Um, they were, even though he was a stepfather, they were close. I've got two more photographs to show you, ma'am. 4709 and 4700. What does 4,700 show? That's Matt McQuinn. That and it's a classic picture after he, um, after he was an adult. And 4,709? That is a classic Matt look. He was, a, I'm sorry, you're, please continue. Um, he was probably around 24, 25 when that was taken, but it was a classic Matt Move to admit 4700 and 4709. Nothing further. All right, based on my previous rulings, including in order C 204, P DR 4709 and 4700 are admitted and may be published. If we could have 4700, man, please. Tell us what we're looking at here. That is Matt. Um, like that's probably about 24, 25 years old. You said that was a classic look. What did you mean by that? No, the other one is. Oh, the other one is. Yeah. Okay, let's take a look at the other one, 4709. And what are we looking at here, and why is that a classic 
because he was always smiling and um, his eyes just had mischief in him. Thank you, ma'am. You can take that down. I want to now talk about you and your relationship with your son. What kind of relationship did you have with Matt McQuinn? We had a very close relationship. Um, there was nothing that he wouldn't share with me. Um, and he cared very deeply. Um, one time when he was out in Colorado, I had to have surgery and he called me about three or four times the day before just to make sure I was okay. And we just, um, we just had a, a very, very close relationship. Were, were you looking forward to him moving back to Ohio? Yes. I want to ask you now about your last memory of your son when he was alive. Can you tell us about that? On July 19th, probably about, well, Colorado time, it was probably about 8.30. In the evening? In the evening. And I called him um, to let him know that when he moved back to Ohio, he was more than welcome to come live with us. And he said no, he was going to live with um Sam's parents because they were closer to where he was going to be working and he told me that they were getting ready to go to the Batman movie that night and it started at midnight and um, he had to work at four but it's a three hour movie so I'll just get an energy drink I don't want to go to sleep so that you know I risk sleeping through work so he was real excited about it and he said, um, Mom, I hear Nick coming home, so we're going to go get dinner before the movie, um, so I'm going to let you go. And I said, well, okay. I said, um, I said, be careful. He said, oh, Mom, nothing's going to happen. And he said, I love you, Mom. And that was all. Well, that would have been around 10 in the evening, Ohio time? Yes. I want to go now to the time when you first heard about the shooting at the theater. When was that? That was 4 o'clock. We were woken up about 4.20 in the morning by our uh, son, Stephen. Now, that would be 4.20 uh, Eastern time, is that right? Correct. So that's about 2.20 2 20 here. Okay. And he said, there's a sheriff at the door. Now, I want to ask you about this. Your son, Stephen, was he living with you? Oh, yes. And uh, so w this wasn't a phone call? No. What happened then? Did you get up and talk to the sheriff? Yes. Um, my husband and I got up and answered the door. And he said, do you know... Um, Matt McQuinn and I said yes and he said there's been an incident with the kids you need to call Samantha's mom and so we did and she said Jerry she said the kids went to a movie and somebody came in and started firing shots and um, Samantha is at the hospital she was shot in the knee She's waiting for surgery, but we don't know where Matt is. They said that they couldn't tell her, tell Samantha anything about Matt because of the HIPAA laws. Did, did you or your family at that point make any efforts to get additional information? Yes. Um, the sheriff stayed with us for about 45 minutes. And he was trying to call um, any law enforcement, his dispatch and uh, Springfield police. And we were trying to call Samantha, and we just couldn't get any kind of news. When is the first time you got more news? 
it was probably um, about, we got out to Denver, probably about 1.30 Denver time. So you just hopped on a plane? Yes. Um, myself and Sam's mom, dad, and stepmom all ended up on the same plane. And we got, you know, two of the rental car, and we were on our way. Um, I told them, let's go so you can be with Samantha. And they said, no, we're going to find Matt first. And my brother called while we were on the highway, um, and he said, Jerry, this doesn't look good. He said, I want a friend of mine to come be with you. And that was the first that I knew that there were 10 bodies still in the theater. And did, did your, your brother have a friend in Denver that helped you? Yes, she met me at Gateway. When did you get official confirmation then? It was about 8.30 Colorado time, which would have been 10.30 Ohio time. And um, so then they, they wanted, um, Sam's family wanted us to um, contact them by text or phone when we found anything out. And I told them, no, we were going to go to the hospital and, and let them know in person. Did you do that? Yes, we did. I think we had some testimony from a, a witness during the first part of this trial about not having any fingerprints for your, your son because Ohio doesn't take a thumbprint when you get a driver's license there. Were you asked to actually go and identify your son at the coroner's office? Yes. We had to, um, we got a call that said that we needed to come down and identify him. Did you do that? I did. Tell us about that. Your Honor, I'd object 401, 403 due process. Overruled. I went in. The um, gentleman told me that Matt would be behind a glass window and that we would be in a little room. And so we went in, and um, my brother's friend and Samantha's stepmom went with me. And I went in, and he was there, and it was my son. And um, I had asked if he suffered, and they said that he was shot in the neck. And it was probably within seconds. Did you say anything to him? Your Honor, 401, 403, due process. Overruled. I told him that I loved him, that I was proud of him because he saved Samantha's life, and that we would take care of Samantha. I only have a few more questions for you, ma'am. Okay. And I want to ask you about the service for your son. Where did that happen? That happened at Main Lane Church of God in Springfield, where he had grown up. Did anybody show up from your son's past that he had touched that you were surprised to see? He had high school teachers that came. He had been in a class of just about eight kids, and every one of them came. Um childhood friends, friends from church, um, just all walks of life, all, you know, every, um, like everybody that he had been in contact with, um, former co-workers, um, I think every aspect was, somebody was there. What has been the impact of this crime on you? I've been diagnosed with PTSD, with anxiety and depression. I went back to work for two weeks and could not handle it. And so I've been on... But let me ask you that. What were you doing for a living back then? 
I had been a claims analyst for 11 years for a trucking company. And um, it's a stressful job, and I just couldn't handle it. So I've been on um, Social Security Disability, which has cut my income in half. Um, I've been in counseling for almost three years now. And um, I'm on four medications to help me sleep from the nightmares. I just have one more question for you. Okay. What is the most vivid memory that you have of your son? The most thing that I think about... There's a lot of them, but probably the one that would describe him the best is he always wanted to be the center of attention. He wanted to be the one that was proposed to. He wanted to be the one that had the big old diamond ring. And um, he told his grandma that he was going to dance down the aisle. At, at a wedding? At his wedding. And that was, I believe, the reason why he had his man tiara. And did he ever get a chance to do any of that? No, he did not. Thank you, ma'am. I don't have anything further, Your Honor. Swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Please be seated. Could you please tell us your full name and spell your first, middle, and last names? Karen Ann Teves, C-A-R-E-N-A-N-N-T-E-V-E-S. Mr. Brockler, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. With the court's permission, I'd like to publish previously admitted 2653. You may do so. Ma'am, who is this? That is my son, Alex Teves. Thank you. I want to have a conversation with you about who your boy was and then the impact of his murder on you and your family, okay? Yes. But to begin, I want to start with really the beginning, and that is um, your family. Um, tell us your son's full name. Alexander Charles Teves. What's the significance of his middle name? His middle name, Charles, is, he's named after his <coughs> paternal grandfather. Um, my husband, Tom, is, was the last Teves. Um, so then when Alex came along, um, we decided to name him after his grandfather because um, just to carry on the name because he was the, the last Teves. Ma'am, you mentioned Tom, your husband. How long have you been married? We've been married 30, 30 years this past March. When was your son, Alex, born? He was born in 1988, June 1st of 1988. Was he your first? He was our first, first born. Do you have any after him? Two more boys. Um, six years later, uh, we had Alex's brother, Tommy. Thomas, um, Alex could not wait for a sibling. Um, he was beyond overjoyed. And then after Tommy, um, Nicholas, and he was 15 months after Tommy. Do you need a drink, ma'am? Yes, I take, please. Take a moment. In part to better understand who your son was and the impact of his murder, I want to ask you about his relationship with his brothers, okay? Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Um, our middle guy, Tommy, um, simply adored Alex. Um, Alex was six years older. Um, it was almost like a second dad just because of his... Um, he was just such a role model for Tommy. Um, he looked up to him... Um, he was such a great mentor for Tommy. They were so close. Um, for being six years apart, they were just inseparable. 
Was there a, an incident, a, a moment, Halloween, for instance, that sort of marks how he would view his bigger brother throughout his life? Yeah, most kids, you know, at two years old, what do you want to be for Halloween? They'll pick um, their cartoon character, their favorite superhero. Um, Tommy looked at me and he says, oh, this year I want to be Alex. How about your youngest son? How, how, tell me about him. Um, Nick was born um, with special needs. Um, we... We had him diagnosed at one and a half with, with some special needs. And um, Alex was there with us, um, just helping the whole way along. Treated him just like he did, Tommy, and um, actually helped, helped him get to where he is today. That relationship that Alex had with his, his youngest brother, the one you've just described, did that help shape him into the man he became? Oh, absolutely. Um, Alex loved working with children. He um, he wanted to be a counselor, and, and in fact, he, he obtained that goal. Um, he, he graduated with his master's in psychology and counseling, um, and as an intern, he worked in a school with um, kids that had a lot of special needs um, in a, um, a school where <coughs> these kids couldn't fit into a typical setting, school setting. And um, he would bring them into the weight room and teach them, you know, you are a, a whole person. This isn't just about your mind. It's your mind and body, and they, they work um, together. And he taught them to respect themselves. Um, they Later on, I had the chance to speak to some of his, his former students that he counseled, and they told me that they pretty much saved their lives. They, he got them off of alcohol and drug addictions and made them appreciate their families. You've talked about his two brothers from your family. Was he also a big brother to someone else? Uh, in undergrad at the University of Arizona, he was a big brother to um, a young kid that um, had some family problems and some, some things he was struggling with. To, to understand who Alex was uh, as a man, as he's coming into his own, tell us about that relationship. Well, he was in undergrad, and I know a lot of kids are out partying and doing this and that, and um, he loved his Arizona Wildcats. Um, Is that where he went to college? college? Yeah, he went to the University of Arizona in Tucson, and he just adored them. He was so passionate. Um, he tried to go to every game, and he, he would not miss. But the one time he would miss, and this was multiple times, was to, because uh, most of the games were on Saturday nights, and that's when he had the opportunity to have his, his little brother that he mentored. Um, he would take him and give up going to his beloved games to take this, his young, his um, little brother out to bowling or fiddlesticks or to the arcade or things like that to spend time with him. Now, far from uh, a one-off or an anomaly, was this just who your boy was? That's who he always was from when he was, from when he could walk. You talked a bit about his uh, early commitment and then wanting to grow into a counselor that dealt with both mind and body. Was he someone that was into physical fitness? Very much so. Um, he loved working out. He loved um, doing things like the Tough Mudder, which is a um, very intense optical course uh, where you have to jump into vats of ice water and climb mountains and run 10 miles. And it, it pushed you physically. And um, there's a sense of accomplishment at the end. And he loved to push himself. Did he excel at athletics? He, he did. He he was a um, state champion wrestler in high school. In Arizona? In Arizona. He would, and Alex was just very, very laid back, but he had so much passion. Um, he would, we would sit there for hours during these wrestling tournaments, just hours and hours. And he would sit there and play on his little Game Boy. I mean, you know, just play. And all the other kids are jumping around and doing push-ups and grunting, you know, and 
getting ready to go into these matches. And Alex would just sit there, look around, play his little Game Boy, and then, okay, um, it's your turn, Alex. The other guy would get out, you know, and Alex would just walk out, and they'd say, okay, go. And he would just take the, his opponent and just, like, pin him in the matter of seconds. And that's, that's what he did every time. I mean, he just was so laid back, but he was fierce. There's another incident uh, from this time at Arizona, uh, University of Arizona, that helps to mark your son's character, and I want to ask you about that too. Was there a car accident? There was. Um, in his sophomore year, him and five other friends were driving back from California. They went to Disneyland or something like that on, on their break, and the driver uh, there were six six of them in a pickup truck, and the um, driver overcorrected and veered off the road into the desert. And this is a very isolated area, and um, they were fortunate enough to have it, someone behind them. Um, and he saw the whole incident, and the truck rolled seven times, but luckily landed on its tires straight up. Um, uh, tragically, one of the kids in the front seat was ejected uh, from the vehicle and was laying in the desert. Um, everyone else in the vehicle was trapped, um, and the only one that could get out was Alex. And um, Alex is fiercely loyal to family and friends, and he just crawled through the broken glass out that back window to get help. Um, he passed out in the back of the truck, but he, he tried really hard. Um, the injuries were so bad that they had to bring in a, um, a chopper. And um, they took the boy that was ejected first, and Alex's injuries dictated that he was next. And he said, no, don't take me, take her. And they, they said, OK, we'll take her. And they took her out. The chopper came back, and he said, they said, Alex, you have to go now. And he said, no, take her. And they took yet another one ahead of Alex, Alex, whose injuries were not as crucial, and finally said, dude, you've got to go now. And they took Alex then, and, and Alex spent two days in ICU. Um, and as he's in ICU, um, he spoke to my husband, and he said, Dad, the boy who was ejected, his parents aren't here yet. They live in Georgia. Please go sit with him. He needs, he needs you more than I do right now because his dad and his mom aren't here yet. And so Tom, Tom did that, and he sat with that boy while his parents were on their way. Now, there's a part of this story you didn't come to know until after your son's death. We had to have three three um, services for Alex. And we'll get to those, but, but tell us about that meeting at one of them that helps fill in what happened at that hospital. Um, at, at the memorial service in Phoenix, um, a gentleman came up to us and he introduced himself as the dad of that boy that was ejected from the vehicle and we were like, you didn't have to come, you, had, you were here all the way from Georgia. And he says, you probably don't know this, but while my son was in the hospital, and this was probably two months, he said, your son sat with him every single day. And we had no idea that Alex did that. Um, we would say, where are you going today? He'd say, oh, I'm just going out. And he sat with this boy every day. And the dad told us everyone else had just moved on and gotten on with their life and lives. And Alex was here every day to sit with him and talk to him and read to him and help him in his recovery. That's just how Alex was. Never told you? No, we didn't know. Um, how, did, how did Alex get out here? How did he get out to Colorado? Um... He went to the um, De University of Denver. Why? Um, for his um, graduate studies for psychology and counseling. And, and he graduated in May of 2012 with his master's degree.
approach the witness, Your Honor. You may. Ma'am, I'm handing you what's been marked as People's Exhibits 2654 and 2656. Can you take a look at those? Yes. Those are pictures of your son, yes? Yes. Uh, do those fairly and accurately capture how he looked at about the time of his murder? Yes, he always had this brilliant smile on his face. He had, he just emanated joy, and this this reflects that. I'm gonna move for the admission. Six five four and uh, two Any six five six. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, Your Honor. Into yeah. evidence. Any objection to P dr dash twenty six fifty four and twenty six fifty six? Nothing further. All right. Based on my previous rulings, uh, P dr dash twenty six fifty four and twenty six fifty six are admitted and may be published. Ma'am, could you put up twenty six fifty four, please? Tell us what we're looking at here, ma'am. Um, part of his his schooling, he had to give. Um, certain presentations, and this was one of them. Is this sort of how he looked all the time? <laughs> um, the smile on his face, yes. The suit, jacket, and the white shirt, definitely not, no. <laughs> and thank you for that. Before we get to the next one, I want to ask you about that. Did your son have a certain issue with clothes? <laughs> um, he did. He um, pretty much loved and embraced everything in life except shirts and shoes he the moment he could release himself from a shirt and shoes he would um it reminds me of a trip that we took to hawaii um we're all in our minivan and we're running late we've got three kids and a dog in the car and we're trying to get to the airport and we look back and alex has no shoes on and we said we well, you pack shoes right and he says no we're we're going to Hawaii. I, I don't need shoes. And I'm like, well, we have to go in an airport first to get to Hawaii. And he just felt that he didn't need shoes and decided to leave him home. Had you seen your son in May of 2012 uh, before his graduation? I did. Where? Um, he came home to visit his mom. He, um, Tom was going on a business trip and... He says, why don't you come visit your mom this month? And um, he said, I'd love to. And he came home, and we got to spend some time together. I see 2656, ma'am. Tell us what this is. That's Alex graduating with his master's degree from the university, from Denver University. Do you remember in what he got his master's? psychology and counseling. Were you able to be here for this? Um, he asked us not to. Um, we happened to be um, in Hawaii and he says, you know what, Mom, this is just a stepping stone for me. I want to go on to, to be a physical therapist so I can help people in mind and body and um, I want you to come out for that. That's where I want you to be. So we said, um, okay, and um, I have no regrets. Um, I just wish I hadn't listened to him with this one. But um, when I say I have no regrets, I, um, I have no regrets with our relationship. Um, we spoke or text every single day. Um, that included I love yous. And I appreciate you, and um, thank God we had that relationship because I can look back and have no regrets about that. Ma'am, we, we saw the picture of him graduating with his master's, and you had indicated that he mentioned to you that this was a stepping stone. Had he already applied for or begun the process of getting his Ph.D.? Um, he did. Tell uh, us about that. Um, the summer um, in 2012, he was just starting. There was a couple makeup courses that he had to get under his belt before he started the program in the fall, um, and he was in the process of, of doing that in July of 2012.
Governor, may I approach the witness? Yes. Ma'am, I'm handing you what's been marked as People's Exhibits 2657, 4679, 4680, and 4681. Do you recognize what are in those photographs, ma'am? Of course. I know. I it's my beautiful boy. Always with a smile on his face. And there are a couple of those pictures he is with another woman. Is that fair? Yes. Who is that? That is Amanda Lindgren, um, a love of his life. He um, always dreamed of one day having a family, and um, he wanted it to last, and he wanted it to be right, and he wanted to make the right choice. So he, he didn't date a lot um, in his dating years. Um, he was really waiting to find the person. Um, and in fact, he went to his high school senior prom with his best friend, Nick, <laughs> um, which we always get a kick out of. Um, but he, he met her in, at the University of Denver when he started there, and they fell in love, and he was so happy. How long were they together? Two years. Did he talk to you about her? Oh, all the time. He adored her. He loved her. He told me just days um, before July 20th that she was the one and he was going to marry her. These photographs that I've shown you, are, are they still fair and accurate representations of both your son and Amanda just prior to his murder? Yes. Your Honor, I'm going to move for the admission of People's 2657 Four six seven nine four six eight zero and four six eight one into evidence. Nothing further. All right. Based on my previous rulings, uh, P dr dash twenty six fifty seven forty six seventy nine forty six eight a zero and forty six eighty one are admitted and may be published. Ma'am, can you give us two six five seven, please? Can you tell us something about this picture? He was so, so happy. Um, this was on a trip to Hawaii that we decided to take Alex and Amanda on in December of 2011. Just the four of us, me, Tom, Alex, and Amanda. Thank you. Can I have uh, 4679, please? Is that Amanda? Yes. You get a lot of pictures like this from your boy? <laughs> Yes. Can we get uh, 4680. Is this on that trip to Hawaii? It is. Thank you. 4681. And prior to your boy's murder, was Hawaii a special place for your family? It was. Um we had always dreamed of going to Hawaii, um, but we had lived in New Jersey um, the first 12 years of Alex's life, and it was kind of a far trip, plus, you know, funds were tight, and when we finally moved there, um, we had just a door, um, well, when we finally were able to take the trip there, um, the whole family just had so much fun and so many memories, and when we decided to take Alex and Amanda there in um, December of 2011, um, I'm so happy we did that because um, when I look back, it pretty much turned into the honeymoon that they never were able to have. Did, did, uh, did you and your husband uh, have plans to retire there? All right, my, I'm going to reverse my ruling and allow the question. Go ahead, Mr. Breckler. Thank you, Your Honor. Ma'am, I had asked you if you and your husband had planned to retire there, and I think you had said yes. Is that fair? Yes. Did you own some property out there prior to your son's murder? We did. Okay, and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, 
But before we get to July of, of 2012, I want you to tell us about your son's relationship with his father. Oh, gosh. They were so close. Um, three boys, including my husband, that would be four boys. Our house was always just rocking. Um, they would come in and there would be wrestling and rolling and things breaking. And um, it was a very, very active, loud, joyous household. Is your husband Tom here with us today? Yes, he is. Tell us about his relationship with his mother. We were very close. Um, Alex was six years older than his, his brother, so we had a lot of time together. Um, he was pretty much an only child for the six, first six years, and we did everything together. Um, I felt it was very, very important to be a stay-at-home mom, so I quit my job, and Tom worked three jobs at the time just so I can be home and raise Alex. I want to take us to July of 2012, specifically the 19th of July. Where were you? Uh, we had um, taken Tommy and Nick and gone to Hawaii for a vacation. Did you have any last contact with your son, Alex, on the 19th? We texted or, or spoke every day, so I did. Tell us about it. He had sent me a text, and he had just graduated from college, so he says, Mom, do I get a gift? <laughs> and I said, um, okay, you know, of course. And um, he had sent me a photo of a dining room set. And I thought, that's kind of odd for a uh, graduation gift, but he and Amanda had just moved into their own apartment um, just two weeks before, and they needed a dining room set, and that's what he wanted. So I said, of course, and we were going back and forth, you know, about how does this one look, and how does that one look, and and he actually went out later that day and, and bought that dining room set. Did you know he was going to go to the movies? No, he had spoke about uh, having trouble getting tickets um, to go see the movie. Good afternoon, Phil Tenser here, hoping you had a delicious lunch. We are interrupting, uh, respectfully, Miss Karen Teeves' testimony from yesterday because we are at this point now roughly 20 minutes away from the jury arriving at court. We wanted to use some of these last few minutes to interview Dan Recht, our legal analyst, who's been with us literally since our first day of coverage on this case. And Dan, we thank you for doing all of that work for us. But we hoping, we're hoping today uh, that you can answer some of our questions regarding this process that's going to begin this afternoon and a few questions uh, that our viewers and chatters on the internet have sent in for you. Um, so, so good afternoon, Dan. And let me start by asking you to set the scene in your words. Good afternoon to you. Thanks, Dan. And, and in your words and with what you know, what are we expecting to hear from both sides this afternoon? Well, um, at the risk of stating the obvious, I mean, the prosecution, of course, is going to say uh, strongly and with emotion that this is the case um, for the death penalty, for execution. And uh, that's what the prosecution is going to say clearly. The defense is going to focus, I would think, on um, the fact that Holmes is severely mentally ill, that every expert, including the prosecution's experts, um, agree with that, and that despite the fact they have found him guilty and, there are, and the defense isn't arguing about whether he was guilty or not, but um, in their own individual moral judgment, uh, they should decide that it's not right to execute a severely mentally ill man and it better to have them spend their life in prison with, um, 
without the possibility of parole. That is, in a nutshell, what you hear from each of them. Um, but in addition, let me say, <clears throat> they each side will, of course, do their argument and take up much of their 40 minutes. And then the question is, and people have asked, well, will they, do they have to use the rebuttal? Will they use rebuttal? And I don't, um, I know they don't have to use rebuttal, um, but the overwhelming odds are that you're going to hear rebuttal arguments from both sides. Interestingly, I frankly have not seen a trial like this where there's four arguments, prosecution, defense, prosecution, and then defense. It's the fourth part that is so highly unusual. Normally the prosecution goes first, then the defense, and then the prosecution can have a rebuttal if they want. In this case, the defense can be the last word heard because they're the fourth. And um, I, I strongly believe they will exercise that option and want to be uh, the last voice heard by the jury before the jury decides um, and starts to deliberate. So, um, and thank you for that, Dan. One of the things that we've heard, um, including earlier today, was that there were relatively few objections regarding the slideshows, the PowerPoint presentations that uh, both sides have used during this case. Does that mean, is there any chance at all that these arguments won't use the full length of time, the full 40 minutes for the primary argument and the full 20 minutes for the rebuttal? No, I, you know, there were, this case has gone on for months and months and months. If the judge had said, you can have an hour and a half and then another half an hour, they'd presumably use most of that time. So will they use 40 minutes um, as opposed to 38 minutes? You know, I don't know. Uh, but will they use most of their 40 minutes? I uh, strongly believe so. Every trial I've ever seen, the sides use approximately how much time they're given. So um, that's, that's what I would predict. Well, that's good to know from, from your experience, and, and thank you. Um, another question regarding these arguments. We know, obviously, the prosecution made their presentations, called testimony during phase three. The defense did not. Are they likely to go back into the same bag of tricks, the same content that they used unsuccessfully, I should add, in phase two? Are they going to go farther back, or are they going to go somewhere new altogether? No, they're not going to go somewhere new um, altogether. They will emphasize, uh, um, as I said a moment ago, the severe mental illness of their, um, of their client, uh, Mr. Holmes. And here's, here's um, what everyone should remember. The jury's deliberation and verdict in phase two um, could have been viewed by them as sort of a mathematical equation. You'll recall they were, in essence, being asked, uh, did the aggravators outweigh the mitigators, or did the mitigators outweigh the aggravators? And of course, they decided the aggravators were greater than the mitigators. But in a sense, it was a balancing test and almost a mathematical equation. This is different. This could not be more different in that now they're being asked for the first time in you know eight months that they've been dealing with this, the ultimate question. Should James Holmes be put to death? Should he be executed? And the whole decision is their decision and their decision alone, and that's a different kind of decision. Um, and so whether that will cause them to um, render a different kind of verdict, I don't know. But with certainty, they will view it differently. They will view the burden on them, the jury, as uh, more significant because you can be sure the defense is going to talk about the decision, the life and death decision being in their hands. Is it possible then, or is there any reason then, that the procedures in the jury's deliberation room would be any different than what we've seen so far? Well, it could possibly be a bit different in this way. In the normal 
trial and up until, um, you know, through the guild phase in this trial, if, if the vote is 11 to 1, then there's a mistrial and you have to go back and retry the case. Here, for the first time, if it's 11 to 1, that's it. The defense has prevailed and James Holmes would go to prison for life without parole. There would not be a mistrial. There would not be the retaking of evidence in any way. Um, and so that's different. And now um, the, the jurors will have a sense of that and they're gonna be told um, vote what you as an individual think. And the defense of course is hoping one of those people does that and uh, votes differently um, than the people that are voting for execution. If you don't mind, Dan, we'd also like to ask you a couple of questions. I know we're getting ahead of ourselves here, but it's definitely on the mind of our viewers and in the chat rooms. Getting ahead of ourselves and talking about appeals sure. and the appeals process. Um, one of the questions was simply, how does that work? I know that there's an automatic appeal in the event of a death sentence. Could you tell us a little bit more about what, uh, what that would all entail? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, generally, uh, there is the, the defense uh, assuming that the jury, for a second, assuming that the jury comes back and says execution, the death penalty, uh, the defense with 100% certainty will appeal um, and the appeal process will go to the Colorado Supreme Court and that process alone um, will take years and even after that if that's upheld then uh, the defense has a right to to um, go to federal court on a habeas corpus um, proceeding so and and you know I, I think your your um, viewers know this but it bears repeating the average length of time for an appeal on a death penalty case is years and years and years and uh, like it or not um, that's how the process works and why at least the proponents of the process of course believe um, someone's life is on the line literally and the judicial system wants to be as careful as it can be um, to only execute people if everything is done just right so uh, the process inevitably takes a long time uh, the two other related questions to the appeal process that came from our viewers Dan have to do with um, would there be the same attorneys if a, uh, an appeal is pursued or would he switch attorney teams, the, the defendant that is, and then also have you seen anything that would be appealable in the, in the future? Yeah, wow, uh, two more good questions. So let's take them in order that you asked me. Um, the first question is, the overwhelming odds are that uh, James Holmes will continue to be represented by the Public Defender's Office, but it won't be these lawyers. These are trial lawyers and lawyers that specialize in doing trials um, like I do. Um, but the Public Defender's Office also has lawyers, very good lawyers also, um, that specialize in doing appeals. That's all they do. They, the Public Defender's Office has an appellate division. Um, and that's clearly who will be uh, representing James Holmes, assuming um, there's an appeal of a death sentence. Um, and then the second question, um, I'm sorry, Phil, remind me of the second question, please. Was it, uh, or the question rather was, did you see anything that you would guess they uh, would appeal in the, in the future? Right. There is nothing that stands out as glaringly like the number one topic on appeal. Uh, you can be sure that um, the defense has a whole list of things that they would want to raise with an appellate court. The one interesting question though, and it, this has been resolved in the past by appellate courts, but it could be re-raised is, um, might there be an argument under the Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment, that um, a severely mentally ill person, even though sane, shouldn't be put to death and instead uh, should be um, sent 
to prison for life without parole. Now that issue has been litigated before, but it's possible, um, not likely, but possible and uh, the appellate courts would allow the defense to re-raise the issue. All right, Dan, if you don't mind, let's take one last look at the other side, the other option, life without parole, life in prison without the possibility of parole. If that's the verdict that we end up with after the jury is complete with this final round of deliberations, what happens next for the defendant, and is there any future uh, goings-on in this case? Well, um, the defendant would get uh, sent to the state prison um, uh, for life without parole, uh, but there would still be an appeal, presumably, because even though he wasn't, um, uh, he's not up for execution, he was found guilty of first-degree murder, and sometimes there are uh, appellate issues that they might prevail on the odds of that, I think, are of prevailing on appeal um, if there's not a, a death sentence are not great, but certainly there would be an appeal and, it, and um, it would be by the public defender's office. All right, Dan. Uh, my last question is to offer you the floor and see if there's any other final thoughts, anything that you'd like to direct us to watch for as we go into this last round of closing arguments. Well. Just that, um, it, um, to focus on the closings for your viewers, I'm going to, I'm going to be watching them, because different than any other legal proceeding in our whole country, um, there isn't one where, where it's the ultimate question, life or death, literally a jury, non-lawyers, non-judges are asked to decide should someone live or die. And so, um, uh, it just has to be acknowledged how unusual it is and how the lawyers approach their arguments in that regard, at least from my perspective, um, is uh, a very interesting question. Dan Recht, a legal analyst who've been teaching us and guiding us throughout this process. We appreciate you so very much. We know we'll have the opportunity to talk to you again tonight and tomorrow, so thank you, Dan. We will see you then. In the meantime, uh, by our clock, we have about six minutes remaining before court is going to come back. And I'm going to ask Andrew now uh, to give uh, my computer here, my laptop, control of the screen so we can talk about a couple of thoughts uh, while Andrew gets the court signal routed back into our switchboard here. But first, let's remember uh, the jurors, the 12 jurors, of course, 12 voting jurors. We have seven alternates. We started with 12 alternates. Uh, but these are the folks who now are going to be asked to make this ultimate decision, this life or death choice for another person. And let's start uh, in the top left corner here with seat number one. This is juror number 640, a, ca a Caucasian woman, a union plumber uh, with a military family. Juror number 17 in seat number two, another Caucasian woman. There is um, a notable um, lack of diversity on this jury. Uh, an attorney herself, someone who has said during the selection process from our notes, the death penalty should be rarely used. In seat number three, we have number 329, a former victim's advocate, uh, and of course there were so many victim's advocates involved in this case, uh, who believes in the right to the fair trial. Uh, I'm going to skip here over seat number four because you'll see in yellow on this chart, uh, yellow is alternates and red deals with jurors who have been dismissed for one reason or another. Of course, you can follow along with this chart in another tab if you're on your laptops on the DenverChannel.com or if you're on your phones, it is available inside the 7 News app. In seat number five, we have another green marking here for juror 535. Uh, the, uh, another Caucasian woman in her 50s, we estimate, uh, had a niece who survived the Columbine shootings back in 1999. Number, seat number six is juror number 87, a biology major who mentioned during the selection process, of course, going back to January in our notes, that she believes in an eye for an eye. In, here in seat number 11, we have juror 118, a Caucasian woman, a physicist, and an explosive expert, a competitive marksman. 
Uh, you know what, Andrew? Uh, the court is on, so let's interrupt this process now and hear what Judge Carlos Samor has to say. Good afternoon, everyone. This is the case of the people of the state of Colorado versus James Egan Holmes, case number 12 CR 1522. The record should reflect that Mr. Holmes is present with his attorneys, Ms. Brady, Ms. Higgs, Ms. Nelson, Mr. King, and Ms. Spengler. And the people are represented by Mr. Brockler, Mr. Orman, Ms. Pearson, Ms. Teach McGuire, Mr. Edson, and Mr. Edwards. And we are outside the presence of the jury. We have the final jury instructions and verdict forms and I believe my staff emailed the parties uh, both of those sets. Uh, two things. Uh, first, I want to make a record that in terms of the model instruction on direct and circumstantial evidence, um, we were all in agreement in phase two that it should not be included in the jury instructions. Uh, I want to confirm that the parties continue to have that position with respect to the instructions here in phase three. In other words, both parties believe that that instruction on direct and circumstantial evidence is not necessary and should not be included. Mr. Orman? We don't believe it's necessary and uh, we are not requesting that it be included. If the defendant requests that it be included, we would not object to that. All right. Ms. Nelson? We're not requesting that it be included. Okay. Great. The second thing is with respect to the instruction that speaks about evidence that was admitted for a limited purpose, uh, I indicated that I want to honor as much as possible the statute. And the statute is 16-8-107, uh, subsection 1.5b. Um, that subsection actually talks about uh, the admissibility of the evidence. And it says that it can only be admitted for the limited purpose of proving, and it uses the word proving. In the instructions, I'm using the word determining instead of proving. And the reason for that is that at this time, I'm not explaining to the jury why I'm admitting the evidence. I'm explaining to them how they may consider the evidence that was admitted for that limited purpose. And of course, they can consider it only for that same limited purpose. Um, but I think it's the only way uh, to say it um, while avoiding confusing the jury. So I wanted to make a record of that. Is there any record that the people want to make with respect to that issue, Mr. Orman? No, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Ms. Nelson, without waiving your objections and, and um, that you have made with respect to that particular instruction and the request that you have made, any record that you want to make with respect to that or any request that you want to make just with respect to that one issue that I just mentioned? All right, thank you. Do the parties have anything that I need to address before I bring the jury in, Mr. Brockler? No, sir. I uh, gave Ms. Brady an updated PowerPoint. Uh, my understanding is that she has no additional concerns or objections with it, but I'll let her say that. The, the other thing that I discussed with Ms. Brady was uh, to respectfully request that the court, I understand we're going to take a break after the instructions, short break. Before the bringing the jury back in, after the courtroom is filled with those who will be here, I wonder if in light of recent events, the court wouldn't be willing to do another verbal admonishment of the gallery in light of uh, the court's order. I I'm planning on doing that already. Thank you. Ms. Brady, anything from you? No, sir. Okay. What we'll do then is uh, I'm going to bring the jury in. I'm going to read the instructions. I'm going to take a break at that point for about 20 minutes. Then we'll proceed with... Uh, Mr. Brockler's closing argument. We'll then proceed after that with Ms. Brady's closing argument. Uh, and then I'll call you to the bench at that point and figure out if, uh, Mr. Brockler, if you have a rebuttal uh, or if you want to think about it. And then based on that, I'll decide whether we should take a break or we can just uh, proceed with my final instructions to the jury before sending the jury out to deliberate. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Do uh, either one of you wish to have any time warnings uh, for purposes of your closing arguments? I know that I have given you 40 minutes. Mr. Brockler? At uh, 25 and 35 like we've done before. 
Ms. Brady. With five minutes left, please. Okay, great. Thank we'll you. do that. Thank you. Thanks for reminding me. All right, let's bring the jury in, please. Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jury is back in the courtroom. Good afternoon, everyone. Please note that we're starting basically on time. It took till the last day of the trial, but I got it right finally. I figured out how to, how to assess, uh, make time assessments. Uh, the next step in the proceedings, as you know, is the jury instructions. And so I'm going to have my staff at this time distribute a copy of the phase three sentencing hearing instructions at this time. Each of you is going to have a copy of the instructions. Feel free to mark uh, or make notes on them. These are your copies and you get to keep these copies. I have the original here and you'll, note, you'll notice that uh, it is stamped original. These will go back to the jury room uh, where the deliberating jurors uh, will be deliberating. We're also distributing a sample verdict form it is marked sample. Each of you has a copy. And again, I have the original verdict forms here that we will send back to the deliberations room. All right, with that, does everyone have a copy of the instructions? No, we're missing. Looks like we're missing some. Oh, we're not. It's just making its way. The second row is a, is a little fuller than the other rows. OK. All right, everyone ready now? Yes, OK. Jury instructions. Phase three of the sentencing hearing. Instruction numbers one through 23 given by the court this sixth day of August of 2015. Sentencing hearing phase three instruction number one. Members of the jury, phase three of the sentencing hearing has now been completed. During the course of the trial and the sentencing hearing, you have received all of the evidence that you may properly consider in exercising your individual reason moral judgment to reach your final sentencing verdicts. I remind you that when I have made any references to the evidence and information presented in the courtroom during the proceedings, I simply meant the evidence presented in the courtroom during the proceedings. In a moment, I will read to you jury instructions that contain the rules of law that you must apply to reach your final sentencing verdicts. You will have copies of what I read to take with you to the jury room. But first, I want to mention some things 
that you need to keep in mind when you are discussing this case in the jury room. In these instructions, I refer to the first part of the proceedings as the trial and to the present part of the proceedings as the sentencing hearing or more specifically as phase three of the sentencing hearing. If I refer to the proceedings, I am referring to the trial and phases one, two, and three of the sentencing hearing. Until you have returned your final sentencing verdicts, you must follow all of the following admonishments. You must reach your final sentencing verdicts based only on the evidence presented during the trial, the evidence presented during the sentencing hearing, and the instructions provided by the court, which, among other things, inform you that in reaching each final sentencing verdict, you must exercise your individual reason moral judgment. However, to the extent that I tell you or have told you that you may only consider certain evidence for a limited purpose, you must only consider such evidence for the limited purpose that I tell you or have told you it may be considered. Do not communicate about the case with anyone else in any way, including in person, by telephone, cell phone, smartphone, iPhone, Blackberry, computer, the internet, or any internet service. This means that you must not email, text, instant message, tweet, blog, or post information about this case or about your experience as a juror in this case on any website, listserv, chat room, blog, or websites such as Facebook, MySpace, LinkedIn, YouTube, or Twitter. You must not communicate in any way with anyone else about this case or this kind of case. This includes your family members and friends. You must not read, review, or accept any communications in any form from anyone regarding this case or a case like this one. All you can tell family members, friends, acquaintances, and strangers is that you are a juror in Arapahoe County and that we anticipate that the proceedings will be completed by the end of August. If you notice that people are discussing the case, remove yourself from that location immediately. Do not attempt to gather any information on your own about this case or any case like it. You must not read or conduct any research about this case or this kind of case using any source, including dictionaries, reference materials, the internet, or any other electronic means. Many of us routinely use the internet to research topics of interest, but you may not do that in relation to this case. You may not use Google, Bing, Yahoo, or any other type of internet search engine to learn about any person, place, or thing that is involved in this case. This includes the defendant, the attorneys, the witnesses, your fellow jurors, court personnel, and me. This applies whether you're here, at home, or anywhere else. Do not read about this case or any case like it in the newspapers or on the internet. Do not listen to any radio broadcasts about the case or any case like it, and do not watch any television news reports regarding the case or any case like it. You should do your utmost to avoid all news reports. Do not attempt to visit any places mentioned in this case. Do not in any other way learn about this case or this kind of case outside the courtroom. Do not talk to the witnesses, parties, and attorneys about anything. Do not talk to any members of the media about anything. Do not have any contact, any contact through any means, including in person by telephone, text, or email with any jurors who have been discharged. You also should not have any contact through any means, including in person by telephone, text, or email with any of the alternate jurors. Make sure that you wear your juror badge whenever you're on the courthouse grounds and that your juror badge is visible to those around you. If you have a cell phone or other electronic device, you must temporarily surrender it to my staff. You're not allowed to have a cell phone or other electronic device in the jury room during your deliberations. You will get your electronic device at the end of the day before you go home. Lastly, although you may start deliberating when I tell you that you may do so, you may discuss this case only when you're all present and only when you're in the jury room. No juror should attempt to discuss this case with another juror or other jurors except when all the jurors are present in the jury room 
all deliberations must occur in the jury room when all 12 jurors are present. It is my job to decide what rules of law apply to the case. While the attorneys may comment on some of these rules, you must follow the instructions that I give you. Even if you disagree with or do not understand the reasons for some of the rules of law, you must follow them. No single instruction describes all the law which must be applied. The instructions must be considered together as a whole. At times during the proceedings, the attorneys have made objections. Do not draw any conclusions from the objections or from my rulings on the objections. These only related to the legal questions that I had to decide and should not influence your thinking. If I told you not to consider a particular statement during the proceedings, you must not consider, consider it in your deliberations. Similarly, if during the proceedings I sustain an objection to a question after a witness had already provided an answer or partial answer, you must not consider any part of that answer in your deliberations. I may have asked questions of witnesses during the proceedings. That did not mean that I had any opinion about the facts in the case. Remarks and rulings that I have made during the proceedings should not be understood by you as suggesting any opinion or feeling on my part as to what has or has not been proven in this case. Likewise, remarks and rulings I have made during the proceedings should not be understood by you as suggesting any opinion or feeling on my part as to what final sentencing verdicts you should reach. Finally, the court's instructions of law are not intended as an expression of any opinion or desire concerning the final sentencing verdicts that you should reach. I remind you that I'm neutral in these proceedings. Sentencing hearing phase three, instruction number two. Each of you must fully appreciate your obligation to carefully and fairly consider the decisions that you have been called upon to make in this final phase of the sentencing hearing. These decisions may well be the most important and serious decisions that you will ever be asked to make. Sentencing hearing, phase three, instruction number three. Your final sentencing verdicts are not dictated by law. Further, none of your earlier decisions in these proceedings dictates what your final sentencing verdicts should be. The outcome of your deliberations at the end of the trial, at the end of phase one of the sentencing hearing, and at the end of phase two of the sentencing hearing, do not govern the ultimate determination that you must make now as to whether the defendant should be sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole or death. In order to reach your final sentencing verdicts, each of you will be called upon to deliberate and to make decisions based on your individual reasoned moral judgment. Sentencing hearing phase three, instruction number four. You must now consider whether the defendant should be sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole or death on each count of murder in the first degree. This is a decision left exclusively to each of you. Each of you personally will determine whether the defendant will be sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole or death on each count. In reaching your final sentencing verdict on each count, each of you must exercise your individual reason moral judgment. The exercise of your individual reason moral judgment must be based on the evidence presented in the courtroom during these proceedings. Each juror's sentencing decision must reflect a profoundly reasoned moral response to the defendant's background, character, history, and crimes. With respect to each count, each of you must individually decide, based upon your reasoned moral judgment, whether or not you are convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that death is the appropriate sentence. No juror may ever decide that the defendant should be sentenced to death unless the juror is convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that death is the appropriate sentence. Further, the jury may only return a sentence of death on account if every juror is convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that death is the appropriate sentence on that count. If one or more jurors are not convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that death 
is the appropriate sentence on account. The defendant will be sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole on that count. A juror need not be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that life imprisonment without the possibility of parole is the appropriate sentence in order to make a decision that will result in a sentence of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. None of you individually, nor the jury collectively, is ever required to impose a sentence of death. The law never requires a death sentence. If any of you is not convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that death is the appropriate sentence on a particular count, that ends the inquiry with respect to that count because in that situation, the law requires that the defendant be sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Even if you're convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that the mitigating factors that exist do not outweigh the proven aggravating factors, you must still individually make a profoundly moral assessment or evaluation of the defendant's character and his crimes of murder in the first degree in order to determine whether or not you're convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that death is the appropriate sentence. Phase three is separate and distinct from phase two. Sentencing hearing phase three, instruction number five. Based upon your verdicts at the end of the trial, the defendant has been found guilty of 24 counts of murder in the first degree. As you know, there are two guilty verdicts for murder in the first degree with respect to each deceased victim because the prosecution pursued two theories of liability as to each deceased victim, murder in the first degree after deliberation and murder in the first degree extreme indifference. The two guilty verdicts for each deceased victim will eventually merge into a single conviction for murder in the first degree and, based solely on the jury's final sentencing verdicts, the defendant will receive a single sentence for that conviction. Accordingly, the defendant will stand convicted of 12 murders in the first degree and the jury's final sentencing verdicts alone will determine the sentences for those crimes. In phase one of the sentencing hearing, you determined that the prosecution proved beyond a reasonable doubt four aggravating factors with respect to each count of murder in the first degree. In phase two of the sentencing hearing, you determined that with respect to each count, the mitigating factors that exist do not outweigh the aggravating factors proven by the prosecution beyond a reasonable doubt. You must again make 24 separate determinations. This time, as to each of the 24 counts of murder in the first degree, you must decide whether or not, based on each juror's individual reason moral judgment, you are unanimously convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that death is the appropriate sentence. If you decide that a death sentence is the appropriate sentence on one or more counts, that sentence will be enforced regardless of the final sentencing verdicts on the remaining counts and regardless of the lack of a unanimous final sentencing verdict on any count. This is the case even if you impose different sentences on two counts that relate to the same victim. And even if you impose a death sentence on one count related to a victim and do not reach a unanimous final sentencing verdict on the other count related to that victim. Sentencing hearing phase three, instruction number six. In phase three of the sentencing hearing, there is no burden of proof. Therefore, neither party has the burden to prove anything to you. This rule applies regardless of whether a party chose to present evidence or not to present evidence in phase three. The defendant has presented evidence in these proceedings. You are instructed that the, pro the presentation of evidence by the defendant at any point in these proceedings does not place the burden on him to prove or disprove anything. A defendant never has any burden to convince the jury that the sentence of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole is the appropriate sentence or that a death sentence is not the appropriate sentence. While neither party has a burden of proof in phase three, the degree of certainty that is defined as beyond a reasonable doubt nevertheless applies in this phase of the sentencing hearing. 
A juror may not determine that a death sentence is appropriate on any count unless he or she is convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that death is the appropriate sentence. Thus, in phase three, the use of the term beyond a reasonable doubt refers to the degree of moral certainty that an individual juror is required to have before he or she may decide, based on his or her individual reason moral judgment, that death is the appropriate sentence. An individual juror is not required to have the degree of certainty defined by beyond a reasonable doubt before he or she may decide, based on his or her individual reason moral judgment, that a life sentence without the possibility of parole is the appropriate sentence. Sentencing hearing, phase three, instruction number seven. Reasonable doubt, as used in these instructions, means a doubt based upon reason and common sense, which arises from a fair and rational consideration of the evidence or the lack of evidence in the proceedings. It is a doubt which is not a vague, speculative, or imaginary doubt, but such a doubt as would cause reasonable people to hesitate to act in matters of importance to themselves. Sentencing hearing phase three, instruction number eight. There's no requirement that you explain or justify to your fellow jurors why your individual reason moral judgment leads you to a particular decision and account. Nevertheless, it is your duty as jurors to consult with one another and to deliberate on all counts, on all the counts. While you are not required to agree with the determinations, opinions, feelings, or thoughts of other jurors, you must deliberate with your fellow jurors. After deliberating, if a juror disagrees with the rest of the jurors, that disagreement must be respected by the other jurors and will be respected by the court. Ultimately, each of you must deliberate and decide for yourself the appropriate sentence based on your individual reason moral judgment. Sentencing hearing phase three, instruction number nine. In reaching your final sentencing verdicts, you may consider mercy and sympathy for the defendant. Your exercise of mercy and sympathy must be based upon the evidence presented during the proceedings. Sentencing hearing phase three, instruction number 10. Under Colorado law, when a person is sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, it means that the person must spend the rest of his natural life in prison. A person who has been sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole cannot ever apply for parole or cannot ever be paroled and cannot ever be paroled. Sentencing hearing phase three, instruction number 11. Under Colorado law, the manner of enforcing a sentence of death is by the administration of a lethal injection. You must assume that a death sentence will be carried out if the jury determines beyond a reasonable doubt that it is the appropriate sentence. Sentencing hearing phase three, instruction number 12. You are instructed that the fact that the prosecution seeks the death penalty in this case is entitled to no weight whatsoever in your decisions. No juror should allow himself or herself to be influenced or prejudiced against the defendant because of the fact that the prosecution seeks the death penalty. Sentencing hearing phase three, instruction number 13. In reaching your final sentencing verdicts, you must treat the defendant as a uniquely individual human being. Further, you must not be influenced by prejudice or bias of any sort against the defendant or the prosecution, and you must not consider any public opinion or community sentiment for or against the defendant or the prosecution. Your decisions may not be the result of any irrational or arbitrary emotional response. Rather, each of your final sentencing verdicts must reflect your individual reason moral determination. Sentencing hearing phase three, instruction number 14. In phase three, you received victim impact evidence, which is evidence of any matters relating to the personal characteristics of the deceased victims and the impact of the crimes of murder in the first degree on each victim's family. 
The purpose of such evidence is to inform you about the harm caused by the crimes of murder in the first degree. You may consider this evidence in reaching your final sentencing verdicts. However, your consideration must be limited to a moral inquiry into the culpability of the defendant, not an emotional response to the evidence presented. You are never permitted to make a comparative judgment between the defendant and the victims. Sentencing hearing phase three, instruction number 15. The court reminds you that the number of witnesses testifying for or against a certain fact during the proceedings does not by itself prove or disprove that fact. Sentencing hearing phase three, instruction number 16. The court reminds you that you're the sole judges of the credibility of each witness who testified in these proceedings and the weight to be given to each witness's testimony. You should carefully consider all of the testimony given and the circumstances under which each witness has testified. For each witness, consider that person's knowledge, motive, state of mind, demeanor, and manner while testifying. Consider the witness's ability to observe the strength of that person's memory and how that person obtained his or her knowledge. Consider any relationship the witness may have to either side of the case and how each witness might be affected by the verdict. Consider how the testimony of the witness is supported or contradicted by other evidence in the case. You should consider all facts and circumstances shown by the evidence when you evaluate each witness's testimony. You may believe all of the testimony of a witness, part of it, or none of it. Sentencing hearing phase three, instruction number 17. The court reminds you that you're not bound by the testimony of witnesses who testified as experts. The credibility of an expert's testimony is to be considered as that of any other witness. You may believe all of an expert witness's testimony, part of it or none of it. The weight that you give the testimony is entirely your decision. Sentencing hearing phase three, instruction number 18. In reaching your final sentencing verdicts, you may consider all of the evidence admitted during the proceedings. Dr. Jeffrey Metzner's testimony during phase two of the sentencing hearing, which was admitted for the limited purpose of determining the existence or absence of any mitigating factor, may only be considered for that limited purpose. Additionally, the evidence admitted during the trial for the limited purpose of considering the issues raised by the defendant's plea of not guilty by reason of insanity may only be considered for the limited purpose of determining the existence or absence of any mitigating factor. Finally, any other evidence that the court instructed you throughout the proceedings could only be considered for a limited purpose may only be considered for that limited purpose. Sentencing hearing phase three, instruction number 19. Every person charged with a crime or convicted of murder in the first degree has the constitutional right not to testify. The defendant did not testify during the trial or during the sentencing hearing, as was his right. You should not draw any negative inferences from his choice as to the punishment to be imposed or any other matter. You shall not allow his choice to prejudice him in any way. His decision not to testify cannot be used as a reason to support or impose the death penalty. You must not discuss the defendant's choice not to testify or permit it to enter into your deliberations in any way. Sentencing hearing phase three, instruction number 20. You were permitted to submit written questions to witnesses throughout the proceedings. If a particular question was not asked, do not guess why the question was not asked or what the answer might have been. My decision not to ask a question submitted by a juror was not a reflection on the person asking it, and you should not attach any significance to the failure to ask a question. By making legal rulings and the admissibility of questions, I did not intend to suggest or express any opinion about the question. My decision whether or not to allow a question was based on the applicable rules of evidence and other rules of law and not on the facts of this particular case. It is my responsibility to assure that all parties receive a fair trial according to the law and the rules of evidence. The fact that certain questions were not asked 
must not affect your consideration of the evidence in any way. Do not give greater weight to questions or answers to questions that were submitted by yourself or your fellow jurors. Sentencing hearing phase three, instruction number 21. You've been allowed to take notes. Whether or not you took notes, you should rely on your memory as much as possible. The notes that you took are to refresh your own memory. You should not give additional weight to the comments of any juror based upon the quantity or quality of his or her note taking. Sentencing, sentencing hearing phase three, instruction number 22. Once you begin your deliberations, if you have a question, your foreperson should write it on a piece of paper, sign it, and give it to one of my bailiffs who will bring it to me. The court will then determine the appropriate way to answer the question. However, there may be some questions that under the law, the court is not permitted to answer. Please do not speculate about what the answer to your question might have been or why the court is not able to answer a particular question. Finally, please be sure to keep the original question and response. Do not destroy them as they are part of the official record in this case and must be returned to me when you return the instructions and final sentencing verdict forms. Sentencing hearing, phase three, instruction number 23. Following the attorney's closing arguments, the bailiffs will escort you to the jury room so that you may deliberate. Your foreperson will preside over your deliberations. You will be given 24 separate final sentencing verdict forms, one for each count of murder in the first degree. Each verdict form has three sections, one, two, and three. Your final sentencing verdict on each count must be reflected in section one, section two, or section three of the verdict form. As to each of the 24 counts of murder in the first degree, you must decide whether or not, based on each juror's individual reason moral judgment, you are unanimously convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that death is the appropriate sentence. If the jury is unanimously convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that a death sentence is the appropriate sentence on a count, the four person and the other 11 jurors should sign on the designated lines in section one of the final sentencing verdict form for that count. In that event, the defendant will receive a death sentence on that count and that sentence will be carried out regardless of the final sentencing verdicts on the remaining counts and regardless of the lack of a unanimous final sentencing verdict on any count. If the jury is not unanimously convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that a death sentence is the appropriate sentence on a count, and the jury unanimously agrees that the defendant should be sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole on that count, the four person should sign on the designated line in section two of the verdict form for that count. In that event, the defendant will receive a sentence of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole on that count. If the jury does not reach a unanimous final sentencing verdict on a, on a count, because it is neither unanimously convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that death is the appropriate sentence, nor in unanimous agreement that the defendant should be sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, the four person should sign on the designated line in section three of this verdict form to indicate that the jury does not have a unanimous final sentencing verdict on that count. In that event, the court will be required by law to sentence a defendant to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole on that count. Only one section, section one, section two, or section three, shall be completed on each verdict form. The final sentencing verdict forms and these instructions shall remain in the possession of your foreperson until I call for them in open court. Upon reaching your final sentencing verdicts, you will inform the bailiff that you have completed all of the final sentencing verdict forms and the bailiffs in turn will notify me. You will then remain in your jury room until called into the courtroom. In your communication, please do not indicate whether you have reached a unanimous verdict on any count or counts. Simply indicate that you have completed all of the final sentencing verdict forms. I will now read a sample 
final sentencing verdict form. You must not draw any inferences based on the verdict form I have selected to read to you. Does everyone have the uh, sample verdict form, a copy of it that was distributed? And everyone's saying yes, nodding their head yes. <laughs> final sentencing verdict form, count one, murder in the first degree after deliberation, Jonathan Blanc. Roman numeral one, single asterisk. We, the jury, are unanimously convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that the appropriate sentence for the defendant, James Egan Holmes, on this count is a death sentence. And then there are 12 spaces there for the juror's signature, including for the foreperson, in case that is the jury's sentencing verdict. Roman numeral number two, double asterisk. We, the jury, are not unanimously convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that the appropriate sentence for the defendant, James Egan Holmes, on this count is a death sentence. And we, the jury, unanimously agree that the defendant should be sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole on this count. And then there's a space there for the four-person signature in case that is the jury's sentencing verdict on this count. Roman numeral three, triple asterisk. We, the jury, do not have a unanimous final sentencing verdict on this count, and we, the jury, understand that as a result, the court will impose a sentence of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole on this count. And then there is a space there for the four-person signature in case this reflects the, the, um, the outcome of your deliberations. Second page, single asterisk, which applies to uh, section one. If the jury is unanimously convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that a death sentence is the appropriate sentence on this count, the four person and the other 11 jurors should sign on the designated lines in section one of this verdict form. Sections two and three should then remain unmarked. Only one section may be completed on this verdict form, section one, section two, or section three. In the event that the jury completes section one of this verdict form, the defendant will receive a death sentence on this count, and that sentence will be carried out regardless of the final sentencing verdicts on the remaining counts and regardless of the lack of a unanimous final sentencing verdict on any count. Double asterisk, which applies to section two. If the jury is not unanimously convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that a death sentence is the appropriate sentence on this count, and the jury unanimously agrees that the defendant should be sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole on this count, the four person should sign on the designated line in section two of this verdict form. Sections one and three should then remain unmarked. Only one section may be completed on this verdict form, section one, section two, or section three. In the event that the jury completes section two of this verdict form, the defendant will receive a sentence of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole on this count. Triple asterisk, which applies to section three. If the jury does not reach a unanimous final sentencing verdict on this count because it is neither unanimously convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that death is the appropriate sentence nor in unanimous agreement that the defendant should be sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, the four person should sign on the designated line in section three of this verdict form to indicate that the jury does not have a unanimous final sentencing verdict on this count. Sections one and two should then remain unmarked. Only one section may be completed on this verdict form, section one, section two, or section three. In the event that the jury completes section three of this verdict form, the court will be required by law to sentence the defendant to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole on this count. All right, folks, that concludes the reading of the instructions and the sample verdict form. What we're gonna do now is take a break uh, for 20 minutes and then we'll proceed with uh, the closing arguments. As, as I indicated, I have given each side 40 minutes the prosecution goes first, uh, and then if there is a rebuttal argument, I have given each side 20 minutes, again, with the prosecution going first and the defense going last. 
Uh, please make sure that you keep in mind all my advisements during the break. You're not allowed to talk to each other about the case or any of the proceedings, uh, and you should leave the instructions and the sample verdict form on your chair. Do not take them with you uh, during the break, okay? All right. Uh, I'll see you in 20 minutes. Thank you. Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jury has exited the courtroom. Is there anything that we need to discuss at this time on behalf of the people, Mr. Brockler? No, Your Honor, thank you. Anything on behalf of the defense, Ms. Brady? Okay. All right, let's take our 20-minute break, and I'll see you back here after the break. Thank you. The court will be in recess. All right. Good afternoon again. I don't know about any of you at home, but certainly at this point, and we've been here now, this is the fourth time, but my anxiety gets high as we know that these, these important arguments are coming, that these emotional moments are coming just a few minutes away from now. We are at 1.43 here in Denver in the mountain time zone. If you're not living nearby, that means uh, at 2.03 in just 20 minutes, we should be back with the jury and the closing arguments will begin. Of course, D.A. George Brockler goes first. Uh, I'm going to pick things up where we left off chatting about the case and the jury uh, prior to these instructions when we were uh, talking earlier this afternoon. But I have my other laptop here. If you have any questions, things that we should chat about, please do send those in and we'll get back to those questions momentarily. But Andrew, if you don't mind, please punch up that computer screen again. Thank you, sir. Uh, I left off here on seat number 13, a Caucasian woman, a, a former paramedic of 20 years who has treated the mentally ill. Of course, mental illness, a major cornerstone in this case. Juror number 155, that's seat number 14, a California man, the first man that we've uh, looked at as a voting juror. Um, that uh, lived in California at the time of the shooting, now lives in Colorado, obviously. The next gentleman on the jury, seat number 15, that's juror 527. Uh, a uh, store manager at Bed Bath & Beyond, uh, approximate age is in the 30s. If we jump over here to seat number 17, this is the Columbine survivor, the jury foreman. Uh, perhaps I should update this chart at some point. Uh, the jury foreman, a Caucasian, a Columbine survivor, 19, uh, who was there in the 1999 uh, time frame during that shooting, um, and the one you'll remember that was related to um, Newsweek going too far and identifying him and there being banned from this case. In seat number 21, a Hispanic woman, age 30s or 40s, uh, who said mental illness is not an excuse. And then the last of our 12 voting jurors, a Caucasian woman who's served on a jury before and says she'll respect her peers. Um, Andrew, we can come back on camera for a minute now. I'll have to reset this computer screen before we go to our next event. But I see a couple of questions also here uh, on, uh, I'm looking at the YouTube chat room right now. Uh, Zach, you asked who is doing the closing argument for the defense and all of the indications I've overheard during the court process so far is that Tamara Brady um, is going to be doing it. She's the uh, brunette, dark-colored hair, um, who, uh, who gave uh, at least one of the previous closings as well, um, or, or, in, or openings as well. Um, the other question I saw here was from Rocket, asking um, if Mr. King is doing it. No, I believe it will be Brady. If the verdict is reached, what is the general process 
the defense aspires to. If the death penalty, oh, I see. So in Colorado, there is, um, the law dictates that the death penalty should be carried out by lethal injection and that there will be automatic appeals. Um, if you guys want to stick with me, actually, I'm going to take a moment. I can try to pull up that statute here. Title 18, Colorado. We can take a look at that together. It's a great big PDF file. Um, many thousands of pages. But let's look at um, sodium. The word sodium doesn't appear all that often in state statutes, you might be aware. So go ahead, Andrew. Um, here is the f page 165 of Title 18. 18-1.3-1202. Um, uh, I spent a lot of time reading this the other day, trying to learn exactly what's going on here. But this, to me, was very informative because the penalty itself must be carried out by lethal injection. Uh, they even list in here that it should be sodium thiopental or equally more effective substance sufficient to cause death. Um, it would be administered by lethal injection regardless of the date of commission uh, or the offense. So there is no other option, unlike some other states I'm aware of, that have other options. There is no other option for the death penalty uh, in this case. The other thing, the other part of the question there was regarding appeals. Now, we can't predict all of the appeals, but we can point out there's a line in here about the fact that there is a... Well, firstly, if anything in this law is determined um, unconstitutional by either the state Supreme Court or the U.S. Supreme Court, the rest of the uh, law would remain intact and the rest of the punishment. Uh, so if, for example, um, death penalty was outlawed uh, unilaterally across the country, uh, there would, the rest of this case um, and law would default to life in prison without parole. That part of the law wouldn't change. Uh, here we go. If on appeal of the Supreme Court, and it is, by the way, an automatic appeal, and I'm trying to find where that particular line is, but it is an automatic appeal, appeal to the Supreme Court. So if the Supreme Court, and this is the state Supreme Court at this point, finds one or more of the aggravating factors, remember in this case there were four, that were found to support a sentence of death being valid, the court then gets to decide whether the death sentence should be affirmed they have to reweigh the remaining aggravating factors, determine if death is the appropriate uh, punishment, and use this uh, legalese term, uh, harmless error analysis, to consider if the sentencing body had not been considered the invalid aggravating factor. Um, let's see, there's another question here. Will um, the defendant speak after sentencing, and there's absolutely no reason to believe he would. He's, re he's turned down every opportunity there for this, but um, why would he speak now, I suppose? Uh, I don't think there's any reason to suspect that. Um, Andrew, I think I'm done with this chart here. Thank you very much. I'm going to peek around, see if there's any other questions, because otherwise the next item I think we should do is I think we should go back to um, looking at the timeline, and we will re return to the case timeline in just a minute. Uh, but uh, there are a couple questions here on the Scribble Live chat room that I'll address first. How many death penalty cases make it to phase three and what has been the outcome? Uh, and the truth is that I have never, in my time in Colorado, which admittedly is only four years living here, uh, I have never seen a case go to the death penalty, not to mention to the third phase of the death penalty. It is exceedingly rare. Um, and you, you may be aware, I know some of you are aware, there is another death penalty case which right now is in the jury's hands for the initial guilt or not guilty um, decision process. It is exceedingly rare to have one death penalty case in the state, not to mention two simultaneously. Kathy, what would it be like for James Holmes while he's in prison? Uh, and that's a wonderful question, uh, certainly a, a, a layered question because there are various possible outcomes, but I do have a coworker, uh, Alan Gathright, who's working on stories about just those potentialities uh, today. And what he's told me um, in our conversations is that 
he would first be taken to an intake center, which I believe is here in the Denver area, to be assessed, to be uh, enrolled in all of the prison systems, and to uh, have any individualized needs assessed for the process for the time he spends in prison. Uh, aren't those drugs that the states... Oh, Lynn, I understand your question. Yes, the, the drugs, the sodium thiopental, uh, I'm, I know I don't know the pronunciation very well. Um, those drugs, are they the drugs that the states have a hard time pro uh, procuring? Uh, and I, I believe that is accurate. I, I don't have an exceedingly large amount of knowledge about this, uh, but I do believe that that is true. But I do believe elsewhere in this law, uh, Title 18, it states that it's coming from a um, compounding pharmacy. Either that was from the law or it was from our uh, research in contact with the Department of Corrections, and I don't remember which. But a compounding pharmacy does work to um, create the drug, I'm certain. Uh, I mean, I, I try to imagine putting myself in being a pharmacist and getting that order uh, and knowing what it's for. I, I certainly think that there would be people out there who have trouble filling that order, and that may be the difficulty to which uh, you're referring, Lynn. Um, already mad. Well, I think I'm running out of comments here, so let me switch back to YouTube to make sure there's nothing else we should discuss. Um, uh, Denver asks, how long at the local facility before prison? I, I do not know the answer to that. I, I suppose the answer is uh, as long as it takes to do whatever uh, work they need. Of course, we suspect the prison would be the Sterling or Canyon City uh, facilities, but we don't know uh, with any certainty. Certainly, if they decide that there is a mental health issue that they want to um, take their issues, once he's in the custody of the DOC, uh, I believe it's their decision to handle, uh, to reassess him and handle him uh, if they get there. Um, Memory is asking, when is the soonest we can expect a decision? So let's, let's discuss that because that's a wonderful question. This afternoon, if we come back at 2.03, so just about 10 minutes, 9 minutes from now, the first thing that's going to happen is 40 minutes from D.A. Brockler and then 40 minutes from Miss Brady. There, I would guess that there would be a recess after that, another break, another breather. Then there's going to be, excuse me, two 20-minute rebuttals. That they're optional, but we do suspect, and certainly our legal expert Dan Recht suspects, we're going to hear those two 20-minute rebuttals. Everyone he says is likely to use their complete time or most of their time, so, so they'd get a 40-minute uh, argument and a 20-minute rebuttal. The defense, of course, would end up with the final rebuttal, the final word, uh, which makes sense given the philosophy of the law here. They're going to have the final opportunity to try to convince the jury to spare the defendant's life. Following that, there's a few final instructions and the jury will be taken out of the room. But if we add this up, we're coming back at 2.03. We have two hours total for the arguments. If you add those all up, all, all, both of the arguments and the two rebuttals, that's two hours. Another 20-minute break, that's going to bring us till 4.20 or 4.30, depending on how fast we get started. 4.30, you'll remember, is the time the jury typically disbands and goes home for the evening. So I don't think it's very likely they will do much deliberation tonight. Uh, it's possible they could change their own rule, they could have a meeting and decide uh, to stay late, but that would not be their typical process. Their typical process has been to leave at 4.30 and return at 8.30. So, I think, and I can tell you certainly that we are all prepared for deliberations, and if they reveal that they've reached a decision tomorrow, we'll be prepared for that. Let me tell you a little bit now um, about our process. The process for which we'll uh, alert everyone and begin our coverage once a verdict is reached, whether it's tomorrow, whether it's next week, whether, whatever time we get the notification. We are in direct contact with the court spokesman, Rob McCallum, who gives us that three-hour notification. The moment we hear that, we'll have our YouTube stream, like the one you're watching now, but a new one set up, ready to go. We'll have a Scribble Live chat, like the one we're conversing on now, all set up, ready to go. So, uh, you know, bookmark the pages. We'll, we'll have them prepared tonight before I go home. 
Once those happen, we're going to send out our push alerts through the 7 News app. We're going to send out our email alerts for those of you who signed up on the DenverChannel.com, and those signups are still open. They're always open. Um, and then we're going to start broadcasting right away. Our plan right now is to focus on recaps uh, from the third phase, the current phase, uh, the phase that they're deliberating after. We'll have someone uh, here ready to go, ready to turn on all the equipment so that no matter when the verdict is reached, again, whatever time they reach it, we'll get that three hour warning. We're gonna start our coverage right away because there obviously is so very much to talk about and this is such a large decision, more than three years in the making um, and certainly uh, a very emotional decision for all of us living here in Colorado. Uh, after that, of course, whatever time the decision is, we'll cover the courtroom live and we do plan to send out several of our crews uh, and live equipment and trucks and cameras and everything that we can marshal uh, at that point in time. Uh, and speaking of marshal, he will be in the courtroom whenever the verdict is read. We're going to send all of that equipment and personnel out there to Arapahoe County. It's uh, just about 20, 25 minutes south of us uh, along the interstate. We're going to send everyone there and go uh, and bring you as much coverage as we possibly can. And that includes here on the webcast. We have some plans to um, continue our webcast for any potential interviews that could occur outside of the courthouse or um, anything else uh, that might come up. We're going to stick with it all the way through because this is now the ultimate decision. But of course it's not necessarily the end of our coverage. Even though we plan um, all of this, we, we gear up for this big coverage, we know that there is still the potential that victim impact statements are yet to come. And what I mean by that is even though these 24 murder counts have the death penalty and this big decision that we're hearing about today and discussing right now, there is still the issue of the other 141 counts, that is for attempted murder and for the booby traps and explosives in the Paris Street apartment. All of those items, of course, are going to have to be uh, adjudicated and sentences handed down. Because those are not death penalty, that sentence is handed by the judge, but the judge does get to hear from those survivors, victims, uh, anyone affected by the crimes, if they so choose to speak, and we do have the indications that they would. Um, I think I've uh, missed a couple of questions on here, so I'm going to take just a moment uh, and show you uh, my bald spot while I lean down to look for them. Uh, what steps have been taken to ensure there isn't another disruption during closing arguments? Uh, and Spring, the answer there is that um, the, the judge is going to give again his same uh, admonishments, uh, that is the rules, to the members of the gallery. Of course, uh, since even in, including the Deborah Cave incident, the rules, I can tell you, are posted on the door to that courtroom and have been for a, quite some time. They're also posted on the back of every single chair in the gallery. So it's not just the media, but it's everyone, the public seats, the family seats, everybody has that uh, list of rules and admonishments staring them in the face. Um, that is why, of course, uh, Deborah Cave in that incident during the last closing arguments that's why she was immediately found in contempt of court. There was no question that she was aware of the rules, and so the judge had the right then to sentence her to three weeks in jail, which he did. You'll remember that dramatic take her away moment. Pardon me, I'm pausing as I just take one more second. Um, there's a question here about uh, how long the jury will take to decide, of course, we can never know that, but certainly it's something that you're all welcome to speculate on along with us. Um, given how long things have taken, we, we can remember the first verdict took a day and a half, 12 or 13 hours, uh, and then they came back with 165 guilty counts. The next three phases, or two decisions so far, have all dealt with only 24 counts. Those are, of course, uh, the ones where they decided the first one in about nine hours, less than eight, it was two half days, or excuse me, less than nine, it was two half days of work for the deliberations there. And then phase two, the mitigating factors phase, was decided in two and a half or three hours, just uh, about 45 minutes one night and then uh, an hour and a half, two hours the next morning before we got that verdict in, minus the, the paperwork errors and the decision-making process there. That was less than three hours. So. We are certainly prepared here at 7 News to hear a verdict tomorrow.
Uh, and by the way, for those of you on the Scribble Live site, do forgive me, I'm not uh, approving comments, but I have them here in my moderation bin, uh, so I don't have the ability to, um, I, I'm not taking the, the time it takes to go through and, and approve all of them one by one, which is the way the process works, but I am able to read them and answer you here. Um, so A.W. asks, in prison would this defendant be in a cell by himself? And I believe the answer is certainly. Uh, would he have jobs or access to educational material? Uh, and I suppose all that depends on the verdict and then uh, on the, um, uh, the assessments of the Department of Corrections. I know that in the incident of a uh, death penalty verdict, it's um, basically 23 hours a day solitary. When the verdict is reached, does all of the evidence immediately become public? And Lynn, if you were uh, joining us earlier, you would have heard that Mr. Orman was asking a similar question. Turns out that Mr. Orman is also a custodian of records for George Brockler's office, the district attorney's office there in Arapahoe County. Um, I believe the 18th Judicial District is not just Arapahoe County. It extends um, throughout others as well. Uh, but he was asking the same question, and the answer is, those things are not decided yet. The judge is going to have to get um, individualized decisions. There was an earlier request made by the media consortium's attorney to get access to more evidence, and the judge tabled that for the time being. That request will probably have to be renewed at a later time if uh, we in the media decide collectively to pursue any piece of evidence, um, or if anyone else in the outs outside of our uh, consortium decides to pursue the evidence. Uh, so right now it is 2.03. Andrew and I are in a holding pattern. We are ready, expecting court to resume any minute now with these final closing arguments, the fourth round of closing arguments, uh, but, but potentially the most weighty. The decision now facing this jury is life or death. Will they give the defendant, the convicted gunman who killed 12 people, injured 70 others, and set up incendiary explosive booby traps in his apartment, Will this man be put to death by lethal injection in the ways that we've discussed looking at Title 18 just a few moments ago? Or will he be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole? And I'm glancing again at, at this point. I have no updates from the court. So we're expecting court to begin at any moment. And as soon as it does, obviously, we will go there live. I'll take a moment and jump here to my uh, other computer screen and uh, we can review for as much time as we have left this case timeline because certainly this case has been going on for some time. This timeline on the Denver Child, well, uh, again, I'll, I'll be interrupted by the court gladly. Judge Samore is back in the room and that means closing arguments are about to start. We'll go there and talk to you again in a few minutes. Back on the record, this is uh, the people of the state of Colorado versus James Egan Holmes, case number 12 CR 1522. The record should reflect that Mr. Holmes is present with his attorneys and the prosecutors are present as well. Would uh, counsel please approach Mr. Bruckler and Ms. Brady?
Are the parties ready for the jury, Mr. Bruckler? Yes, sir, we are. Ms. Brady? Yes, sir. All right. Before I bring the jury in, I want to address the spectators in the courtroom. This is a public trial, and I want everyone to feel welcome and comfortable here. That is very important to me. However, you must observe proper courtroom decorum. I am sensitive to the fact that this case may evoke powerful emotions. I fully understand that. For that reason, I have not prohibited emotional reactions. To the contrary, in Order D-79, I recognized that some visible emotional reactions are inevitable and appropriate. What I have prohibited are audible comments and emotional outbursts that may improperly influence the jury. If at any time you feel the onset of an emotional outburst, please quietly and discreetly exit the courtroom. You may return to the courtroom when you're ready to do so in compliance with my order. For the most part, so far in this trial, there have been no issues from anyone in the gallery. I thank you for that, and I ask that you please continue to conduct yourselves as you've done throughout the proceedings. Please remember that it is my duty and responsibility to ensure that both sides receive a fair proceeding and to uphold the dignity of the court. All right, with that, let's go ahead and bring the jurors in, please. Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jury is back in the courtroom, uh, minus juror number 661. Uh, folks, I have allowed her to uh, watch the proceedings from another courtroom. Uh, she asked if she could do that so as not to disrupt the proceedings with her cough. So uh, I've, uh, I've given her um, the chance to do that, and so that's what's happening, all right? Okay, with that, as you know, members of the jury, the next step in the proceedings 
our closing uh, arguments, the prosecution goes first. Mr. Brockler, are you ready for the prosecution's closing argument? Yes, sir. You may proceed. Through this door is horror. Through this door are bullets, blood, brains, and bodies. Through this door, after more than two and a half months of complex, detailed planning, he came in to murder everyone and was successful in killing 12. You have been here for 15 weeks, 60 days of trial, 2,695 separate pieces of evidence, 306 witnesses, including 34 to tell you about every aspect of his life and 13 to give you a glimpse of the 12 lives he took. All of that leading to right now to determine what is the appropriate sentence for such horror, such evil. I'm going to object to the characterization of evil. You have deliberated three times. You have found unanimously, beyond a reasonable doubt, that he knew right from wrong, that he could form the intent to murder and deliberate on that murder, and you found that he murdered one, and right there with that one murder, the sentence is life imprisonment without parole. But you found more than that. You found that he'd murdered three, six, ten, twelve men, women, and a child. But you did more. The second time you deliberated, you found that in addition to killing more than two people in a single criminal episode, you found that he did it by virtue of ambush. And you found that beyond a reasonable doubt unanimously. You also found that his manner of murdering these 12 people was cruel torturous and you found that unanimously beyond a reasonable doubt you also found that in murdering these 12 people by ambush cruelly and torturously that he created a grave risk of death to all those others around those that he murdered and you found that unanimously beyond a reasonable doubt but you did more than that. You also listened to those 34 witnesses to give you every possible justification to impose the same sentence as an unaggravated murder of one, but unanimously, beyond a reasonable doubt, you found that the aggravation still outweighed all that. And then we had the last two days where you got to learn about the ramifications of his conduct far beyond the pictures that we'd seen, far beyond those who testified about the ones that they'd lost inside the theater. And so the question remains, what 
is the appropriate sentence for such horror, for such evil. Back again to the characterization of evil. Would counsel please approach for a moment? Proceed as we discussed. Thank you, sir. So the question remains, what is the appropriate sentence for such conduct? Is it that life sentence that goes to the unaggravated murder of one, or is it something more? You have considered so much. You have deliberated so much and found so much. It is difficult to stand here and think of how the words of attorneys 
can add anything to this process at this point. It is difficult to imagine what words could be spoken to you, what arguments could be advanced that would make a life sentence the appropriate sentence for what has happened here. Judge, I'm going to object to that. That's for the jury to decide. Overruled. The jury understands. It is the jury's decision. Go ahead, Mr. Brockler. Thank you, Your Honor. Can words be spoken to you in a passionate way that would justify a life sentence? To find a life sentence if there were tears, if there were pleading, could that make a life sentence appropriate for what he has done? Could someone argue to you, mercy, mercy, that mercy is about the giver, not the receiver? Could they play upon your conscience and your guilt and make a life sentence appropriate for what he's done? About emotion. Could emotion do it? The time for emotion, that time for tears, that time for passion. That is yesterday. This is about justice. And when the judge tells you to use your individual reasoned moral judgment, just like we discussed in jury selection, this is about justice. Could someone tell you that a decision to impose a death sentence for this horror, that that is only out of vengeance? or that it is an act of revenge on behalf of the victims. No. You know better than that. This building that we're in is not the Arapahoe County Eye for an Eye Center, or Revenge Center, or Vengeance Center. It is a justice center. And that is what you use to determine what the appropriate sentence for what he did is. Could a quote from someone, could uh, attacking the motives of the prosecution or of me, could these things justify imposing the same sentence for an unaggravated murder of one for what he did? There are few words I can give you to tell you more than you know already. You are experts in the facts. You are experts in, in a way, in mental health. And could that justify it now? Another mental illness argument? Having found beyond a reasonable doubt unanimously that he knew right from wrong, could intend and deliberate to murder, could conform his conduct to society's norms and all the things that you know that he did, considered in planning for this murder, could that now justify that life sentence? I'm going to object that the implication that their prior decisions somehow dictate what they should do now. That's contrary to the court's instruction. The objection is overruled, but the jury heard my instruction that your prior decisions do not dictate your decision um, here in the last phase of the sentencing hearing. Everybody understand that, right? And people are not in their head yet. So, all right, you may proceed. Yeah, I've said this to you before, but listen, don't, don't, don't ever go by what I tell you the law is. These are attorney words meant to try to couch for you terms about this evidence and this process, but always go with the law. The law that the judge gives you, not the attorneys. One of the things that you now get to consider that you didn't have at guilt, that you didn't have at phase one, and that you didn't have at phase two, in assessing the moral culpability for the crimes that he committed, are those victims, are the deceased, 
the ones from here. And no matter what can be said about any other piece of evidence, this is true. They did not pick him. He picked them. He picked the time, place, and manner of their deaths. And does he get a life sentence for that? When you look back on the last two days as you consider his moral culpability, what will you remember? What will stick out to you in your mind about Alex Sullivan? Is it that it was his birthday when he died? Is it the relationship that he had with his father? Is it that he was that guy that jumped up in the row and yelled out for the Superman trailer? Or is it War Eagle? A.J. Boyk, 18. What will you remember about A.J. Boyk? Is it that this photo was taken in the moments before he shot him to death? Is it the young love? Is it the fact that this skateboarding catcher was into ceramics and the viola and his life was ended right there in that seat by him? How about Jessica Gowie? Is it the future that was taken from her? A pretty young woman who wanted to be a hockey announcer from San Antonio. Is that it? Or is it Sandy Phillips? Will that be what you remember most about the person he murdered named Jessica Gowie? Gordon Cowden, at the movies with his two daughters, he doted on them. Sierra sat here and courageously tried to tell us about the impact of him and his loss on her life. What will you remember about Gordon? He wasn't the only parent, though, in that theater that night. How about Rebecca Wingo? The mother of two, those two young girls who happened to be out away on an adult night to see a movie when she died right there where she sat. Maybe it's Jonathan Blunk. Will you remember that Jonathan Blunk was the father of two and that he wanted them to be courageous and strong? Or will you remember that he died trying to protect the person sitting next to him when he shot him in the head? Alexander Teeves. Will you remember tiny Karen Teeves up here talking to you about the loss of her firstborn son? Or is it the story that they didn't know until his death that he had sat every day with a kid hurt in a car accident for two months. John Larimer, youngest of five, the one that got all the attention from mom. We remember his interest in serving his big dreams of being president? Or will you remember that he was the kind of man that inspired his friends at risk to themselves to try to drag his lifeless body out of that theater rather than leave him behind? Jesse Childress, world traveler, son to a beloved mother. Or is it that he loved the Broncos so much he subsisted on ramen 
to be able to afford those season tickets. Michaela Medic, the sister that is no more. Will you remember what her sister, her older sister said up here? Or is what sticks out in your mind about the nature of the murder he perpetrated that it was just a cruel twist of fate that had she stayed in those awful seats that her friends had found, she might be here today. But she thought she'd found with her friend two better seats. And he shot her in the head. Matt McQuinn, is it that he was a hardworking Target employee who couldn't find enough employment to keep him from going home to Ohio? Or is it that Mr. Wonderful is buried now? Or maybe you'll remember that he had more bullet holes in him. He shot him more than any other person in that theater. And Veronica Moser Sullivan. Forever six. Never made it to first grade. And a mother who sat here to tell you that she's lost. She doesn't know who she is anymore. That she used to be a mother when she was 18. Now she's not anymore. Four times. He shot her four times. Remember, too, in determining what is the appropriate sentence for what he did. That he came there for them all. The 700 rounds, the grave risk of death, and it wasn't sufficient to come prepared to shoot and to kill them, but to deprive them of the first responders that might have shown up to stop him or render aid. That moment, that picture's way too lit, but that moment when he stepped in with that tear gas and that gas mask and that 12-gauge shotgun, the 100-round drum clip in his assault rifle, the 40-round magazines on his person. And he stops pulling the trigger only because the trigger stopped working. Does that get a life sentence for that conduct? Remember, too, that he predicted a life sentence. Remember? I'm going to object to speculation, a statement of the evidence. Overrule. Before he goes out to murder, he changes two of those social websites, the match.com. Will you visit me in prison? And more than predict it, he planned for it. Head to toe, fingers included. There wasn't a millimeter of flesh exposed to any possible pain or injury. He made sure that on July 20th, one person and one person alone would be guaranteed to survive. And that was him for this. He predicted it. He planned for it. He wants it. Does this and everything else warrant a life sentence? That's not justice. That's not a reason, moral determination. On July 20th, 2012, 
he came into that theater to perpetrate a mass murder. And we were lucky. The tear gas canister he fumbled. The apartment that didn't explode. The weapon that jammed. The hero first responders. They kept these 12 pictures <coughs> from becoming hundreds of pictures. You remember, thank you, you remember that moment. Hello, 911, where is your emergency? Well, I can't hear you, what address? You can't get justice for them. They are beyond the reach of this court and the law. And so you should not go back there and think about how to get justice for them. But we can appreciate the gravity of the crime that took them from us and treat it appropriately. You cannot get justice for them, those that came here to tell you how they have become part of the living dead, where parts of their lives are forever gone. That the silver lining to getting up every day is that it is one day closer to being reunited with their loved ones. You cannot get them justice and you should not seek it. Bless you. But you can bring justice to this act and to him. And for James Egan Holmes, justice is death. It's death. Thank you, Mr. Bruckler. Ms. Brady. I will tell you one thing that Mr. Brockler is right about, and that is that I am going to be emotional and I am going to be passionate. Because the weight of a man's life is in my hands right now until I hand it over to you. And you know what it feels like to have the weight of someone's life in your hands. And that is a passionate an emotional thing and I will not apologize to you for standing here and being em emotional and passionate I will not there is one decision left to be made you all came here in January on your jury summons and it's now August and there is one final decision left to be made and that is life or death and that is not something to be taken lightly the law breaks this sentencing up into three phases because they want you in phase one to think about the aggravation to think about the crime and that is about the crime and they have phase two which is mitigation, because they want you to think about the background and character and mental illness. Phase two is about Mr. Holmes. But when you get to phase three, when you get to the individual moral determination, that, folks, becomes about you. What do you do? What is in your heart and your soul and your mind. And the question presented at this phase three is no longer a comparative question. It is no longer a balancing like you did in phase two when you balanced mitigation and aggravation. The question in phase three is not comparative. It is final and it is an absolute question. Does James Holmes 
suffer the most harsh and severe punishment that our country, that our state allows execution? Or does he spend the rest of his life in prison without parole? Before I go on anymore, I want to acknowledge and I want to pay respects to the victims in that theater, both the ones who died and the ones who were injured and everyone in that theater, and to their family members who came here and testified this week. This week's testimony was very hard to hear. We are, the people who died in that theater were, were loved so intensely by the people who came in and testified. That was so clear. And our hearts, all of our hearts break at the loss of their loved ones. And it hurts us to watch their family and friends hurt. For we are all human in this room. And we all have people we love in our lives. And no matter how hard we try, we can't avoid imagining what it must be like to be in their shoes. And it breaks our heart. It's impossible not to feel the emotion and the, the passion and often the anger that comes with hearing this type of testimony. The people in that theater did not deserve to die that way. They should not have died that way. They were just some people out on a summer night to see the new Batman movie. That's it. But now what? Now what? No one at this table has spent a minute trying to convince you that James Holmes did not do that shooting in the theater. And no one at this table for a minute has tried to say that the people who were in that theater were anything other than blameless innocent people out to watch a movie. But the point of disagreement in this trial is the same today as it was on day one, mental illness. And whether execution is the proper response when mental illness overtakes a young man and tragedy results. By this point, you either believe he is mentally ill or you don't. And that is different from saying whether he is sane or insane, and you know that all too well. But at this point, you either believe he's mentally ill or you don't. How many doctors should we bring in to tell you that he's seriously mentally ill? How many doctors from how far across the United States and how many different specialties do we need to bring you to convince you that he's seriously mentally ill? Two, five, ten? Because you've heard from Dr. Fenton and Dr. Feinstein from the university, and they saw Mr. Holmes before July 20th. They saw him from March to June of 2012. And they told you that they were worried he was on the verge of a psychotic break. And they wanted to give him antipsychotics because they were worried that he was becoming psychotic. You heard testimony from Dr. Woodcock, who, yes, the defense contacted and asked to go in within days of the shooting. And he told you that in his opinion, Mr. Holmes suffered from a schizophrenia spectrum disorder, and that he was psychotic. Dr. Gurr, with all of her expertise and training and background and experience in schizophrenia, testified that she thought 
He is schizophrenic, psychotic, and that but for that illness, the shooting would never have occurred. Dr. Uh, Hanlon did the neuropsychological testing and told you that all of the results of all of the instruments he did were consistent with someone suffering from schizophrenia, consistent with someone who was psychotic. And the doctors that the, the judge appointed through the Colorado Mental Health Institute in Pueblo, Dr. Reed from Texas, Dr. Metzner from here in Colorado, you heard from him twice. And they came in and told you that it is their expert opinion that he suffers from a schizophrenia spectrum disorder, that he is psychotic and that he is seriously mentally ill. And but for that mental illness, this never would have occurred and the doctors from the state hospital, and the doctors from Denver Health, and all of the doctors who saw him wherever it was and whenever it was, all unanimously agreed that he is seriously mentally ill. And so if at this point you do not believe he's mentally ill, then you have chosen to ignore that mound of evidence that proves he was. And efforts have been made to mock and demean and deny that he is mentally ill. To make him out to seem hateful and evil and selfish. Because you have to dehumanize someone before you can ask other people to kill him. It is easier to ask you to kill a monster than it is a sick human being. It is medieval to claim that schizophrenia is the source of evil. And that demeans all people who suffer from mental illness and it demeans us all. And if you do, at this point, believe that he's mentally ill, if you do believe that mound of uncontested evidence of mental illness, if you do believe that, then the time has come to ask yourself, do I sign my name on the death warrant of a mentally ill person? Death is not a punishment for mental illness. And death is not a cure or a solution for mental illness. And the death of a seriously mentally ill man is not justice, no matter how tragic the case is. The death penalty will not make mental illness go away. And although not all people who have psychosis commit tragic crimes and take innocent lives, when the disease consumes and controls a person in the way it did with Mr. Holmes, the results are often what we see here. Each of us has to honestly ask, say to ourselves, there but for the grace of God go I or go my child. Why did he get schizophrenia? Why didn't I get schizophrenia? Why don't you have schizophrenia? Is it because he was born with the genetics predetermined for him to get schizophrenia? Was it because he inherited it from the, the people who came before him and his family? Is it because it strikes like lightning or it's like getting a cancer? It's just a random occurrence that he got it and I didn't and you didn't? And if you would not wish schizophrenia on your worst enemy, then what logic dictates that the son of Bob and Arlene Holmes should suffer execution for it? There are things in addition to mental illness 
that should lead you to conclude that a life sentence is appropriate in this case. For the 24 years, 24 to 25 years prior to July 20th, James Holmes had absolutely no criminal history at all. He never broke the law but for a couple traffic tickets. He never broke the law. He never broke rules. He never was even disrespectful or rude. He lived 24 to 25 years in complete compliance with all of the rules and all of the laws of all of us until out of the blue, the mental illness struck and all of a sudden he has red hair and stuff in his apartment and he's buying all this stuff and he's planning this mission because of the mental illness. But you can appreciate that prior to that, he had never hurt anyone, he had never broken the law. He is not someone who has spent his life hurting people or getting in trouble. Or you can appreciate the upbringing that he had from Bob and Arlene Holmes and how they raised him and what kind of son they raised prior to the time the illness struck. And those are also reasons to consider a life sentence for him. You jurors were chosen for this case because you told us that the enormity and the magnitude of this case would not automatically draw the death penalty for you. And you were chosen for this case because you said that you would give meaningful consideration to the mitigation, especially mental health mitigation, that you would meaningfully consider that as a reason for a life sentence. And you were chosen for this case because you all said that, yes, I will listen to and respect victim impact evidence, but that will not be the driving force. It will be a consideration, but not the driving force of my dis sentencing decision in this case. And it is very natural when we hear evidence like that, testimony like that, to feel anger and uh, emotion and passion. But what the law asks you to do and what we ask you to do is to not make that decision when you're in an emotional state. How many times in our lives do we make decisions uh, rashly when we're angry or emotional and we, we look back and think, oh, I shouldn't have done that? How many times do we hesitate before we hit send on an email because we want to make sure we're not overreacting to something? We want to take a step aside. We want to sleep on it for a while. Let me think about that for a while because we've learned not to make decisions in an emotional state. And what we ask you to do in this case is to take a step aside the emotion and the passion, to sleep on it, to think about it, to rise above all of this tragedy so that you have some perspective in making this decision. For this will be the most important decision you may ever make in your life. And it needs to be one that you can live with. Right now, you have the opportunity to be the example of anger without vengeance, sadness without hate, justice without violence. And you have the opportunity right now to give accountability with mercy, compassion with understanding, and resolution with no more death. For the death penalty does not bring anyone back. It doesn't make anyone feel better. It just adds to the death count. Once you make this decision, you can't come back on some other day and say that you've changed your mind. You can't come back later and say, I've given this some more thought and I've changed my mind. Now is the only chance, and now is the final chance. 
And when it's all said and done, you go home only with yourself. When you wake up in the middle of the night and you think about this case, it's just you and you answer only to you. And when you look yourself in the mirror in the morning and you think about this case, it's just you and you just answer to you. For we will not be there and they will not be there. It is just you and you answer only to your own conscience. And don't make this decision out of concern for what the community or other people are gonna think about you. Because you know that you need to do what's right, even when it's hard, even when it's unpopular. And if a life sentence is something that's right for you, then you need to do what's right. What will you think about your decision five years from now, 10 years from now? What do you want to tell your children and your grandchildren about this moment? And I am going to talk to you about mercy because the judge read you an instruction that says you may consider mercy for Mr. Holmes in determining what the appropriate sentence is. The measure of our soul is in how we treat people who are sick and who are damaged. And James Holmes is sick and he is damaged. And if you choose to grant mercy, to bestow mercy on James Holmes, it's not because he earned it. It's not because he deserves it. For mercy is not something that's earned or deserved. It's something that is bestowed by the person who gives it. Mercy says more about you than it says about him. What you do here says more about you if you choose to exercise mercy, not about him. It is something you choose to do, what you do in this moment. Justice without mercy is raw vengeance. Mercy is what makes us civilized. And mercy is what puts an end to violence. And just as James Holmes did not ask to have a mental illness, neither did his parents ask to have a son with mental illness. And Bob and Arlene Holmes have been here during this trial every day to love and support their son. And that they will always love and support their son for the rest of his life. And they know that he is sick and they know that he would not have committed this unthinkable, tragic occurrence had he not been sick. But he is, and he is their son, and he is still Chrissy's brother, and his life has meaning to them. There was a time when our country would execute children for crimes they committed, and that is no longer done because we... Yes.
the objection is sustained. There is not now, nor will there ever be, a time when it is appropriate to execute a seriously mentally ill man. For we need to open our eyes to the effects of mental illness. And it will not go away just because we don't like it and just because we try and get rid of it. Justice. Justice requires that each of you be just in your own mind and in your own heart. And justice cannot be for one side alone. There has to be justice for all. And there is justice in mercy. And we ask that you accept the truth that all of us as human beings are all more and better than our own worst deeds. And that our peace and humanity abide not in our capacity for fear and hatred and revenge, but it resides in our capacity to be compassionate and understanding and merciful. Before, during, and after July 20th of 2012, he was seriously mentally ill, and this tragedy was born of disease, not of choice. And we do not execute someone for getting sick. The law never requires a death sentence, not in this case, not in any case, not in the worst case you can imagine, because the law tells you that this is a moral decision, and only you can decide what is right for you morally. Other moral decisions we make in our lives, what religion to practice, if to have a religion at all, whom to marry, how to raise our children. And no one can rightly tell you that your moral decisions in those areas are wrong. That would not be right. And just like that, no one can tell you what is right for you. Not the prosecution, not the defense. That is up to you because is it your individual moral determination. This is your moral assessment. And the law says that only if all 12 of you think that death is the only appropriate sentence will it be the death penalty. And it will be the death penalty if it's all 12. But if even one of you thinks that a life sentence is appropriate or that you don't want to sign your name to a death sentence, if only one of you, then the law says it will be a life sentence because the law does not want to put any one person in the position of being responsible for the death of someone that is not that person's choice. Life without parole in prison is a very severe and harsh sentence. To spend the rest of your life in a cell, alone, especially when you're as sick as Mr. Holmes is, that is a severe punishment. He will be punished one way or the other. And his mental illness does not shield him from punishment. Nothing at this point can shield him from punishment. He will be punished. And the mental illness we presented to you is to, to have you assess his moral culpability. And you might ask, who could be more morally culpable? Who could be more culpable? Maybe someone who committed this crime who was not mentally ill. Maybe someone who committed this kind of crime for fun or for pleasure or for no reason at all. But that is not James Holmes. James Holmes committed this crime because he was psychotic and delusional. And that is what makes him less morally culpable. And he tried to get help. It was unsuccessful, but he tried to get help. When he went to see Dr. Fenton, it was his soul screaming for help while his mind was drowning in illness. 
but he tried. He knew he was losing control and he tried. And we're not blaming anyone at CU or blaming the school or the hospital. This evidence was presented to you so that you would know the whole truth of what happened to James Holmes in the spring of 2012. This is a moral decision that you're being asked to make. And morals are so personal. Groups don't make morals, individuals do. And as soon as you have decided that for you, you need to stand up for what you believe is right because someone's life is in the balance. And once you make the decision that a life sentence would be appropriate for James Holmes, once you have given that calm reflection and thought about everything that has been presented and listened to everything that your other jurors may have wanted to share with you, after you have done all that and you are certain in your heart that a life sentence will be appropriate in this case, I want you to tell the foreman that you've made your decision. And again, he might agree with you, or he might feel differently, but he will respect your decision, and he will bring that decision back into this courtroom. The deaths of all of those people cannot be answered by another death. Please, no more death. He will be punished. He will be punished severely. And he will be punished for the rest of his life. Thank you, Ms. Brady. Would counsel please approach? Mr. Brockler, is there a rebuttal closing argument at this time on behalf of the prosecution? No, Your Honor. All right. Uh, members of the jury, um, because there is no more rebuttal, that means we've come to the end of the proceedings, and the only thing that's left is your deliberations. Um, so let me uh, give you a few final instructions. Before I do that, though, I want to follow up uh, on an objection that was made earlier. Uh, that I overruled, and I gave you a summarized version off the top of my head of one of a portion of one of the instructions that you have with you. And so let me uh, read for you. Uh, this is from instruction number four, and it is as follows. Even if you are convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that the mitigating factors that exist do not outweigh the proven aggravating factors, you must still individually make a profoundly moral assessment or evaluation of the defendant's character and his crimes of murder in the first degree in order to determine whether or not you are convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that death is the appropriate sentence. Phase three is separate and distinct from phase two. I'm not uh, emphasizing this instruction over the others. You have to consider all of the instructions as a whole. I'm simply following up because there was an objection that I overruled and I wanna make sure that you're clear that your decisions in um, these proceedings before today do not govern uh, or dictate what decisions you make now. Does that make sense? Everybody understand that? And everyone's not in their head yet. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, you're familiar now with the drill when it comes to deliberations, but I'm gonna go over a few things with you just in case. First of all, only the 12 of you who are deliberating jurors will deliberate and you will deliberate in the jury room here behind courtroom 201, the 201 jury room. Uh, those of you who are alternates will be keep, 
uh, will be kept separate and will not have any contact with the deliberating jurors. Uh, those of you who are alternates are not allowed to uh, start forming opinions or to think about the case or to deliberate in any way. Uh, and all of the advisements that I have been giving you throughout the trial apply to the alternates. Um, those of you who are alternates um, should not be looking at the instructions or the verdict forms or anything like that. You can talk about other things with one another, but uh, nothing related to the case or related to your juror service. There are no limits on the time that deliberations take. They can take as little or as long as the deliberating jurors decide. In terms of scheduling, you're on your own. I know that in the past you've said your deliberations will be from 8.30 to 4.30, and we will proceed with that understanding. If you change your mind at some point, just let us know so that we can coordinate with the alternates. We will send back to the jury room the original instructions and the original verdict forms. Additionally, we will send back to the jury room the exhibits that have been admitted, all of the exhibits that have been admitted with the exception of live ammunition. And again, you know the rule, if you want the live ammunition, we'll take back the firearms from you and give you the live ammunition. Um, please uh, do not consult any previous instructions uh, that I have given you. Uh, I know that uh, I gave you some instructions at the end of the trial uh, and you deliberated at that point. I gave you some instructions at the end of phase one and you deliberated at that point. And I gave you some instructions at the end of phase two and you deliberated at that point. Do not go back and read those prior instructions or consult those instructions. The instructions that I'm giving you now are the instructions in their entirety. Those are the ones that you should rely on. Does everyone understand all of that? And then finally, just a reminder that there will be a three hour delay between the time when you deliberating jurors communicate to my bailiffs that you have completed uh, the sentencing, the final sentencing verdict forms and the time when I bring you into the courtroom and I announce um, the contents of those uh, sentencing verdict forms. All right, so please plan accordingly. All right, folks, with that, I'm going to go ahead and allow you to retire to the jury room. Those of you who are deliberating can start deliberating. Uh, the rest of you who are alternates will put you in a separate room. Thank you. Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect the jury has exited the courtroom. Let me supplement the record with respect to my ruling and the objection by the defense to Mr. Brockler's use of the word evil uh, to describe. Some of the defendants acts, but not the defendant. Uh, this is from People versus Nicholas. 842 Northeastern 2nd, 674, a case from 2005. Uh, this is a case from Illinois, um, and uh, it was modified on denial of rehearing on January 23, 2006. The court spoke as follows. A closing argument must serve a purpose beyond inflaming the emotions of the jury. We recently re-emphasized that a prosecutor may not characterize the defendant as an evil person or cast the jury's decision as a choice between good and evil. But a prosecutor may comment unfavorably on the evil effects of the crime and urge the jury to administer the law without fear when such argument is based upon competent and pertinent evidence. Pure evil as used by the prosecutor here, refer to specific actions by the defendant, getting his gun, hunting his mother in the street, 
pointing the gun at her, shooting her four times, stashing his gun, returning to bed, and displaying little concern about her death. The prosecutor characterized the defendant's actions as pure evil in order to preface his argument that the facts prove the defendant guilty. The prosecutor's remarks constituted a permissible comment upon the evidence. Uh, I found another case. This is State versus McFadden, uh, 391 Southwestern 3rd, 408. This is a case from the Missouri Supreme Court from 2013, and this is actually a death penalty case, and it relates to the prosecutor's closing argument during the penalty phase of the case. The court spoke, spoke as follows. The defendant asserts that the prosecutor improperly referred to him as an evil person while referring to um, the victim as a good person. I believe it was the victim. A prosecutor is free to characterize a defendant's criminal conduct if the evidence supports such a characterization. The evidence in this case supports the prosecutor's characterization. The argument was not improper. Because in this case, um, Mr. Brockler's comments were not referring to the defendant as being an evil person, but were referring to the defendant's acts as being evil acts. And because that argument was based on the evidence, I overruled the objection, and I stand by that ruling, but I wanted to supplement the record. Is there anything else at this time on behalf of the people that we need to talk about, Mr. Brockler? No, sir. Thank you. Is there anything else on behalf of the defense? All right, we'll call you if we uh, have any questions or any requests or if the jury notifies us that they have completed the uh, sentencing verdict forms. All right, the court will be in recess. Thank you, everyone. Do you need us to stay in the building or can we go? Same rules as before, within about 15 minutes. Well, good afternoon. Certainly something that we did not expect, and that's why it took us a moment here to react. George Brockler not having a rebuttal as a result. The defense team, the public defenders, do not have a rebuttal. The jury now has this ultimate decision, life or death, for the gunman, the convicted gunman, the killer of 12 who injured and maimed 70 others. It is now up to the jury to decide, should he be put to death or should he be locked away for the remainder of his life. Uh, at this point in time, we are working to get our legal analyst, Dan Recht, on the line for us. He'll be joining us momentarily. Certainly, he told us to expect rebuttals, to expect everyone to use all of the time that they were given, all, all of the attorneys, that is. And so certainly, we are all um, taken aback and surprised by this change in the decision process. Um, well, at this point in time, Andrew is working to dial the signal in right now. Um, if you, you, you'll bear with me for a second. Andrew? Andrew? I, I see what the problem is. Okay. Sorry, folks. I, I do apologize. Um, and Dan, I know you can hear me on the line here. Uh, Andrew, the lock is on. That's what that light on the bottom right is. If you turn the lock off, 
now you'll be able to switch your router. There you go. Okay, so now that we've got that, we do apologize that we have a safety system so we don't mess it up during the court signal itself and uh, we forgot to, to turn that off. But now, Dan Recht on the line to join us to talk about what he heard during these closing arguments. Uh, I think we've asked you this three, this is the fourth time now, Dan. How did they do and was there anything in there unexpected for you? Yeah, like you said, I, I, I admit I was wrong and it comes as a big surprise to me that the prosecution would not exercise their right to rebuttal. Um, I think that might be because they didn't want to give the defense an opportunity to have a rebuttal thereafter. And they might have caught the defense off guard. The defense might have been saving um, their uh, a powerful argument for their rebuttal, but when the prosecution said they have no rebuttal, then the defense has no ability to exercise a rebuttal because theirs is a rebuttal to the prosecution's rebuttal, which didn't happen. So um, that's the best I can tell you. It's um, unusual to me, it's interesting to me, and it's the reason we're done so early. Dan, do we think then uh, that they did well enough that either side um, is comfortable, or do you think that the defense uh, perhaps was hoping for a, a rebuttal? I think the defense anticipated having a rebuttal, but nevertheless, um, I would guess that they're happy with Tamara Brady's um, emotional uh, but in my mind, persuasive um, argument. George Brockler did a very nice argument as well. Let's start with the defense. I mean, Tamara Brady um, hammered on several different themes, but the one that might have uh, um, caught the attention of uh, the jury and hadn't been discussed in the last six months in front of this jury or during the trial is the notion of mercy that the, the law allows it. The judge talked about it in his instructions. The jury can decide independent, as Tamara Brady said, of what they think um, James Holmes deserves, um, th that mercy is justice and uh, they um, don't want to see him executed, not because they like him, but because they're going to exercise the kind of mercy, as Tamara Brady said, um, that civilized people do. On the other hand, uh, um, George Brockler um, gave an emotional uh, and well thought out closing as well, and he sort of turned um, the tables in a sense and was saying um, to the jury, why wouldn't you, what is persuasive here, why wouldn't you impose um, the death penalty, which was interesting, and frankly I was, um, Surprised he got away with it because uh, your viewers should keep in mind the, pros the prosecution's uh, or the burden is on the prosecution here. They actually have to, uh, and the instructions say this, um, prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the death penalty is the appropriate um, verdict. Um, and did they do that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it was, um, as I said, uh, an effective closing. As was the defense, though. I must say, these were two very skillful lawyers arguing skillfully uh, their positions on the ultimate issue in our whole justice system. I guess, uh, Dan, I'm, I'm running in circles in my head here. I, I just am so, I, I, we did not expect at all to be talking to you this early in the day. As you well know, we, we had planned to talk to you an hour and a half from now, expecting this to continue on. Knowing how fast this jury goes, uh, yes. are we expecting anything uh, today? Should we expect another very quick verdict or something even as early as tomorrow, mor uh, tomorrow morning would still be a very fast verdict for something of this magnitude? Is that um, is a short time frame, the time frame that you expect as well? I don't. <laughs> you know, I... Um I, I was um, wrong about the rebuttals, and I could be wrong about this, but in my mind, this phase three is a much more difficult phase for a jury, and um, 
Tamaria Brady emphasized what the law emphasizes, and that at this point, it's individual moral decisions of each juror. And so the likelihood of division between those jurors, the likelihood of a holdout, the likelihood of not getting a unanimous verdict, at least not initially, um, I think is, is quite high. Um, and that means for prolonged deliberations. So uh, it, as I've said before, um, you know, when you try to anticipate what a jury is going to do, it's sort of like reading tea leaves, and uh, it's, it's about as predictable. Um, but I would say th that this will not, there will not be a verdict today. I just can't even imagine that. And there could be a verdict tomorrow. Um, we've talked about the following before, but it applies here. And that is, if you statistically looked at verdicts in jury trial cases with uncanny um, frequency, there are jury verdicts on late on Friday afternoons. So juries um, like to not have to deal with it over the weekend, um, seemingly, at least statistically, try hard to get things resolved before the weekend. And so um, if pressed, I would say um, it's possible we'll have a jury verdict on Friday afternoon. But again, um, one never knows. Cer certainly nothing, um, and, and we appreciate you trying to play um, the, the genie for us, trying to figure it out, play the wizard, and certainly I think uh, in your gift <laughs> basket at the end of this process for all the help you've given us, there will be some tea leaves for you to continue reading. But Dan, let me ask you this last question um, before we put things on standby and wait for whenever that announcement comes from the jury. Uh, but it's the same question that I'm going to ask in our chat rooms in just a moment. Was there any line or any quote um, or, or any thought from either side that sticks out to you as the key argument, the linchpin in what we heard today? Yeah, I would have to say, um, and I'm looking at my notes, you can tell, um, that from the, um, from the defense perspective, there were a few quotes that stick out in my mind. And Tamara Brady at one point said, um, what's appropriate is, quote, justice without violence, quote, meaning um, don't execute them because that's a violent act. Uh, justice is life in prison without parole. And then, as I said earlier, um, a few minutes ago, her emphasis on um, mercy and exercising mercy stands out for me. Um, for the prosecution, what stands out is, and I alluded to this a few minutes ago, but Brockler saying, um, um, what makes this case even considered something other than an, uh, uh, a death penalty case? Uh, why would you simply give him life in prison the way uh, people get life in prison when they've only, ex when they've only killed one person? So um, I, th I think Brockler uh, was uh, pretty effective or, or persuasive there. And the defense, I believe, was persuasive in their emotional um, pitch because it is emotional. I mean, they stressed mercy, moral decision, individual uh, decision. And, um, I, you know, uh, I, I, I would guess um, a juror or two or more will have heard that. Well, uh, thank you so much, Dan, and, and for playing that game with me. Uh, I, live, I live my life in quotes uh, from one to the next, from one story to the next, and so uh, that's certainly the way I think of things, and that's um, interesting that you picked up on many of the same things that I did. So I think I must have learned something from you and your colleagues. And again, uh, just to take a moment to say thank you to all of you um, and I know the next time we'll be talking is after the announcement that a verdict is reached. And I know we'll have you here in person when that happens. So we thank you in advance. And we'll talk to you again soon, Dan. Thank you. Uh, thank you. All right. Folks, in the meantime, let me give you one more rundown once again of our plan uh, as we wait now for the jury to reach a verdict. Because of the possibility of jury questions, uh, things that we'll only get 
10 or 15 minutes warning for. We will continue this stream. What we'll do is we'll replay, we will loop the closing arguments once again. Andrew is getting those queued up right at this moment. Once those are um, rolling, we're going to go back and get things ready, lined up for uh, the possibility that the verdict will be another day, right? So we're going to build placeholders on YouTube, placeholders with Scribble Live, get our website all geared up so we're ready to go so that once something is announced, once a verdict is announced, we will be able to bring that to you. Uh, of course, live, we'll start our coverage the moment we get the opportunity, the moment we get that word. In the meantime, uh, take the opportunity, please sign up for your 7 News app. Make sure your, your alerts are turned on, uh, specifically the breaking news alerts. Make sure that you've signed up for our breaking news emails. That is how we will get the word out. Um, also on Twitter, at Denver Channel, we'll get the word out when there's a question or a verdict. We'll tell you where to go to watch it, and, and that's how we'll get in touch with you to let you know. Uh, in the meantime, I, I just want to take one last moment and um, uh, give a shout out to the, the remarkable group of people we have here who um, it, have brought you this coverage now for 63 days of work and 60 days of testimony and coverage dating back to July 20th of 2012 when this tragedy happened right in our own backyard. Uh, they've all worked tirelessly, very long hours, uh, and I just want to say thank you to all of them and for everyone um, working above us who made this kind of coverage opportunity possible. I do think it's important for all of us and for all of you. Uh, I'd like to say thank you for being with us and for chatting so many of you for so long, day after day. Uh, this community has been very important to our coverage. It's certainly been key to our understanding uh, and our understanding of what's important to ask about, to teach about, to learn about alongside you. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, at this point in time, we are going to loop those arguments again, the arguments that lasted nowhere near as long as any of us expected. Um, and uh, we will remain on standby for whenever a verdict is reached. Uh, but until then, uh, be safe and well, and we'll talk to you soon. Through this door is horror. Through this door are bullets, blood, brains, and bodies. Through this door, after more than two and a half months of complex, detailed planning, he came in to murder everyone and was successful in killing 12. You have been here for 15 weeks, 60 days of trial. 2,695 separate pieces of evidence. 306 witnesses, including 34, to tell you about every aspect of his life, and 13 to give you a glimpse of the 12 lives he took. All of that leading to right now to determine what is the appropriate sentence for such horror, such evil. I'm going to object to the characterization of evil. Oh, overall. You have deliberated three times. You have found unanimously, beyond a reasonable doubt, that he knew right from wrong, that he could form the intent to murder and deliberate on that murder. And you found that he murdered one. And right there with that one murder, the sentence is life imprisonment without parole. But you found more than that. You found that he'd murdered three. Six, ten, twelve men, women, and a child. But you did more. 
the second time you deliberated, you found that in addition to killing more than two people in a single criminal episode, you found that he did it by virtue of ambush. And you found that beyond a reasonable doubt unanimously. You also found that his manner of murdering these 12 people was cruel and torturous. And you found that unanimously beyond a reasonable doubt. You also found that in murdering these 12 people by ambush, cruelly and torturously, that he created a grave risk of death to all those others around those that he murdered. And you found that unanimously beyond a reasonable doubt. But you did more than that. You also listened to those 34 witnesses to give you every possible justification to impose the same sentence as an unaggravated murder of one, but unanimously, beyond a reasonable doubt, you found that the aggravation still outweighed all that. And then we had the last two days where you got to learn about the ramifications of his conduct far beyond the pictures that we'd seen, far beyond those who testified about the ones that they'd lost inside the theater. And so the question remains, what is the appropriate sentence for such horror, for such evil? Correct again to the characterization of evil. So the question remains, what is the appropriate sentence for such conduct? Is it that life sentence that goes to the unaggravated murder of one? Or is it something more? You have considered so much. You have deliberated so much and found so much, it is difficult to stand here and think of how the words of attorneys can add anything to this process at this point. It is difficult to imagine what words could be spoken to you, what arguments could be advanced that would make a life sentence the appropriate sentence for what has happened here. Judge, I'm going to object to that. That's for the jury to decide. Overruled. The jury understands. It is the jury's decision. Go ahead, Mr. Brockler. Thank you, Your Honor. Can words be spoken to you in a passionate way that would justify a life sentence? To find a life sentence if there were tears, if there were pleading, could that make a life sentence appropriate for what he has done. Could someone argue to you, mercy, mercy, that mercy is about the giver, not the receiver. Could they play upon your conscience and your guilt and make a life sentence appropriate for what he's done? About emotion. Could emotion do it? The time for emotion, that time for tears, that time for passion, that is yesterday. This is about justice. And when the judge tells you to use your individual reasoned moral judgment, just like we discussed in jury selection, this is about justice. Could someone tell you that a decision to impose a death sentence for this horror, that that is only out of vengeance, or that it is an act of revenge on behalf of the victims? No. You know better than that. 
This building that we're in is not the Arapahoe County Eye for an Eye Center or Revenge Center or Vengeance Center. It is a justice center. And that is what you use to determine what the appropriate sentence for what he did is. Could a quote from someone, could uh, attacking the motives of the prosecution or of me, could these things justify imposing the same sentence for an unaggravated murder of one for what he did? There are few words I can give you to tell you more than you know already. You are experts in the facts. You are experts in, in a way, in mental health. And could that justify it now? Another mental illness argument? Having found beyond a reasonable doubt unanimously that he knew right from wrong, could intend and deliberate to murder, could conform his conduct to society's norms and all the things that you know that he did considered in planning for this murder. Could that now justify that life sentence? And I'm going to object that the implication that their prior decisions somehow dictate what they should do now. That's contrary to the court's instruction. The objection is overruled, but the jury heard my instruction that your prior decisions do not dictate your decision um, here in the last phase of the sentencing hearing. Everybody understand that, right? And people are not in their head yes. All right, you may proceed. Yeah, I've said this to you before, but listen, don't, don't, don't ever go by what I tell you the law is. These are attorney words meant to try to couch for you terms about this evidence and this process, but always go with the law. The law that the judge gives you, not the attorneys. One of the things that you now get to consider that you didn't have at guilt, that you didn't have at phase one, and that you didn't have at phase two, in assessing the moral culpability for the crimes that he committed, are those victims or the deceased? the ones from here. And no matter what can be said about any other piece of evidence, this is true. They did not pick him. He picked them. He picked the time, place, and manner of their deaths. And does he get a life sentence for that? When you look back on the last two days as you consider his moral culpability, what will you remember? What will stick out to you in your mind about Alex Sullivan? Is it that it was his birthday when he died? Is it the relationship? that he had with his father? Is it that he was that guy that jumped up in the row and yelled out for the Superman trailer? Or is it War Eagle? A.J. Boyk, 18. What will you remember about A.J. Boyk? Is it that this photo was taken in the moments before he shot him to death? Is it the young love? Is it the fact that this skateboarding catcher was into ceramics and the viola and his life was ended right there in that seat by him? How about Jessica Gowie? Is it the future that was taken from her? A pretty young woman who wanted to be 
a hockey announcer from San Antonio. Is that it? Or is it Sandy Phillips? Will that be what you remember most about the person he murdered named Jessica Gowie? Gordon Cowden. At the movies with his two daughters. He doted on them. Sierra sat here and courageously tried to tell us about the impact of him and his loss on her life. What will you remember about Gordon? He wasn't the only parent, though, in that theater that night. How about Rebecca Wingo? The mother of two, those two young girls who happened to be out away on an adult night to see a movie when she died right there where she sat. Maybe it's Jonathan Blunk. Will you remember that Jonathan Blunk was the father of two and that he wanted them to be courageous and strong? Or will you remember that he died trying to protect the person sitting next to him when he shot him in the head? Alexander Teeds. Will you remember tiny Karen Teeves up here talking to you about the loss of her firstborn son? Or is it the story that they didn't know until his death that he had sat every day with a kid hurt in a car accident for two months? John Larimer, youngest of five, the one that got all the attention from mom. We remember his interest in serving, his big dreams of being president. Or will you remember that he was the kind of man that inspired his friends at risk to themselves to try to drag his lifeless body out of that theater rather than leave him behind Jesse Childress, world traveler, son to a beloved mother. Or is it that he loved the Broncos so much he subsisted on ramen to be able to afford those season tickets? Michaela Medic, the sister that is no more. Will you remember what her sister, her older sister said up here? Or is what sticks out in your mind about the nature of the murder he perpetrated that it was just a cruel twist of fate that had she stayed in those awful seats that her friends had found, she might be here today. But she thought she'd found with her friend two better seats. And he shot her in the head. Matt McQuinn, is it that he was a hardworking Target employee who couldn't find enough employment to keep him from going home to Ohio? Or is it that Mr. Wonderful is buried now? Or maybe you'll remember that he had more bullet holes in him. He shot him more than any other person in that theater. And Veronica Mosier Sullivan. Forever six. Never made it to first grade. And a mother who sat here to tell you that she's lost. She doesn't know who she is anymore. That she used to be a mother when she was 18. Now she's not anymore. Four times. He shot her four times. Remember, too, in determining what is the appropriate sentence 
for what he did. That he came there for them all. The 700 rounds, the grave risk of death. And it wasn't sufficient to come prepared to shoot and to kill them, but to deprive them of the first responders that might have shown up to stop him or render aid. That moment, that picture's way too lit, but that moment when he stepped in with that tear gas and that gas mask and that 12-gauge shotgun, the 100-round drum clip in his assault rifle, the 40-round magazines on his person, and he stops pulling the trigger only because the trigger stopped working. Does that get a life sentence for that conduct? Remember, too, that he predicted a life sentence. Remember? I'm going to object to speculation, his statement of the evidence. Overrule. Before he goes out to murder, he changes two of those social websites, the match.com, will you visit me in prison? And more than predict it, he planned for it. Head to toe, fingers included. There wasn't a millimeter of flesh exposed to any possible pain or injury. He made sure that on July 20th, one person and one person alone would be guaranteed to survive. And that was him for this. He predicted it. He planned for it. He wants it. Does this and everything else warrant a life sentence. That's not justice. That's not a reasoned moral determination.
you do not believe he's mentally ill, then you have chosen to ignore that mound of evidence that proves he was. And efforts have been made to mock and demean and deny that he is mentally ill. To make him out to seem hateful and evil and selfish because you have to dehumanize someone before you can ask other people to kill him. It is easier to ask you to kill a monster than it is a sick human being. It is medieval to claim that schizophrenia is the source of evil. And that demeans all people who suffer from mental illness, and it demeans us all. And if you do, at this point, believe that he's mentally ill, if you do believe that mound of uncontested evidence of mental illness, if you do believe that, then the time has come to ask yourself, do I sign my name on the death warrant of a mentally ill person? Death is not a punishment for mental illness. And death is not a cure or a solution for mental illness. And the death of a seriously mentally ill man is not justice, no matter how tragic the case is. The death penalty will not make mental illness go away. And although not all people who have psychosis commit tragic crimes and take innocent lives, when the disease consumes and controls a person in the way it did with Mr. Holmes, the results are often what we see here. Each of us has to honestly ask, say to ourselves, there but for the grace of God go I or go my child. Why did he get schizophrenia? Why didn't I get schizophrenia? Why don't you have schizophrenia? Is it because he was born with the genetics predetermined for him to get schizophrenia? Was it because he inherited it from the, the people who came before him and his family? Is it because it strikes like lightning or it's like getting a cancer? It's just a random occurrence that he got it and I didn't and you didn't? And if you would not wish schizophrenia on your worst enemy, then what logic dictates that the son of Bob and Arlene Holmes should suffer execution for it? There are things in addition to mental illness that should lead you to conclude that a life sentence is appropriate in this case. For the 24 years, 24 to 25 years prior to July 20th, James Holmes had absolutely no criminal history at all. He never broke the law but for a couple traffic tickets. He never broke the law. He never broke rules. He never was even disrespectful or rude. He lived 24 to 25 years in complete compliance with all of the rules and all of the laws of all of us until out of the blue, the mental illness struck, and all of a sudden, he has red hair and stuff in his apartment, and he's buying all this stuff, and he's planning this mission because of the mental illness. But you can appreciate that prior to that, he had never hurt anyone. He had never broken the law. He is not someone who has spent his life hurting people or getting in trouble 
or you can appreciate the upbringing that he had from Bob and Arlene Holmes and how they raised him and what kind of son they raised prior to the time the illness struck. And those are also reasons to consider a life sentence for him. You jurors were chosen for this case because you told us that the enormity and the magnitude of this case would not automatically draw the death penalty for you. And you were chosen for this case because you said that you would give meaningful consideration to the mitigation, especially mental health mitigation, that you would meaningfully consider that as a reason for a life sentence. And you were chosen for this case because you all said that, yes, I will listen to and respect victim impact evidence, but that will not be the driving force. It will be a consideration, but not the driving force of my dis sentencing decision in this case. And it is very natural when we hear evidence like that, testimony like that, to feel anger and uh, emotion and passion. But what the law asks you to do and what we ask you to do is to not make that decision when you're in an emotional state. How many times in our lives do we make decisions uh, rashly when we're angry or emotional and we, we look back and think, oh, I shouldn't have done that? How many times do we hesitate before we hit send on an email because we want to make sure we're not overreacting to something? We want to take a step aside. We want to sleep on it for a while. Let me think about that for a while because we've learned not to make decisions in an emotional state. And what we ask you to do in this case is to take a step aside the emotion and the passion, to sleep on it, to think about it, to rise above all of this tragedy so that you have some perspective in making this decision, for this will be the most important decision you may ever make in your life. And it needs to be one that you can live with. Right now, you have the opportunity to be the example of anger without vengeance, sadness, without hate, justice without violence. And you have the opportunity right now to give accountability with mercy, compassion with understanding, and resolution with no more death. For the death penalty does not bring anyone back it doesn't make anyone feel better. It just adds to the death count. Once you make this decision, you can't come back on some other day and say that you've changed your mind. You can't come back later and say, I've given this some more thought and I've changed my mind. Now is the only chance and now is the final chance. And when it's all said and done, you go home only with yourself. When you wake up in the middle of the night and you think about this case, it's just you, and you answer only to you. And when you look yourself in the mirror in the morning and you think about this case, it's just you, and you just answer to you. For we will not be there, and they will not be there. It is just you, and you answer only to your own conscience. And don't make this decision out of concern for what the community or other people are going to think about you. Because you know that you need to do what's right, even when it's hard, even when it's unpopular. And if a life sentence is something that's right for you, and you need to do what's right. What will you think about your decision 
five years from now, ten years from now? What do you want to tell your children and your grandchildren about this moment? And I am going to talk to you about mercy because the judge read you an instruction that says you may consider mercy for Mr. Holmes in determining what the appropriate sentence is. The measure of our soul is in how we treat people who are sick and who are damaged. James Holmes is sick and he is damaged. And if you choose to grant mercy, to bestow mercy on James Holmes, it's not because he earned it. It's not because he deserves it. For mercy is not something that's earned or deserved. It's something that is bestowed by the person who gives it. Mercy says more about you than it says about him. What you do here says more about you if you choose to exercise mercy, not about him. It is something you choose to do, what you do in this moment. Justice without mercy is raw vengeance. Mercy is what makes us civilized. And mercy is what puts an end to violence. And just as James Holmes did not ask to have a mental illness, neither did his parents ask to have a son with mental illness. And Bob and Arlene Holmes have been here during this trial every day to love and support their son and that they will always love and support their son for the rest of his life. And they know that he is sick, and they know that he would not have committed this unthinkable, tragic occurrence had he not been sick. But he is, and he is their son, and he is still Chrissy's brother, and his life has meaning to them. There was a time when our country would execute children for crimes they committed, and that is no longer done because we, there is not now, nor will there ever be, a time when it is appropriate to execute a seriously mentally ill man. For we need to open our eyes to the effects of mental illness. And it will not go away just because we don't like it and just because we try and get rid of it. Justice. Justice requires that each of you be just in your own mind and in your own heart. And justice cannot be for one side alone. There has to be justice for all. And there is justice in mercy. And we ask that you accept the truth that all of us as human beings are all more and better than our own worst deeds. And that our peace and humanity abide not in our capacity for fear and hatred and revenge, but it resides in our capacity to be compassionate and understanding and merciful. Before, during, and after July 20th of 2012, he was seriously mentally ill, and this tragedy was born of disease, not of choice. And we do not execute someone for getting sick. The law never requires a death sentence, not in this case, not in any case, not in the worst case you can imagine. Because the law tells you that this is a moral decision. And only you can decide what is right for you morally. Other moral decisions we make in our lives 
what religion to practice, if to have a religion at all, whom to marry, how to raise our children. And no one can rightly tell you that your moral decisions in those areas are wrong. That would not be right. And just like that, no one can tell you what is right for you. Not the prosecution, not the defense. That is up to you because is it your individual moral determination. This is your moral assessment. And the law says that only if all 12 of you think that death is the only appropriate sentence, will it be the death penalty. And it will be the death penalty if it's all 12. But if even one of you thinks that a life sentence is appropriate or that you don't want to sign your name to a death sentence, if only one of you, then the law says it will be a life sentence. Because the law does not want to put any one person in the position of being responsible for the death of someone that is not that person's choice. Life without parole in prison is a very severe and harsh sentence. To spend the rest of your life in a cell, alone, especially when you're as sick as Mr. Holmes is, that is a severe punishment. He will be punished one way or the other. And his mental illness does not shield him from punishment. Nothing at this point can shield him from punishment. He will be punished. And the mental illness we presented to you is to, to have you assess his moral culpability. And you might ask, who could be more morally culpable? Who could be more culpable? Maybe someone who committed this crime who was not mentally ill. Maybe someone who committed this kind of crime for fun or for pleasure or for no reason at all. But that is not James Holmes. James Holmes committed this crime because he was psychotic and delusional. And that is what makes him less morally culpable. And he tried to get help. It was unsuccessful, but he tried to get help. When he went to see Dr. Fenton, it was his soul screaming for help while his mind was drowning in illness. But he tried. He knew he was losing control, and he tried. And we're not blaming anyone at CU or blaming the school or the hospital. This evidence was presented to you so that you would know the whole truth of what happened to James Holmes in the spring of 2012. This is a moral decision that you're being asked to make. And morals are so personal. Groups don't make morals, individuals do. And as soon as you have decided that for you, you need to stand up for what you believe is right because someone's life is in the balance. And once you make the decision that a life sentence would be appropriate for James Holmes, once you have given that calm reflection and thought about everything that has been presented and listened to everything that your other jurors may have wanted to share with you, after you have done all that and you are certain in your heart that a life sentence will be appropriate in this case, I want you to tell the foreman that you've made your decision. And again, he might agree with you, or he might feel differently, but he will respect your decision, and he will bring that decision back into this courtroom. The deaths of all of those people cannot be answered by another death. Please, no more death. He will be punished. He will be punished severely. And he will be punished for the rest of his life. Thank you, Ms. Brady. Would counsel please approach?
through this door is horror. Through this door are bullets, blood, brains, and bodies. Through this door, after more than two and a half months of complex, detailed planning, he came in to murder everyone and was successful in killing 12. You have been here for 15 weeks, 60 days of trial. 2,695 separate pieces of evidence. 306 witnesses, including 34, to tell you about every aspect of his life, and 13 to give you a glimpse of the 12 lives he took. All of that leading to right now to determine what is the appropriate sentence for such horror, such evil. I'm going to object to the characterization of evil. You have deliberated three times. You have found unanimously, beyond a reasonable doubt, that he knew right from wrong, that he could form the intent to murder and deliberate on that murder, and you found that he murdered one, and right there with that one murder, the sentence is life imprisonment without parole. But you found more than that. You found that he'd murdered three Six, ten, twelve men, women, and a child. But you did more. The second time you deliberated, you found that in addition to killing more than two people in a single criminal episode, you found that he did it by virtue of ambush. And you found that beyond a reasonable doubt unanimously. You also found that his manner of murdering these 12 people was cruel and torturous. And you found that unanimously beyond a reasonable doubt. You also found that in murdering these 12 people by ambush, cruelly and torturously, that he created a grave risk of death to all those others around those that he murdered. And you found that unanimously beyond a reasonable doubt. But you did more than that. You also listened to those 34 witnesses to give you every possible justification to impose the same sentence as an unaggravated murder of one, but unanimously, beyond a reasonable doubt, you found that the aggravation still outweighed all that. And then we had the last two days where you got to learn about the ramifications of his conduct far beyond the pictures that we'd seen, far beyond those who testified about the ones that they'd lost inside the theater. And so the question remains, what is the appropriate sentence for such horror, for such evil? Back again to the characterization of evil. So the question remains, what is the appropriate sentence for such conduct? 
Is it that life sentence that goes to the unaggravated murder of one? Or is it something more? You have considered so much. You have deliberated so much and found so much. It is difficult to stand here and think of how the words of attorneys can add anything to this process at this point. It is difficult to imagine what words could be spoken to you, what arguments could be advanced that would make a life sentence the appropriate sentence for what has happened here. Judge, I'm going to object to that. That's for the jury to decide. Overruled. The jury understands. It is the jury's decision. Go ahead, Mr. Brockler. Thank you, Your Honor. Can words be spoken to you in a passionate way that would justify a life sentence? To find a life sentence if there were tears, if there were pleading, could that make a life sentence appropriate for what he has done? Could someone argue to you, mercy, mercy, that mercy is about the giver, not the receiver? Could they play upon your conscience and your guilt and make a life sentence appropriate for what he's done? <laughs> 